Unlikely Hero, Book 7 of the Ramsley Brothers series, written by Josephine Bintema, narrated by Josephine Bintema. Chapter 1 I would like to thank the FBI for clearing me of the charges that were brought against me. It shows that my faith in the justice system has not been misplaced. David Ramsley smiled in satisfaction as he stood in front of a podium, reporters crowding in to ask questions. It pleases me to announce that I've been reinstated as the head of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. The first thing I will do is undo the damage that my son Michael has wrought in our balance sheets. We will cooperate fully with the federal investigation into money laundering. We will weather any fines that are imposed against the company. Ramsley Pharma will continue to strengthen as a business once we move past this. We will continue to provide necessary life-saving medications to the people you love. We will continue our all-important research to create leading data to treat and cure conditions and diseases that affect so many people. The reporters bombarded him with questions. David held up his hands. Please, one at a time. Was the board decision unanimous? A reporter asked. No. David had an apologetic look. There were a couple of people who felt that personal vendettas were more important than the health of the company. How do you feel about your son Noah's resignation? Another questioned. Noah has a young, growing family with five sons, David said diplomatically. I will miss working with my son, but he believes that it is more important to take time with my grandchildren at this point in his life. Some sources claim that Noah's resignation was a direct result of your being re-elected to the board. A reporter stated. I have a great love for all my sons, David responded. We don't always agree on everything, and I am saddened by my oldest, Michael's actions, which have caused such instability in Ramsley Pharma. Rest assured, I will be bringing the company forward into a strong future. Thank you for your time. David smoothed down his tie as he left the stage, reporters clamoring after him. Stocks for Ramsley Pharmaceuticals have trended upwards on news of David Ramsley's return to the helm of the company, the business news anchor said on the television screen. Stocks had previously sunk perilously low after the arrest of Mogul David, who was later declared clear of all charges against him. Michael Ramsley continues to remain in custody, awaiting trial. He's been charged with international drug smuggling and laundering drug money through Ramsley Pharmaceutical. Noah Ramsley released his own statement earlier today. Noah appeared on the screen behind the anchor. He read his carefully prepared statement from a sheet of paper. I was dismayed and discouraged to learn that the board was considering returning my father, David Ramsley, as head of the board of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. It is my firm belief that this is not the direction the company should take. It is short-sighted to trade stability of share prices for the leadership of a man who I believe to be guilty of the original charges leveled against him by the FBI. As a result, I have handed in my resignation. I reiterate my position that Michael is innocent. Thank you for your time. Maxwell Ramsley also released a statement on the return of his father to the company, the anchor informed viewers. Max sighed deeply on the screen. I believe it was an illegal vote that brought my father back into the Ramsley pharmaceutical fold. While the vote was publicized to all members, not all members could attend because of extenuating circumstances. If all members had been able to attend, the motion would never have passed. As a result, I am also resigning from the board as a show of solidarity with my brother Noah. Why couldn't all members be at the meeting? A reporter asked Max. What could be considered extenuating circumstances? Couldn't the vote be made in absentia? Normally, a vote would be made in absentia during an emergency meeting of the board, Max explained patiently. However, Ann Schaefer Ramsley, who owns a controlling 30% of the vote, was not aware of the meeting despite repeated attempts to contact her. Ann could not be reached to give her vote because she was in labor at the time. Will Ann be resigning from the board as well? Another reporter wanted to know. I am not going to speak for Anne. However, I will be pursuing all avenues to have the meeting investigated to determine if it is illegal, Max told them. Thank you. I'm done answering questions. The anchor brought on a consulting specialist to discuss the news regarding the company. 
Molson shut off his phone. He didn't care if Ramsley Pharma stocks tanked or rose. He did care that David Ramsley had been restored to his previous position like nothing had happened. It made him angry because the man deserved to be in jail. Molson knew that because David had basically confessed to him that he had framed Michael. Part of the conversation was recorded on Molson's phone. I wanted to thank you, the voice said. Molson stumbled to a stop on the steps, grabbing the railing. He gripped the phone a little harder before asking cautiously, What for? For what you said to the psychiatrist, David Ramsley continued, telling her to inform on us to save herself. You're not going to hurt her or nothing, are you? Molson looked around the empty stairwell. No, there's no point. Dr. Ershman can't touch me. David chuckled. Neither can Bethany. It was her father that was so worried about her. Now neither Ted nor his daughter can touch me. I suppose you can tell your brother his heart's desire is safe. You mean by Ted can't touch you? Molson activated the voice recorder on his phone. He hoped that it would make a clear recording from the call. Ted died in jail earlier today. So tragic, David gloated. You killed him, Molson stated flatly. He had an allergic reaction. It was unfortunate. Molson seriously doubted it was a simple allergic reaction. Not when David had been the head of a pharmaceutical company and had a myriad of drugs at his disposal. What's this all got to do with what I told Doc Ershman, when I told her to roll on you before she found herself in a difficult situation? I'm just a poor old befuddled man, riddled with a touch of dementia. David sighed dramatically. I had no idea what was happening right under my nose. It was easy to cooperate with the feds. What are you talking about? Molson frowned. All these years, he'd been running drugs, and I'm sorry to say, I became a very cooperative witness. David's smile could be felt through the phone. Then again, family loyalties aren't what they used to be. You informed on someone else. Molson gritted his teeth. You threw someone under the bus. And I thank you for the idea. It was all you. David gloried in the revelation. It took some doing to lay the groundwork in case I was arrested, but it turned out quite satisfactory. I'm out of jail because of you. Tell me, is he guilty or innocent, this sucker you put in jail in your place? Molson demanded. He didn't like that David was trying to manipulate him into feeling guilty. Everyone is guilty of something. He defied me. That was enough, David sneered. Who is it? Molson questioned angrily. You can read about it in the papers and know that it's all you're doing, David said smugly. Once again, thank you, son. I appreciate your contribution to my freedom. When Molson had brought it to his brother Drew, a detective with the local police force, Drew had disappointingly discounted the recording. David was never mentioned by name, so no one can prove that it was him. Molson had never felt so powerless or so guilty. He knew that he hadn't taken any actions that put Michael in jail. Molson knew it was all David's doing, yet he still had a sense of gnawing guilt that he couldn't shake. It ate steadily inward, like an ulcer that wouldn't heal. He needed to clear Michael's name. He needed to see David back in prison where the man belonged. Molson wasn't the only one who wanted that to happen. Michael's brothers and cousins believed in his innocence as well. Drew had been invited to a meeting with the group. They hoped to pool their resources and information. Reluctantly, Drew had told Molson about the meeting, suggesting he come as well. Molson wasn't sure what the Ramsleys would think of them, the illegitimate half-siblings that had never been invited to grace the billionaire family's door before now. Part of Molson felt a little bitter about the fact. Then again, it wasn't like they had invited any of the Ramsleys to the small, old, and run-down home that the Colburns had grown up in. It might have been interesting to see what the illustrious Ramsleys would say about his childhood home, Molson thought. Two families with the same father had never been so far removed. Then again, one couldn't expect the mistress to live in the same circumstances as the wife. 
Molson reflected. Normally, it didn't bother him. He just accepted that life was how it was. Molson knew that he had just had to make the best of it. For the most part, he felt he had. It helped that he didn't have the same anger towards their father as Drew and Jana had. Both of his siblings had memories of David as their father. David had left before Molson was born, so he had no childhood memories, nor had he experienced the pain of abandonment from a parental figure. If a person could call a sociopath who framed his oldest son a parental figure. Margaret Colburn had been involved with David for ten years before he simply never returned. She insisted that David had married her, that they were deeply in love despite their separation. She told of a man who brought numerous gifts, stayed for short periods of time, then whisked away to do international business. She made it sound like the most romantic relationship on earth. However, one couldn't always believe Margaret. She wasn't the most mentally balanced person. Molson checked the time and decided he would have to skip the shower this morning. He'd spent too long watching the Ramsley family drama on his phone. The hot water tank was broken anyways. Pulling himself out of bed, he donned clean clothes and went to find out where Margaret was. She'd strewn her clothes all over her bedroom again, probably looking for something that didn't exist or had been pawned ages ago. Molson grimaced. He'd clean it up when he got back later tonight. Downstairs, he found the back door open. Annoyed that she was letting the heat out of the house, Molson started coffee and then went into the yard. Ma, it's time for breakfast. I brought home a couple of breakfast sandwiches last night that we can heat up. I'm feeding the ducks. Margaret was tossing something onto the patchy, overgrown lawn. Aren't they pretty? There were no ducks. Molson ran a hand along his face. Yeah, Ma, they're pretty. Are you almost done? I don't want to be late. It's my first day at the hospital. That one is a mallard. I love coming to the pond in the park. She smiled happily, pointing to her imaginary friends. That brown one there is a duff. That's nice, he humored her. Wondering what she was tossing into the grass, Molson came to stand beside her. He knew the kitchen was bare. There was little point in buying a large quantity of groceries. One day they might be in the cupboards. The next she might flush everything down the toilet or decide to give it a bath. He watched as a piece of sausage went flying into the grass. Frowning, he looked at the wrapper in her hand. Are you feeding them the breakfast sandwiches? They're hungry today. Margaret merrily threw the rest of the pieces into the grass. So am I. Molson muttered as his stomach growled in protest. Let's have coffee and then I'll walk you to the center. I don't want to go to center, Margaret pouted as she let him lead her into the house. It's fun at the center. They have books and games, Molson said calmly. They have a working cable subscription. You can watch your favorite soap, The Gorgeous and the Botoxed. Pulling out a chair, he sat Margaret down, getting her coffee and a bowl of stale, dry cereal. There was no milk. He'd have to pick up a few things today to make sure she didn't starve. Pouring a bowl of Fruitio for himself, Molson shrugged and poured the coffee directly over the cereal before grabbing a spoon. Margaret picked at her cereal, sipping the coffee. We should call David and ask him to fix the television. He's good about getting people to do things. Crunching the coffee-tasting mess, Molson raised an eyebrow. David hadn't been anywhere near this house or Margaret in twenty-eight years. The cable wire is cut. Get us a new one. He neglected to say how Margaret had cut it three days ago. She wouldn't remember. I'm missing my soap, she complained. You can watch your soap at the center, Molson reminded her. He set down his empty bowl and rummaged through the cupboard, searching for the lockbox. All the people are old at the center, Margaret wrinkled her nose. I'm not old. Where did you hide the lockbox? He heaved a deep sigh. Ma, you need to leave it where I put it. Your pills are in it. I don't need any pills, Margaret said stubbornly. I'm perfect the way I am. How do you argue with that? Molson looked upwards for patience. He would find the lockbox later. Margaret would just have to go without her pills for the day. It was a never-ending battle between the two of them, and Molson had to admit that more often than not, Margaret won. 
He grabbed her coat. Let's go. Where are we going? Margaret asked. For a walk. Maybe to the park, Molson told her, slipping her coat on. Could we feed the ducks? Her eyes twinkled in excitement. If we find any, Molson promised her. He knew that if he told her they were going to the center, she'd balk. This would be easier. It was a short walk where he could distract her by talking about the birds or the squirrels that they saw. At the center, he parked her at a table where some older folks were doing a puzzle. How's she doing today? Gail, one of the workers, asked. Feeding the ducks, Molson shrugged. Not bad. She hit her pills again. Molson, you really need to stay on top of that, Gail clucked. It's important she gets her correct medications on time. I know it. Molson tried not to be defensive. He knew what Margaret was like when she wasn't taking her medications more than anyone else. I had them on the highest shelf in the cupboard in a lockbox, but it was missing this morning. I'd hope they'd be out of her reach. I'll find them later. Make sure that you do, Gail remonstrated him. The center was not responsible for any participants taking their medications. They also didn't tolerate any bad behavior, which meant if Margaret wasn't properly medicated, she might get thrown out. Molson desperately needed them to babysit his mother. I'll find them, he repeated. He looked at Margaret, who was engrossed in trying to jam a puzzle piece together with another. I gotta go, Ma. Clemmy is picking you up later and I'll drop in for supper, okay? Margot ignored him. She was probably mad at being at the center, or perhaps she was plotting her escape. Maybe she really was just concentrating on the puzzle. Who knew? Molson mentally shrugged and headed out the door. He took the bus to Mercy Hospital. At the information desk, he found out where he was supposed to go. Excuse me, sir? A burly security guard stopped him. Can I ask where you're going? Orientation, Molson explained. Fielding's class. You are part of Dr. Fielding's class, the guard looked at him disbelievingly. Yes, Molson said shortly. He knew the man was making a judgment based on how Molson looked. It was something that happened all the time, so Molson wasn't that concerned. I'm going to be late. Fielding appreciates punctuality. Why don't I walk you down there? The guard asked. Sure thing. Molson didn't care. He started walking, the guard falling into step with him. Soon he found Fielding with a group of other students. Fielding glanced at his watch, pursing his lips. Cutting it close, Colburn. I had a personal escort, Molson replied, cocking his head at the security guard. Just needed to make sure, the guard nodded at Fielding before leaving to do his rounds. We've already gone over the rules. Perhaps one of your classmates can fill you in. Fielding tossed him a hospital identification badge. Wear that at all times. Don't lose it. Don't be late again. Yes, sir, Molson drawled as he clipped on that piece of plastic. He and Fielding did not get along. Fielding had made it abundantly clear that if Molson stepped out of line by a fraction of an inch, he'd love to kick him out of the program. Fielding narrowed his eyes. This is a practical program. Here we will see how everyone's knowledge stacks up in the real world. No one can cheat here. That was a deliberate barb at Molson. Fielding had openly accused Molson of cheating on written tests. The man didn't understand how Molson could show up to class without a textbook, not bothering to take notes, yet maintain nearly perfect test scores. If he had simply asked, Molson could have told him that he had near-perfect memory. When he applied himself, Molson needed to read a textbook only once, and nearly all of it was imprinted on his mind. It seemed a waste to tote around heavy books when it was already locked in his brain. So Molson showed up with a notebook he never used, and a pen that stayed firmly in his pocket unless a test was at hand. It drove Fielding mad. In return, he drove Molson mad. If Fielding wasn't going to ask how he did it, then who was Molson to tell him? Let the man think the worst. He'd never find any evidence of cheating, because Molson didn't cheat. Fielding was just another person who had taken one look at Molson and made a snap judgment. He thought Molson was some piece of trash. Over the years, Molson had fallen into the routine of letting people think what they would. 
he knew who he was. If people couldn't be bothered to do anything other than judge based on first impressions, he didn't need them in his life. After passing the classes Fielding gave with flying colors, Molson had been dismayed to learn that he needed to put up with the man again, this time as his supervising doctor at the hospital. Molson stuck to the rear of the group as Fielding led them through the hospital, narrating where they were and what their duties might be in each area. How is Edna doing this morning? Holly asked the nurse as she pulled a chart. Not too bad, Dr. Ershman, the nurse responded. She seems to be more alert and cooperative. Good, she's making progress then. Holly was pleased. Edna's therapy sessions seemed to be progressing along nicely. Holly had been a therapist at Mercy Hospital for three years now. She had her own set of offices, assisting people who were already admitted plus doing outpatient care. She loved her job and the challenges it represented. Flicking her long braid out of the way, she wrote a note on Edna's chart before replacing it on the stack in the corner. A movement caught the corner of her eye, and she watched as Dr. Fielding took a new group of students on a tour of the hospital. She remembered that he had mentioned a new set of student residents were set to start again. Fielding had been grumbling over one new student in particular, while Holly and he shared coffee and a snack at the cafeteria during one of their few breaks that lined up. She looked over the new hopefuls, starting their careers as doctors, noting how one or two of them looked like they weren't even old enough to drive a car. It was a funny comparison, since it wasn't very long ago that she had graduated from her programs. A gasp of surprise escaped Holly. She had to take a double look at one man in the group to be certain she was right. It was him. The guy who was Detective Colburn's brother. She remembered him distinctly. He had a band of tattoos around his neck and arm. He was in scrubs, on the outside of the group, listening as the tour continued, hands in his pockets, posture slouched as he disinterestedly watched. She would recognize him anywhere. He had probably saved her life, although at the time she hadn't realized what the danger she was in. Holly had been called by a frantic Ted Searson, saying that his daughter wasn't well that he was worried she might harm herself. Bethany Searson was one of Holly's clients, and she had been undergoing a therapy to investigate a repressed memory from her childhood that had haunted her with nightmares. Ted had given Holly the address. He was due to fly out for some conference, and needed Holly to come to his prestigious office building downtown to discuss Bethany's treatment further. Ted had been in tears, beside himself, wanting to know how he could help his daughter. Although Holly would have much preferred to have the meeting in her own office, she hadn't hesitated to go. When she arrived, she found Ted Searson, Bethany, and another man that she didn't know. Holly assumed that he was a colleague of Ted's. Bethany was lethargic and nearly unresponsive as she slumped on a leather couch. Holly had immediately sat beside her, trying to rouse her, checking her sluggish pulse. She needs to go to the hospital immediately. Not just yet, the unknown man said. Excuse me? Holly frowned at him. Something is very wrong with Bethany. She needs medical treatment right away. I said, she's not going anywhere just yet, the man repeated. Mr. Searson, are you going to let this man endanger your daughter? David, Ted whined. Not yet, David said firmly. Holly fumbled in her purse, intent on grabbing her cell phone. She would call for an ambulance. David put his hand over her purse, effectively shutting it, his face menacingly close. She swallowed as indignation was replaced by a sense of fear. What? You start the party without me? Molson looked slightly affronted as he casually entered the office. The occupant gazed at him, startled. Who are you? Ted stood up in alarm. "'None of your business. Sit down,' Molson ordered him as he crouched in front of Bethany. "'What they do to you, girl?' Bethany was reclining against the couch, her eyes barely open, mouth slack as she labored for breath. Molson used a small flashlight to check her eyes, then took her pulse. "'I told you, she needs a hospital!' Holly glared at David as the man stepped back to lean on the desk again. "'She's not reacting to the medications properly!' 
Whose fault might that be? David said mildly as he watched Molson check Bethany. Andrew must have sent you. Now I know you did not just say that. Molson looked around and spied the bag of prescription medications. He grabbed it, reading through some of the labels quickly. Because if you did, that means you know all about Andrew, which means you know all about me. I gotta say, I'm upset you didn't send no Christmas cards or nothing. Why would I? David said nonchalantly. You're not mine. I got a DNA test that says otherwise. Molson shook the bag of drugs at Holly. You, Dr. You? The one with the name all over these bottles? When did you get my DNA? David demanded. Yes, Dr. Holly Urshman said shakily, trying to back away from the bag of pills he had shoved under her nose. What do you give her? Molson questioned, none too gently. Today? Nothing. Two days ago I gave her lorazepam to calm her down and help in a therapy session. She replied defensively, Nothing else, nothing to make her like this. I asked you a question, boy. David stood, glaring down at them. You think you're the only one who can get things done? Molson gave David a derisive look, then tossed the bag of pills to one of his friends. He picked up Bethany, cradling her against him. Come on, sugar. I'm going to get you feeling better. Wait, Ted cried. You can't just take her. Really? Molson laughed. In case you didn't notice, Ted, your daughter is suffering from an overdose. If she don't get this junk out of her, she's gonna die. No, Ted looked lost. She's not supposed to die. Shut up, Ted, David growled. Lady, you coming? Molson raised a pierced eyebrow at Holly. Excuse me? Holly questioned suspiciously at him. She was very afraid. There was a lot of tension in the room undercurrents that she didn't understand. Wow. Okay, let me lay this out for you, Molson said. For some reason, they got you all caught up in their scheme. Maybe it sounded good at first. Maybe there's money involved. Whatever. Point is, after Bethany makes a full recovery and points the finger at you for prescribing all those pills, who do you think is going to take the fall? Them? Molson scoffed. They got lawyers and cash to keep them out of jail. They'll just say it was all you. You're gonna rot in prison, unless you roll on them first before Miss Sunshine here gets well. You testify, or you can take your chances with these two. They ain't looking out for your interests. In fact, I'll lay odds they might just do to you what they did here to dear sugar. Molson headed out the door. This is unacceptable. David strode out after him, only to be blocked by one of Molson's companions. Who are you? Molson's friend just smiled. Someone who can't be bought, Molson replied as he headed to the elevator. His friends joined him. You won't let her die, Ted asked anxiously as he trailed them to the hallway. Molson didn't answer. One of his friends hit the elevator buttons. As the doors closed, Holly slipped into the elevator with them. She cleared her throat nervously. Snitches get stitches, someone remarked. Not this one. Molson said sharply. Doc, if I wanted to get Sugar here to a hospital not owned by David Ramsley's family, where do I go? Mercy is the closest, she protested. Not an option. Molson didn't trust that something wouldn't happen to Bethany there. General is the next closest, Holly said. That's where people go to die, one of the men said dismissively. It was known as the Poor People's Hospital an inner-city building that was old, decaying, understaffed, and undersupplied. Next? Molson asked. The other hospitals are too far away, she insisted. If it's an overdose, then she'll die before she gets treated on time, unless we go to Mercy. Molson didn't like the options. You got wheels? Excuse me? Holly didn't understand the quick change of direction of the conversation. Wheels? A car? You got a car! Molson repeated with some frustration as they exited the building. Not like we can take sugar here on the subway. Uh, yes. Holly dug in her purse for her keys, trying to keep up with the group of men. I'm gonna let the cleaning lady know that she can go back to work. Call it a false alarm or something. One of the guys commented as he split from the group. What are you 
doing? Drew demanded as he ran up. He'd parked the bike on the sidewalk and had come directly to Molson as they were coming out of the building. I thought I told you to stall, not grab her. You're welcome, Molson replied dryly. He was surprised as Drew immediately reached out to transfer Bethany into his own arms. Molson smirked. You got a thing for her? Drew gave Molson a dark look, ignoring the comment. He looked in alarm at the nearly unconscious Bethany. What happened? Have you called an ambulance? No. Molson shook his head. His friends had melted away as soon as they saw Drew. They knew he was a cop and didn't want to stick around. Molson didn't blame them in the least. We were about to take Doc's car to Mercy. It'll be faster. Doc? Drew questioned. Doc Urshman here? Molson nodded in Holly's direction. I thought you might want to talk to her. Drew gave a short nod. They followed Holly to her car. Drew was surprised when his brother not only helped put Bethany in the back seat, but jumped in the front passenger seat. Thought I'd see how this all plays out. Molson winked at Holly. Hey, Drew, you know our old man is involved in all this? Drew frowned. What do you mean? It was all cozy up there. The Doc, Sugar, Sugar's dad, and Mr. Moneybags Ramsley himself. Molson shrugged. He must have a stake in all this. Stop calling her Sugar. Drew glared at Molson, who ignored him. When we get to the hospital, I'm going to take both your statements. I expect nothing less, Molson commented. Honey, you gonna lay on some gas? It'd be better if we get to the hospital before she dies. I'm well aware that we need to get to the hospital as quickly as possible. Holly made a turn. However, I can't exactly break any traffic laws. You got a cop in the back seat. Molson rolled his eyes. If we get tagged by some other cops, he'll explain at the hospital. Now punch it. Holly looked in her rearview mirror at Drew. If you see an opening, take it. Don't get into an accident, but don't worry about traffic laws either, Drew said grimly. I should have driven. <laughs> you? Molson huffed with a smile. I can pass you any day of the week. Only because you're reckless, Drew grimaced. He checked to make sure Bethany was breathing. Do you know what she's on? No, Holly replied. I think she was given something before I came to the office. All I gave her was a simple lorazepam a couple of days ago. She shouldn't be like this. We tried a regressive therapy technique. It involves relaxing the patient and walking them through their memories. She did really well. Afterward, her father took her home since Bethany was still too relaxed on the medications. Then today, I got a phone call to meet Mr. Searson at the office. He wanted to discuss Bethany's treatment and said she'd been depressed lately. He convinced me to come. When I arrived, Holly continued as she made a turn, I found Bethany like this. Mr. Searson was there and another man. I assume he's a colleague of Mr. Searson's? What about all the drugs you prescribed to her over the past four days? Drew asked. I haven't prescribed her anything for over a month. Holly frowned. Cut to the truth, lady, Drew said shortly. I saw the bottles with your name on them. There's nearly a dozen prescriptions all within the last four days. No, Holly insisted. I didn't prescribe them. I got a theory. Molson looked back at Drew. Not sure I should say it in front of her. Say it, Drew growled, holding Bethany a little tighter. Now, I ain't got no proof or nothing, Molson cautioned. My thinking is that sugar's been set up. Accidental overdose. I'm betting there was a piece up in that office. Her daddy gets so upset by sugar's death, he kills the doc and then himself. Everyone calls it a tragedy and says we need better laws for overprescribing meds. At least, that's what everybody's going to think by the time the papers get through with it. My guess is Pop was there to do the actual killing. Pop goes totally free. No one knows he was there. They were going to kill her? Holly shook her head. Her father loves her. He wouldn't do that. David Ramsley don't love her. He don't love nobody but himself, Molson replied dryly. He ain't got the same moral codes as everyone else. I seen that look in his eyes and some gangbangers. It's the same. There's no proof, Drew said shortly. Why would David Ramsley kill them all and cover it up like a murder-suicide? Never said there was proof. Molson looked back at Drew, all serious. But it ties everything up right neat. 
Now, why would they want Sugar dead? Drew thought back to Bethany's dream. She said there had been two men, one trying to drown her, one trying to save her. I think you got an idea. Molson nodded at Drew. I can see the wheels turning in your head. You think this is connected to the repressed memories she's been trying to recover? Holly asked as it started to make sense to her. To whatever she saw on the boat. Again, I need proof, Drew grimaced. He had motive, if the drug angle was correct. He had suspects. He had a crime. But he didn't have a single piece of evidence other than the flimsy memories of a woman. We're here. Holly pressed the brakes and put the car in park in front of the emergency room door. They rushed to get Bethany out of the car. Drew carried her into the hospital. Make sure Dr. Urshman doesn't go anywhere, Drew said to Molson, as he brought Bethany to the triage center. I need her statement. Chapter 2 Excuse me, Holly absently said, the conversation between her and the nurse quickly forgotten as she hustled after Molson. Picking up her pace, Holly grabbed him by the arm, swinging the startled man into a side office and shutting the door behind them. I knew you liked me, he said with a lazy drawl and a slow smile once he recognized her. Holly pushed herself away from him, knocking away his warm hands, which had started to softly feel along her arms. She quickly looked around the office to assure herself that it was empty. Thankfully, it was. The last thing she wanted was for some rumor to start making its way across the hospital that she was rendezvousing with some strange man in odd places. The gossip mill in hospitals was vicious at times. Playing hard to get? All right, he said easily. I'm not playing anything. Holly's tone was terse. You are the detective's brother. He gave a belabored sigh. If I have to be. Holly crossed her arms, tapping a foot impatiently. I have been calling Detective Colburn, and he has not been returning my calls lately. He's got a girlfriend. Last I heard they were ring shopping, so you might want to choose someone else. He snapped his fingers like an idea had come to him. You could choose me. I'm looking for more information on the Bethany Searson case. Holly ignored his comments. He was a classic case of overcompensation in her professional opinion. He hid behind this devil-may-care persona that was slightly outlandish in its remarks, all to avoid real relationships that might hurt him. She was a client of mine, and I want to know if there's any progress has been made on who drugged her, and if it was the same person who forged my prescription pad. You think the cops are going to give out that sort of information to civilians? His tone implied what he thought of that. It's my professional name on the line, snapped Holly. I think I should be kept updated. What you need me for? I ain't no cop. He looked down at her in amusement. You came to Ted Searson's office before Detective Colburn. He must have trusted you to reach Bethany first when he couldn't. You are brothers. You were there when we took Bethany to the hospital, Holly explained patiently. It's likely that Detective Colburn would tell you more than what he would tell people in the general public. You want me to betray my brother's trust and blab to you? He raised an eyebrow. No! Holly could have growled in frustration. Normally, she was able to talk through every situation. Her profession as a psychiatrist demanded it. Yet for some reason, this man had her on edge. What I would like is to be more involved in the investigation. Perhaps you could talk to your brother about that. I could. He did not give any indication that he would commit to doing so. Would you please talk to your brother on my behalf? Holly gritted her teeth. She felt that he was being deliberately obtuse. My name is Molson, he said suddenly. Excuse me? Holly asked. The name rang a bell. She had somehow forgotten it after everything that had happened. Fielding had also been complaining about a Molson in his student group. My name is Molson. If you're gonna ask favor someone, you'd best know who they are. Molson had a slow smile. Especially since they're gonna ask for a return later. What do you mean, ask for a return? frowned Holly, 
not liking where this was going. That's how favors work. Ain't nothing that comes for free. He shrugged. You ask, I give. Then I ask, and you're obligated to give. Why can't it just be that you help me as a gentleman, expecting nothing in return? She questioned. I could, he studied her, enjoying her discomfort. Yet you're not going to, Holly said flatly. No, Molson decided. He checked his cell phone for the time. You want that favor or not, I got places to be. Holly thought about it for a moment. Detective Colburn had been stonewalling her. He said he had given her all the information that he could, but it was pathetically thin, leaving Holly with doubts as to how the investigation was proceeding. She wanted to know who had harmed Bethany. She wanted justice, and clear her own name of any suspicion or wrongdoing. Holly didn't know where else to get the information. "'Can I ask what the price for my favor will be before I commit to asking for one?' she inquired. "'Nope.' Molson smiled as he opened the door behind him. Holly told herself that the hitch in her breath was a reaction to the trouble she knew she was getting into, and not a reaction to the man before her. He was just making her uneasy, she told herself, ignoring the fact that when he smiled, Molson was very good-looking. "'Fine. Do we have a deal?' You will ask your brother. Find out what you can about the case and let me know? Sure thing, beautiful. Molson complimented her as he left, closing the door. Holly took a shaky breath and wondered exactly what she had gotten herself into. This here is the cafeteria. Bring money. Just because you have practicum here does not mean that you get free meals. Fielding raised an eyebrow as Molson rejoined the group. Where have you been, Colburn? Got sidetracked? Molson decided that was explanation enough. He was not about to tell his supervising doctor that he had been pulled aside by a gorgeous shrink with a cute little body and long blonde hair. Fielding might think that he was having his head examined or something. Get sidetracked again and you can get suspended, smirked Fielding. Pop quiz, what are the most likely foods people choke on? Colburn, you're up. Fielding enjoyed springing little quizzes on everyone. Then he made fun of anyone who got the answers wrong. Not overtly enough that he could be charged with harassment, but enough that anyone who got an answer wrong felt like a numbskull for the rest of the day. Steak and beer for men, chicken for women, hot dogs for kids, Molson recited, remembering his first aid instructor telling him during class. The wet dough from the bun acts like a messy glue lodging the hot dog. Correct. Fielding's smile disappeared, replaced by a scowl. Explain the appropriate course of treatment for a choking person. Molson began to draw the textbook word for word when Fielding stopped him. In your own words? demanded Fielding. I could show you if Fred here don't mind throwing up. Molson clapped a hand on Fred's shoulder. I think I do mind, responded Fred wryly. An annoyed Fielding turned abruptly. Moving on. You do realize he controls your practicum grades? Fred whispered to Molson. Aggravating him is probably not in your best interest. You think? Molson said dryly. Here I thought I was making myself teacher's pet. Funny, commented Fred. The rest of the tour was not very exciting, Molson thought privately. Fielding poked him a few more times, but Molson decided not to play into the doctor's hands. He was getting really tired of the attitude his teacher had. Fielding finished the tour. Here are your assignments. You will report on time. You will not miss without authorization. You will follow the instructions of your supervising doctor. I have done my best to partner each of you with someone who will instruct you well. He called names and began handing out the schedules. Colburn? Molson lazily came forward, collecting the paperwork. He perused the schedule, then the bottom dropped out of his stomach. Fielding was his supervising doctor. Molson grimaced. This was not going to go well. Fielding hated him. Why would he want to be his supervising doctor? If he was seeking to punish Molson, he was also punishing himself. Everyone began to disperse. Molson continued to look over the schedule, committing it to memory. Is there a problem, Colburn? Fielding asked sharply. 
Nah, why would there be a problem? Molson had the sneaking suspicion the man was waiting for him to complain. I have my eye on you. Fielding narrowed his eyes before walking away. I have Redding. Fred looked at Molson's schedule. Fielding? Dude, that's gotta suck. No kidding. Molson was not pleased. I did tell you not to aggravate him, shrugged Fred. Molson wished that he had listened to Fred earlier. No doubt Fielding was going to make Molson's life very difficult. Buy you a drink? Fred invited him. Thanks, but I have got to get to work yet. Molson had a few hours where he could earn some cash by working at Sammy's auto shop. He had been working there since Sammy had handed him a broom when he was fourteen. Molson now had a small share in the shop, helping Sammy to expand in another market with ready money to invest in the venture. He wanted to discuss his schedule with Sammy. Molson would need to work around his hours at the hospital. It might mean losing some hours at the shop, which was not a good thing. Molson needed the cash for taking care of Margot and a few expenses of his own. The day when he earned his first paycheck as a doctor could not come soon enough. Hours later, Molson had a new understanding with Sammy and had put in solid eight hours of work. It was early morning and his stomach was craving something. On the way to Margot's, Molson decided to stop at Drew's apartment and raid his fridge. He was not trying to be particularly quiet. He popped leftover shepherd's pie in the microwave, the buttons making loud beeping noises in the quiet. Does he ever come in the daytime? Bethany's sleepy complaint reached his ears. I think he's mainly nocturnal, replied Drew, pulling the covers over his head. It was a studio apartment, the living room, kitchen, and bedroom being in the same area with no partition. I got an idea, but I need your help. Molson spoke into the dark apartment. He flicked on the kitchen light. I don't think he's going to go away, Bethany shielded her eyes. Drew groaned, peeling back the covers. He's like a band-aid. Best to just pull it off and get it over with. Thanks, Molson said dryly, grabbing a glass of water. Drew came into the kitchen, rubbing his eyes. What is this idea, and why discuss it now instead of in the morning? Because come the morning, you're going to be at work, and I got stuff to do. Molson took the plate out of the microwave. Thanks. Drew took the plate out of his brother's hand and grabbed a fork for himself. Molson gave him a dirty look before ransacking the fridge for another piece. What if I could get some guys to be witnesses that through the chain, David gave them the drugs, not Michael? Real witnesses? From the drug trade? Drew scooped up a forkful of the pie. They will never testify. If they did, they would be implicating themselves in the crime of drug smuggling. Not if you get them immunity. Molson popped another plate into the microwave. Beth, do you want any? No. Bethany pulled her robe around herself as she padded into the kitchen. She grabbed a plate and a fork. Thought you didn't want any, frowned Drew. I'm not having shepherd's pie. She rearranged a few items, pulling out a plate with a cover. Oh, save a piece for me. Drew knew what was in the container. He pointed his fork at Molson. What makes you think I could get these guys immunity? This is an FBI case. I have no say in anything. You got connections? Molson took a seat, sniffing appreciatively at the food. Surely you can talk to Agent Law or someone. Ask if they'd be interested in the real truth rather than one they've cobbled together. Bethany put a piece of fudge cake onto her plate. Molson would have drooled if his mouth was not full. Law and I are not friends, Drew said dryly. That was Drew's basic way of saying they hated each other's guts. He is not going to listen to any suggestions that I have. Bethany sat at the table. I think I know why you want to marry her. Molson eyed the cake, his fork hovering in the air. She cooks. I need to get one of these. Mine? Drew put his hand over Bethany's. She moved her plate away from Molson. Mine. Molson tried not to smirk and failed. He shook his head in amusement. What about going to Law's supervisor? What? Drew frowned. I'm not sure I can. Why not? The guy has to have someone ahead of him on the food chain, Molson pointed out. And if Sterling can really find evidence that Law got paid off, then wouldn't it be good to know who the guy is? 
Do you really think that you can get them to agree to give up David? Would any of them be actual eyewitnesses? Drew polished off his plate, going to the counter for cake. I don't know, admitted Molson, but it's the best idea I got. It could work, right? questioned a hopeful Bethany. Yes, Drew said reluctantly. If everything falls into place, it could work. The likelihood of these guys wanting to testify or the FBI giving immunity to them? Almost zero. You can still ask. Molson went to get himself a piece of cake. He didn't even wait to sit down before tasting it. Hmm. Did you bake this? The cooking channel and I have become good friends, Bethany said proudly. Is there any way I can convince you to dump this brother of mine and cook for me? asked Molson. No, Bethany and Drew both said in unison. Molson shrugged unrepentantly. I will put out some inquiries, decided Drew. If I can figure out who Law's superior is, I will contact him and see what it would take to get Michael's case overturned. No commitments. Okay, nodded Molson. I'll see if I can get anyone interested in testifying. I have no idea how you're going to do that. Drew frowned, contemplating his brother. Honest? Molson admitted. Got no idea either. Figure I'll find a way to get it done. It is beyond doomed, Drew said darkly. Molson looked at his empty plate with regret. Shall I slice the last piece into three? Bethany raised an eyebrow. Please, Molson quickly replied. Drew nodded. I'm going to need to work out more if you keep baking. Beth, you remember that shrink you used to see? asked Molson casually. Bethany frowned. Holly Ershman? What about her? I ran into her, answered Molson. She was asking about you, wondering how you were doing. Where did you run into her? questioned Drew. He could not imagine where Molson might find the psychiatrist. At the hospital, he admitted truthfully. What were you doing at the hospital? Bethany asked in concern. Are you okay? I'm fine. Molson waved her concern away. Point is, she asked about you. Is there some reason you don't talk to her no more? I got a new phone when I lost my last one, remembered Bethany. She divided up the last piece of cake. It came with a new phone number. I suppose after everything happened, I'd just stop seeing her. I had found my answers. Bethany put down her fork, thinking, I wish I'd kept up with her, not necessarily as her patient, more as a friend. I really did like her. If you want, I can give her your new phone number, offered Molson. Drew raised an eyebrow. You're going to see the good doctor again? I'll be at the hospital this week again. Molson savored his last bite of cake. He was pleasantly full. You're sure there's nothing wrong? frowned Bethany. Molson rolled his eyes. I'm good. It's not for me. Margot? Drew questioned, not really concerned. Ah, uh, she's okay as can be. You gonna see her soon? wondered Molson, knowing that there was not really any point in asking. Drew had not been to see their mother in a long time. No, Drew said shortly. When am I going to meet your mother? Bethany asked sweetly. Never. Trust me, you do not want to, grimaced Drew. She's not exactly mother of the year. My father was not exactly all that great either. Bethany reminded him. Yeah, but she's called Wacko Margot for a reason, responded Drew. She has her moments, Molson defended Margot. Sure, she's not exactly stable, but when she's in a good mood, she's real sweet. She needs a mental institution, Drew said definitively. It would be nice if you visited her, Molson tried again. That is not happening, Drew shook his head. Fine, said Molson as he slumped in his chair, one hand over his satisfied stomach. He was disappointed in Drew, but could not force his brother to go see Margot. He wished Drew would visit her. Maybe he would see how their mother had been deteriorating lately and offer some help. Or at least some cash to hire help. Molson sighed and checked his phone for the time. He needed to get going if he had any hope of getting Margot ready in time for the center. He would catch a catnap on the bus. It was a good thing he was a basic insomniac. I gotta bounce, Molson stood. 
Find out if it's even possible for this to work, with the gang leaders getting immunity in exchange for rolling on David. You need to find out if they'll even talk, responded Drew. You do your part, I'll do mine, vowed Molson. He had to make it happen. He was going to right his wrong and earn Michael's freedom. Remember, we've got that meeting tomorrow, Drew reminded Molson. Molson closed his eyes a moment. He had forgotten. Not that he really cared about the Ramsleys. However, Drew and Bethany had been invited to a meeting by the family, in hopes that, with pooling all their resources and knowledge, they might be able to come up with some solution on how to get Michael out of prison. Drew had invited Molson along. They both wanted to right this wrong. Somehow, he would have to catch up on his sleep at some point. Molson nodded grimly. I'll be there. I'll get it, Max Ramsley greeted his cousin Jake and the tabloid reporter Sterling Denver cordially at the door, unsurprised that they had arrived together. In fact, he looked inordinately pleased as he ushered them in. Elle and Paget of the kids at Noah's place. Kelly is currently taking care of Anne and the babies, Max invited them in. The rest of us are trying to get an update on what everyone has found out at the moment. Jake greeted his brothers, introducing Sterling. Everett and Dylan were surprised, but kept their opinions to themselves, maintaining a polite demeanor towards her. Noah had already taken a seat, talking to Dylan and Everett. Drew and Bethany quietly pointed out who each person was to Molson, who had never met any of the Ramsley canon before. "'You're the tabloid reporter who splashed my mother's personal business all over the papers,' said Molson in disgust as he recognized Sterling's name. "'Who asked you to come?' "'I did,' Drew spoke up as he helped Bethany take off her coat. "'Everyone, this is my brother Molson.' "'I am sorry about that,' Sterling decided an apology was the best way to smooth things over, since she was trying to help the family. "'You should be.' Molson looked at Sterling like she was a bug he wanted to step on. He pressed a finger to his temple. Margot ain't all there. It wasn't right to take advantage of her like that. I didn't know, Sterling stated softly. It was going to take a long time for her to gain anyone's trust in the Ramsley family after her previous career. She gave Jake's hand a warning squeeze to let her handle this when he took her hand in his. His brother Everett raised an eyebrow at the contact. I apologize. That is enough, Jake warned Molson. What, you all cozy with her after all that trash she wrote about you in the paper? Molson challenged Jake with a touch of disbelief. Sterling had made her career writing about the Ramsley family's drama in a speculative fashion in the tabloid papers. She had put all their photos in the paper, had made cutting comments, and generally stirred up a lot of trouble. We talked and we worked it out. Jake said clearly with a tone of voice that brooked no argument. Molson, leave her alone. Drew remonstrated his brother as he seated Bethany. We need all the help we can get to prove Michael's innocence and David's guilt. Sterling is here to help. She'll not be putting any of this in the papers. Proof? A tired Molson laughed bitterly. I got proof. I recorded the man himself bragging about how he put Michael in jail. You got Bethany remember Pop cleaning drugs off the floor of a boat with her daddy. He tried to kill her because he's a sociopath. Then there's the paper trail coming from all that drug money he run through his own company. Don't all this count for something? Nowhere on the recording does David identify himself, calmly explained Drew. This makes the origin of the voice dubious. and You're not exactly a character witness material, Molson. While we could prove that Ted had a hand in attempting to kill Bethany... We could not pin anything on David, especially now that the pharmacy tech who filled the prescriptions has turned up dead. Bethany's regressive memories are admissible to court, but likely will not hold up under questioning. Any jury will discount them. Just because money has been laundered through the company does not mean that David did it. The finger could be pointed at a number of individuals, including Michael. That's bull, Molson exploded, pacing the room. I didn't say I agreed with it, Drew growled back. I'm just saying that the FBI has said to discount everything. Look, I don't like this any more than you do. If we were handling the case, I would bring all of this up and might be able to charge David. Individually, it's inconclusive. Together, it's all very damaging. However, when I spoke to Agent Law, he said none of it was pertinent to their case. 
Unless we can get something to stick, law will not look at it. What we need is solid proof, Everett inserted into the conversation. Short of a full confession, I don't see how any of that is going to happen. Drew rubbed his face, exhausted. He had been putting in extra hours trying to come up with any sort of solution, while Agent Law did his best to blow Drew off. We all know David is smug and conceited, but I don't think he's going to let me record him boasting about his victory. I have a different angle. Sterling hesitated to bring it up. I don't have proof yet. It's only a theory. What is it? asked Max, hopefully. A theory. Molson was sarcastic. A lot of good that'll do. Let her speak. Jake gave Molson a hard look, putting a hand on Sterling's shoulder. She waited a moment to get their attention. I have someone looking into FBI Agent Law's financials. What? Max was surprised. You think Dad is bribing him? Is that even legal? Looking into someone's financials? Bethany asked curiously. Can you do that? No, it is not legal, Drew answered with a frown, which means anything you find is inadmissible in court. True, conceded Sterling. However, if Law is accepting bribes from David, we will be able to find out. If this is the case, then perhaps some reason can be manufactured to look into the money trail and get them caught? This is crazy. Noah leaned back in his chair, shaking his head. An FBI agent accepting bribes. It would mean the end of his career. It would mean prison time, Drew commented coldly. It was no secret that he did not like law. The reality is, law is not likely to jeopardize himself for money. It is just a theory, offered Sterling. One that does not hurt to confirm or rule out, Jake supported her. If law is accepting bribes and we can prove it, what happens to the case? The whole case would be suspect. It would have to be reevaluated. Drew shrugged. It would implicate David, and he could be arrested again, as any deal the FBI made with him might be void if Law had a hand in it. However, there's still evidence against Michael. That doesn't go away unless someone confesses that they planted it. And that is a highly unlikely scenario. Not only that, we must have just cause to go before a judge to get evidence legally to implicate that Law is accepting bribes or planting evidence. If we can't find just cause, the evidence is inadmissible and useless. Then it doesn't help Michael at all, Noel asked grimly. No, it doesn't. Drew was quiet. He felt their situation was hopeless. He spotted Molson leaving and frowned. Where are you going? Molson paused at the door. He was tired of listening to them chatter about what would not work. To do something. I got contacts, too. I'm going to start asking some hard questions and see what happens. Drew sighed in frustration. He was still not sure about this plan of Molson's to try to free Michael. You really think your gangbanger friends are going to help? Won't well, know until I ask, Molson stated as he pulled the door shut behind him. Chapter 3 There was a knock on her office door. Normally Holly would have let Irma answer it, but her secretary was out for lunch. Setting aside her notebook, Holly opened the door to find Molson lounging against the wall. Beautiful, he said by way of greeting. Holly ignored the remark. What did you find out? You're all business, Molson tutted her. He straightened. Ain't you gonna invite me in? No, Holly smiled sweetly. We can talk right here. What happens when your secretary comes to the door? he asked. Irma knows that I'm trying to investigate further into Bethany Searson's case, explained Holly. I'm sure she will understand. Suit yourself, nodded Molson. I got a question. Why didn't you just talk to Bethany? She'd be the one who'd likely know the most about her case besides the police. I tried. Holly grew serious. She's not returning my calls. You think she blames you? Molson suddenly understood Holly's motivation. You wonder if she thinks you really did have a part in your near death. A client should be able to trust their psychiatrist, acknowledged Holly. I thought we had a good relationship. You're the kind of person that needs people to like her, Molson extrapolated with a lazy grin. I am not, frowned Holly as she denied his claim. Sure you are. He pointed to her office. 
I bet that's neat as a pin. You're a classic people pleaser. You have a hard time saying no, especially to people whose opinions matter to you. Stop trying to psychoanalyze me. Holly did not appreciate him saying these things. She liked a clean office. I'm the doctor here, not you. When's the last time you had an argument with a parent? Molson leaned back against the doorframe, cocking his head to the side as he watched her. A real loud argument. I am not doing this, declared Holly. You're the shrink. You know I'm right, he said softly. I am not a shrink. I'm a psychiatrist. She resisted the urge to fold her arms defensively. He was some gang member who did not know what he was talking about. Holly decided to steer the conversation back on track. Tell me what you found out about the investigation. Not all that much, admitted Molson, amused that she had changed the subject. It's still an open case. The pharmacy recordings were erased, so no one knows who filled the prescriptions. The girl who worked at the pharmacy the night the prescriptions were filled went missing. Cops found her body in a river. No signs of foul play, but her family says she don't swim. She was murdered. Holly took a deep breath. Never before had any of her cases been like this, where someone was willing to kill to keep a client silent. Probably, agreed Molson. Computer records state that Bethany picked up her meds. She says she didn't. Where's the investigation go from here? asked Holly. Nowhere, he grimaced. No proof of anything. Only Bethany remembering that she'd been told that if she didn't take the pills on time, she'd have to go live in a psychiatric ward for the rest of her life. Who told her that? questioned Holly. Would whoever it was be our suspect? Her dad told her that, Molson told her. The cops think he'd decide to overdose his own kid and have the case solved in a nice little bundle once the paperwork was finished. Ted Searson is dead, Holly stated flatly. Bethany's father had died in prison of a severe allergic reaction. It had made the front page of the news. That is just a little too convenient. When we last saw him, he was begging you to save Bethany's life. I believe that he did not want his daughter to die. Molson had seen Ted's reaction to Bethany's near-death condition. He knew Ted had not wanted her to die. The man's tearful plea had been heartfelt, even if he was a weak person. I have a suspicion of who tried to kill Beth. Who? Holly jumped on his remark. You remember the guy in the office? He asked her. Yes, the older man who was Mr. Searson's friend. I don't recall his name, Holly admitted. Everything had happened so fast, and she had mainly been concerned for Bethany's welfare. You had a theory when we were driving to the hospital. Yeah, I think he orchestrated the whole thing. Mr. David Ramsley, Molson said the name with some disdain. Who is he? She wanted to know. If I recall correctly, you said he had something to do with Bethany's childhood memories? Beth saw the crime, he noted. You mean the memories of the boat? Holly pursed her lips as she concentrated on recalling everything that Bethany had said about the boat. She remembered being nearly drowned on the boat someone telling her to forget everything she'd seen. I believe she said something about a powder. It was likely a drug drop, responded Molson. The white powder was probably heroin. Two men were aboard the boat when Bethany accidentally stumbled upon the whole thing. One was her father, who convinced David Ramsley not to drown her that day. After that, Beth was put on medications and given years of counseling to ensure she would never remember the incident. She lived her entire life in a fog of fear because her father and David didn't want her to remember and testify against them. Then David Ramsley did try to kill her. Holly took in a deep breath. He should be arrested. There's no proof, replied Molson. What do you mean there's no proof? Holly demanded indignantly. He has motive. Bethany remembers him attempting to kill her on the boat. There's no reason that he wouldn't try again if her memories are resurfacing. No proof David smuggled drugs back then. Molson hated to tell her. He was just as frustrated over the situation. 
He did not like David and wanted the man to face justice. Bethany's repressed memories aren't going to stand up in any court. Too many people have been led to believe false memories planted by so-called professionals. I have never planted false memories in any of my clients, Holly said hotly. This ain't about you, acknowledged Molson. It's about a perceived impression the jury could have. It won't stand up in court. Then David Ramsley gets away with what he's done? asked an incredulous Holly. He gets away with attempting to kill Bethany, yes. Molson grimly agreed. He hesitated to say something. There's more, Holly looked at him shrewdly. What is it? Molson sighed. David might not be able to serve justice for what he did to Bethany. However, we know he ran drugs. We know he has framed his oldest son, Michael, for drug smuggling and money laundering. Drew and I are working on a way to prove it so that David can be convicted and go to prison. I want to clear Michael's name. Drew? Holly's brow furrowed as she tried to recall the name. Andrew? My brother, the detective? Molson clarified, sardonically reminding her. She had probably only remembered Drew as Detective Colburn, forgetting his first name. Then I want to help, Holly told him. Help? Molson had a laugh. How are you going to help? I don't know, she admitted. However, I'm going to try. Bethany should have justice. David needs to go to prison. Otherwise, Bethany will always be afraid that he'll try another attempt on her life. David is slippery. He's got power and money. Molson tried to gauge how serious Holly was. This ain't going to be easy to prove what he's done. Anyone who tries, their life could be in danger. Then I expect you and Detective Colburn to protect me, replied Holly. Drew ain't going to let you in on this. Molson shook his head. He was surprised Drew had allowed the rest of the Ramsey clan in on what was going on. Normally, his brother was a loner. Then again, everyone wanted Michael to be set free. Besides, he ain't allowed to investigate the case anyways. What do you mean he's not allowed to investigate the case? Holly questioned. He's a detective? First, it's now an FBI case, so the police don't handle it no more. Second, conflict of interest. Molson closely watched for Holly's reaction. He's the illegitimate son of David Ramsley. Holly mulled that over a moment before looking at Molson. Does that mean you're David's son as well? He provided the DNA, shrugged Molson. Nothing else. Then what is your motive for being involved in the case? Holly wanted to know. I accidentally gave David the idea to frame Michael, softly admitted Molson. Remember when I told you to roll on them before they roll on you up in that office when Bethany was ill? He took the idea and ran with it, pinning his crime on Michael. Michael's in jail because of what I said. That doesn't mean you're responsible for David's actions, responded Holly. The professional in Holly knew that he had internalized David's actions as a result of what he had said. She had done much the same when she had found out someone had forged a prescription pad to get more drugs to try to overdose Bethany on. He chose his path. It's not your fault. Maybe it's not. Yet that don't matter since it still feels like my fault. Molson ran a hand over his face with a sigh. I'm going to figure out how to end this mess and put people where they belong. David in jail and Michael back with his family. How? Holly wanted to know. I'm not sure yet, prevaricated Molson. How? Holly demanded this time. Don't try to lie or evade. Ain't nobody slip much by you, do they? He grimaced. I got friends who know people who know people who are witnesses, able to testify against David Ramsley. They might just prove he's the one running the drugs, not Michael. Then it would naturally come out that David Ramsley is one laundering the cash through the company, Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. I'll go with you to talk to these potential witnesses, decided Holly. Whoa! Molson put his hands on her arms. No way! These ain't nice people. They ain't going to be partial to me talking to them, let alone an outsider. There's a hierarchy involved. I don't even know if they'll let me talk to them. 
Holly frowned as she looked up at him. She brushed off his hands as she looked at his tattoos. Are they gang members? Yeah. Molson nodded, grimacing as he reluctantly admitted the fact. They ain't gonna say anything in front of you. Will you tell me what they tell you? she asked. A slow grin crept across his lips. That sounds like another favor. She rolled her eyes and huffed. Fine, another favor. What is Detective Colburn doing in the meanwhile? You said he was not supposed to investigate. That implies he still is. Smart and beautiful, Molson complimented her. He's going over whatever he can manage to get out of his sources at the FBI and going over all aspects of the case. We got a friend who has sources that might give us more information on a couple different fronts. Nothing concrete yet. Whatever we do find and bring forward, it's got to be solid. Hopefully before Michael's trial starts. How long until the trial, she wondered. They want to bump it forward, scowled Molson. The justice system wants to make an example out of Michael. They're already vilifying him in the papers as some rich guy who thinks he can do whatever he wants and get away with it. Is he? I heard he's a billionaire, Riley commented Molly. I ain't met him, he had to admit. Molson did not really know the legitimate children of David Ramsley. It's not like he had been invited to visit for the holidays. Drew likes him. Am I to understand that's a high recommendation? Holly raised an eyebrow. Suppose it is. Drew don't like many people. He really hates anyone or anyone tied to our pop. Molson took a small sense of satisfaction as referring to David as pop. It was a distinctive insolence on his part. Probably because Drew has childhood memories of the man before he decided to abandon our family. He blames his dad for his family dynamic. Holly knew the type from her case files. He's motivated, affirmed Molson. As long as he's not going to try to get him convicted at any cost. Holly didn't want the case against David to fall apart on technicalities. If anything, he's the one being the stickler for following the rules of the law, admitted Molson. Drew's insisting that everything be done right. If we can get rock solid proof, he wants it to stick. David has money and connections. Whatever we put up against them has to be airtight. I want to know what you find, what Drew finds. Holly unconsciously moved closer to Molson as she insisted on her position. I want to be part of this investigation wherever I can. If you need me to do anything that will help, tell me. Bethany was a client of mine. It's important that I help solve this for her and for myself. She doesn't blame you, he told Holly. Excuse me? She frowned at the turn of conversation. What do you mean? Bethany, don't blame you. Drew shared what you told him. He doesn't believe that you wrote those prescriptions. Not after the erased pharmacy video or the death of the pharmacy tech, explained Molson. She knows you weren't involved. Yet she's not returned any of my calls, responded Holly. Why did Bethany stop her therapy? She found her answers, he shrugged. Beth has also been a bit busy with the investigation as well. Is she personally involved in this case? wondered Holly. Is that wise? Probably not, admitted Molson. However, Drew will keep an eye on her. They're tied at the hips anyway. They're involved? Holly said dampeningly. That is not appropriate. He's investigating a case that she's involved in. Unofficially investigating, Molson pointed out. He's technically not allowed to investigate the case. It's still not a good idea, insisted Holly. She will have a hero complex over him. Bethany is very sheltered. Her maturity level is not high enough to realize that a relationship that started in the throes of danger is less likely to succeed. The bond that they have together is because of David Ramsley. Once the threat of him is removed from their lives, what will they have in common? The adrenaline of the moment will fade. He's happy. She's happy. Molson's hands crept out again to cradle her elbows, his fingers tracing her skin. They make a good couple. Plus, he and she have already been discussing their happily ever afters. Impatiently, Holly pushed his hands away. It's too quick. 
Did you just say he was thinking of proposing to her? Drew already did, admitted Molson. I haven't seen a ring yet, but I'm sure he was serious. It's not going to work. Holly grabbed a sweater from the closet and put it on, her mind lingering on his touch. Part of her consciously knew she had put on the sweater as another barrier against the man in front of her. It's too quick, too impulsive. Maybe it will work. Molson folded his arms across his chest. Who are you to say otherwise? In fact, I call in my payment for my first favor right now. Holly looked at him nervously, wondering what he would want. She didn't know him that well. It had probably been a foolish bargain that she had entered into, promising him favors. What do you want? When you see Bethany again, you don't get to disparage her relationship with my brother. You don't get to say it won't work. You don't get to admit your doubts, stated Molson. Fine, Holly agreed reluctantly. It was an easy thing to do since Bethany had not returned her calls. Holly was disappointed because she genuinely liked Bethany and wanted to help her. She was also surprised at Molson's request. It showed a remarkable loyalty to his brother, a quality he downplayed. Good, nodded a satisfied Molson. She's willing to see you when you got time. What? Holly was stunned. She had not expected to see Bethany again. You asked her to see me? I said you had some unresolved questions. He shrugged like it was not a big deal. He pulled out a slip of paper from his pocket, offering it to Holly. This is her new phone number. Beth says she'll talk to you as a friend. I think she's through with the therapy. Holly took the piece of paper. Thank you. This means a lot to me. Molson shrugged. It's not anything special. It is to me. Holly realized she was speaking the truth. She wanted to speak to Bethany again, not just because she was concerned for her welfare as her previous doctor. Holly also wanted to reconnect with Bethany, perhaps this time as simply a friend. Ma, I'm home, Molson shouted to be heard over the radio. He unloaded a bag of groceries on the table and put a hamper of clean laundry on a chair. Ma? Sighing, he went to the empty living room, shutting off the radio. Ma! He was maybe half an hour late. Then again, Margot could get into a lot of trouble in a half hour, depending on her mood. Molson grimaced and pulled out his cell phone. Maybe she was still at the neighbor's house. Hey, Clemmy, is Ma with you? he asked. Don't you hate Clemmy me? a stern voice said in his ear. She threw a shoe at me today. Did it hit you? Molson rubbed the side of his face. I found her pills again. I promise I will make her take him, and she'll be in a better mood tomorrow. Missed by a mile. Still scared the stuffing out of me. If she does that one more time, you can find someone else to look after her, Clemmy warned. I am getting too old for this. Clemmy, you need the income, and Ma needs the care. Molson tried to be practical. It's good for both of you. I need a raise if you think I'm going to keep putting up with her antics, Clemmy stated firmly. She flooded the bathroom, locked the door, and told me she was swimming at the lake. Is there damage? Molson's heart sank. He did not want to pay for a bathroom renovation. What do you think? groused Clemmy. I have the fan on it and the window open. Hopefully most of it will dry up quick. I know that you're not handy with any tools so don't think you're doing any work that needs to be done. Looking around the living room, Molson had to agree. His attempts to repair damage done by Margot were pathetic. He was no handyman. We'll work something out. More money, that's what we'll work out. Clemmy knew no one else on the block wanted to look after wacko Margot. She had Molson over the proverbial barrel. He would need to work more hours at the shop, Molson decided tiredly. Fine. Do you know where she is? I dropped her off at the house a half hour ago. If you weren't late, you might know where she was. Clemmy hung up on him. No doubt she didn't want to get involved in searching the neighborhood for Margot if she was missing. If Fielding had not kept him, Molson would have been here on time. 
The man had grilled him on various cases they had seen during the day. Anywhere he could, he pounced on Molson, putting him down and implying he wasn't fit to continue the program. By the end of the day, Molson had descended into giving Fielding the silent treatment. In return, Fielding had kept him past his shift, giving him a lecture on maturity in the workplace. Molson did not point out the irony. Ma! he yelled. There was no answer. Deciding a thorough search of the house was in order, Molson began looking. Sometimes, Margo would pretend to play hide-and-seek, thinking that she was playing with her kids in some distant year in the past. She was a small woman, and could easily fold herself up, which meant Molson had to check every cupboard, the oven, cabinets, closets, and under furniture. It was time-consuming. Finally, he found her, not hiding at all, but looking through pictures as she sat on her bed. Hey, Ma, Molson sat beside her. Thought I'd heat us up some soup. You want some? It would be easier to grind her pills and put them in a bowl of soup than try to get her to swallow them on her own. If she didn't know they were there, he could sneak them into her. Look at these photos. Margaret held out a handful. I was a beautiful bride. Yeah, Ma, you were. Molson automatically agreed. It was easier than arguing with her. If she wanted to think that she married David Ramsley, let her think it. It wasn't harming anyone but herself. He flipped through the pictures. She had a yellow sundress on and looked rather pretty in her youth, with a wide smile and sparkling eyes. Those were my friends. Margot pointed at each one. Wilbur, Oscar, Ginger, Audrey, Lorna, Barb. We all had such a great time that night. I think we must have spent at least a couple hundred on drinks. Where were you? Molson absently asked as he studied the pictures. Margot had so many pictures, he was not sure he had seen them all. There were stacks of boxes full of them in her closet, let alone in the basement. Atlantic City, Margaret told him. I wanted to go to Vegas, but David had to leave for business the next morning. What David probably meant was that he had to leave for his real family the next morning, Molson thought cynically. The group in the pictures were partying and having a great time. He didn't see any evidence of a wedding. Ma, why did you throw a shoe at Clemmy? Who is Clemmy? she asked, confusion swamping her face. Our neighbor lady? he patiently explained. She said you threw a shoe at her today. I don't see why I would. Margaret gave him an odd little look. I barely know the woman. Borrow a cup of sugar, and now she thinks I'm tossing shoes at her. She must be a little unbalanced. You should stay away from her. I will, Molson said easily. He knew that in a few hours, Margaret would not recall this conversation anyways. He didn't know why he made the effort to find out why the shoe was even thrown. It was an exercise in futility. Standing up, he gave her back the photos and kissed her on top of the head. I'll go make some soup. That sounds good. Oh, I was a beautiful bride, she murmured as she looked over the pictures again. Molson went down to the kitchen, glad she was going to be in a reasonable frame of mind tonight. He would spend the night and get her to the center in the morning. Molson would have to rebalance his budget tomorrow while on one of his breaks. Lately, the money coming in seemed to go out as fast. He had a little in savings and did not want to dip into it. Putting the groceries away, Molson pulled the block box of pills out from behind the piece of drywall in the living room. He hoped Margaret would not notice it there. She had a bad habit of playing hide the lock box with him and he was tired of it. The prescriptions she had were expensive. Grinding up what she was due to take, he put the powder in a chip bowl, then returned the box to his hiding spot. Heating soup was fairly easy, so he set the table at the same time, grabbing out a couple of buns and making easy cheese sandwiches. He gave a half a bun for Margaret's place. If she wanted more, she could have more, but he needed to be sure she downed those pills first. His phone chirped. Molson pulled the cell out of his pocket. With a smile, he noted it was good news. Sterling's source had come through. Chapter 4 Our source found evidence in the FBI case, Molson announced as he came uninvited into Holly's office. 
Holly saved her document and closed her laptop, putting aside her glasses. Hello, Molson. Would you please have a seat? He was already sprawled on her couch, ignoring her slightly chiding greeting. This thing is comfortable. Sighing, Holly got up from her desk. Evidence in the FBI case? Molson ignored her prompting as he got to his feet. I think that this would constitute another favor. At this rate, no one is going to know how many favors are owed to whom. She rolled her eyes. I know exactly what is owed. Molson gave her a slow grin. Unless you don't want to know what the evidence was. I want to know, Holly said grudgingly. Fine, I owe you a favor. She illegally obtained a record of the lead FBI agent's bank account records. He's been receiving money far above his pay grade ever since David was released and Michael was charged instead with money laundering and drug smuggling. It comes from an untraceable source, Molson informed her. We think he's getting the money from David as a bribe to change things with the investigation. Would that be tampering? Can the case against Michael be dismissed? Holly asked with excitement. If the money can be traced to David, that's proof that he's the criminal. Key words are illegally obtained, sighed Molson. Information can't be used. Then what good is it? questioned a disappointed Holly. It's not much good at all. Just another piece of the puzzle that says we're on the right path, admitted Molson. What about you? Have you made any progress with your gang friends? she asked. We ain't exactly friends, Molson responded dryly. It's not like we hang out for fun. Whatever, Holly dismissed his touchiness over the subject. What did you find out? Nothing yet. I'm still working my way up the food chain to the people that will be able to help, he told her. It takes time. We don't have much time, Holly pointed to the newspaper that was on her desk. The pretrial starts this week for Michael. That's not good, frowned Molson. No, it's not good at all, Holly agreed. Their self-imposed deadline was looming ever closer. They would still keep trying afterward in hopes of getting any verdict against Michael overturned. It would just be easier to get it dismissed before a trial. She realized that Molson had gotten too close to her again. What is it with you and crowding me? Excuse me? questioned Molson. You're in my personal space? Holly stood her ground. I was looking at the paper, prevaricated Molson. Liar? She accused him without any real heat. Whatever you say, beautiful. I like the way you smell, he told her with a lazy smile. You like the way I smell? Holly raised an eyebrow. Somehow I doubt that. It's true, he insisted gently, one hand reaching out to pull an escaped strand of hair behind her ear. How come you always pull away? I did not give you permission to put your hands on me, Holly informed him primly. What if I gave you permission to put your hands on me? Anytime, anywhere you want, Molson drawled lazily. Then nothing would happen, she tartly told him. How about I call in one of those favors, Molson asked her. For what exactly? Holly frowned, not certain where this was going. He had been flirting with her, and now she worried he might want something more. Just one kiss. Molson's finger strayed along her neck, causing her to shiver. One kiss only. A kiss? Holly was relieved and confused. Is that what you want? I think one kiss will either make or break, mused Molson. Either you'll choose to kiss me again, or you won't. Just one kiss, she clarified. You won't ask for any more kisses, or any other physical requests. I promise, agreed Molson. Even if it's going to be torture, you'll have to initiate the next move. Holly was reassured. That will never happen. You are quite safe from me. Unlike you, I don't have roving hands. Only with you, beautiful, responded Molson. Do we have a deal? Okay, she decided. What harm could one kiss do? He gave a self-satisfied smile, 
and Holly braced herself. It was a simple kiss, she told the butterflies fluttering through her abdomen. People kissed all the time. It was not a big deal. Molson, ever so gently, ran the fingers of both his hands along her jaw before tilting her head a little. He stepped in and brushed the lightest of kisses over her lips. Holly held her breath in anticipation. Yet nothing further happened. Her eyes snapped open as he slowly released her, stepping back. That's it? she questioned a little unsteadily, her heart racing. Part of her was disappointed. She had the sneaking suspicion that a real kiss from him would tilt the entire world. Part of her was glad he had not gone any further. She wasn't sure she could deal with that side of Molson. He gave her a lopsided grin. Only if you want it to be. It's now up to you to make the next move since I gave you a promise. She straightened her shoulders. Don't hold your breath. Yet I am, he told her. I'll wait in anticipation for you, beautiful. Would you stop calling me that? Holly tersely replied. Nope. Molson tucked her newspaper under his arm. When you're ready to kiss me, let me know. I'm not sure I'll ever be ready to kiss you, Holly said honestly. Being ready to and wanting to were two very different things. I think you want more than just a kiss. Molson had a self-satisfied smile as he looked down at her. I think you might even want a date. Where would you get that idea? She frowned. When you're ready, you can come to me at any time, he told her, while heading for the exit. That's my paper, Holly protested weakly. She sighed as the door closed behind him. Molson pinned his identification badge back on as he walked down the corridor of the hallway. He didn't want to have any issues with security, even though he knew that they had a habit of stopping him anyways. It was the tattoos. The staff was still getting used to a guy with gang tattoos being allowed to come and go in the hospital as he pleased as one of the staff members. What would you do with a newspaper? Dr. Fielding asked rudely as he spotted Molson approaching. Molson pulled the paper out from under his arm. Despite my education, I can read. Fielding pursed his lips in disapproval. You are supposed to be making rounds, not buying the paper. If you disappear again, I will report you. Yes, sir. Molson decided not to mention that it had been his lunch break. Fielding would not want to listen anyways. You can be with me for the rest of the day. Fielding did not look overjoyed at the prospect. If anything, he glowered. I think it might be best if I keep my eye on you. Wonderful, thought Molson. He would have preferred if Fielding had let him run scut with the others. Yes, sir. He followed Fielding as they met with patients around the hospital. Molson watched as Fielding discussed care, made different diagnoses, and generally ignored Molson's presence. He was supposed to be asking Molson to participate, but had not done so once. Finally, Molson had enough of it. You have a dislocated shoulder, he verbally jumped in to tell a patient when Fielding was about to give his diagnosis. We can put it back in, but you'll need x-rays to rule out any broken bones. Fielding ground his teeth. Will the x-rays hurt? The young teenager asked in concern. Will he be okay in time for the game this weekend? The father asked. The x-ray itself won't hurt, Molson assured the boy. The technician might ask you to move or hold your arm a certain way. That might hurt a little. But if it does, just let the technician know, okay? Okay, the boy nodded as he held onto his arm. I'm sorry, Fielding addressed the dad. Your son will need to rest the shoulder. He won't be playing any sports this weekend. They exchanged a little more information before Fielding brought Molson out into the hallway. Do not do that again. What? Molson raised an eyebrow mockingly. Participate? I thought that was part of the residential program. Hands-on training? Not for you. Patients are afraid of you, growled Fielding. You and your gang tattoos. Just stay in the corner and be quiet. I didn't come here to stay in a corner. I came here to learn. Molson narrowed his eyes. Maybe if I wasn't all staring in the background with my gang tattoos, I wouldn't seem so scary. 
I'm the instructor, Colburn. Do not forget it, Fielding insisted angrily. You're the one who doesn't belong here. The only one saying I don't belong here is you, muttered Molson. The mother in exam three was terrified of you, Fielding pointed out, none too nicely. She looked like she was waiting for you to pull out a knife and murder us all. You're exaggerating. Molson had noticed the woman give him a second look. He was used to that. He told himself it was not a big deal. The security staff is constantly verifying with me that you're not posing as a doctor, a gang member trying to steal drugs, complained Fielding. Molson wondered if that was true or not. They did stop him more to check his identification badge than any other person he saw at the hospital. They'll get used to having me around. You are not fit for this profession. Fielding walked to the nurse's station to exchange charts. The sooner you drop out of the program, the better for all concerned. I'm not dropping out, Molson insisted quietly. He plucked the new chart out of Fielding's hand. Do you think that I'm going to give you a passing grade on the practicum? Fielding hissed as he snatched the chart back. You are lazy, insolent, have gang associations, and are insubordinate. Shall I go on? You're cheating academically. I'm not sure how, but once I figure it out, you can bet I will be going to the board to get you banned from every medical school in the country. I am not cheating. Molson took a deep breath so that he would not lose his temper. Losing his calm would not help the situation any. You have perfect scores. No one gets perfect test scores, least of all a person like you. Fielding gave him a look of condemnation. What is that supposed to mean? Molson's voice had dipped dangerously low. "'You are the type of person to be selling drugs on the corner to teenagers,' answered Fielding. "'I was told that you are not even taking out student loans. How are you paying for your schooling? Illegal proceeds?' "'You don't know me.' Molson forced himself to unclench his jaw and uncurl his fingers. He was not going to get in a fight with this man, he told himself. Nothing would be gained by doing so. "'You don't know anything about me. Hi, Daddy. Holly approached both of them, a surprised look on her face. Molson, do you know each other? Daddy? Molson's stomach sank like a rock, leaving a sour taste in his mouth. Of all the people she could be related to, he would never have suspected Fielding. They didn't even share the same last name. Then again, neither did Molson and his father. Colburn is a residency student, Fielding said curtly. Really? Holly sensed the tension between the two men. I didn't know. That's amazing. It is. Molson forced himself to smile tightly. He shoved his hands in his scrub pant pockets so they would not be tempted to reach out to touch her in front of her dad. Your dad has been kind enough to personally take me under his wing. Fielding gave him a suspicious look wondering if he was being sarcastic. I will see you for dinner. Sure. Holly gave them a smile and continued on her way. Keep your eyes to yourself, Fielding curtly commanded. Molson dragged his gaze away from Holly and took a deep breath. This was not good. He knew that Holly was out of his league. Now she was also the daughter of the man who hated his guts. He had known this was going too well. Nothing in his life was ever easy, Molson reflected. Colburn, Fielding glowered at him. Get a move on. Coming, muttered Molson. Holly thought about Molson's offer of a date. She thought about nothing else all day. No, that wasn't true. She thought about that kiss as well, or non-kiss as it were. As a non-kiss, it had evoked a lot of feelings. Ones Holly wasn't sure if she was ready to feel. The butterflies, the excitement when he was around, the attraction. She had told herself it was because he could help her in the case against David, making him pay for trying to harm Bethany. Now she knew better, because she wanted to repeat the kiss. Then she thought about the tension she had sensed between her dad and Molson. The two men were not getting along. Holly was happy to see her last patient of the day leave. 
Finally, she could be alone and think about Molson. Laying on the couch, she coached herself through some basic questions, just like she would for any client of hers. What did she want? Holly asked herself. To find out what a real kiss with Molson would be like. Why? Because she found him interesting. He was a mix of conundrums. He tried to give off this bad boy, I don't care attitude, but the truth was that he cared very much. Molson thought he had done a wrong, and he was committed to right it. She could respect that. Many people would have simply thought they were too powerless to do anything. Molson was trying to take action to change what had happened. It was also interesting the way he kept reaching out to her. Flattering, she corrected herself. Holly admitted she was flattered by his blatant flirting and attention. The first time they had met, he winked at her. Now he was not even trying to keep his fingers from giving lingering caresses. It did not seem to matter how many times she had batted his hands away. He came back, invading her space, smiling, making remarks, never pushing more than what she was comfortable with, but testing the edges of the boundaries, still flirting. Somehow, in such a short space of time, Holly had gotten used to Molson's touch. She wondered if he really could manage to keep his hands to himself, to not crowd her space like he promised after their kiss. He said she needed to make the next move. Did she want to? Holly had to admit she did. She wanted to know what a real kiss from him would be like. She was curious to explore where things might go. He was not her type at all. She always dated guys she felt her father would like. Since losing her mother during her childhood, Holly had been a daddy's girl. She tried hard to make him proud of her. The only time that she had deviated from the plan was becoming a psychiatrist rather than a physician. She was still a doctor, and so the compromise had been a minor disappointment to her father. She dated doctors. Stand-up guys who were clean-cut, made good money, and were so very busy. Not that Holly wasn't busy as well. She was, so she understood a hectic schedule. However, the dates were all so bland. It had been a while since she had dated anyone. Limiting herself to doctors had not made for many men to choose from. Then again, had her father ever asked her to only date from the physician pool, or had she done it in an instinct to please him? Why was she always trying to please her father and not herself when it came to the men she dated? Molson was right about never fighting with her dad. Holly frowned. She could not remember a single real argument they had. Oh, they disagreed, but her dad would get his way and she would swallow any words of protest. He chose where they were going to eat when they met for lunch or dinner. She loved her father. But was she letting him determine too many areas of her life? What if she did go on a date with Molson? She doubted her dad would approve, even though Molson was working on becoming a doctor. Maybe that was part of the allure, a late rebellion of sorts. Well, if she was going to rebel, she might as well do it right. Holly smiled in anticipation at the thought, fingering a business card with an address on it. Molson had dropped it on her desk during one of his visits. She decided to cancel dinner with her father and go out instead. He was disappointed. Molson was not getting very far. He had put a bug in various ears asking for audiences, always a little higher up each time and he was starting to get a little blowback. No one wanted to talk to him. He was persistent. Molson was probably becoming annoying, harassing gang members every time he saw them, telling them he needed to speak to someone higher up on the food chain. Molson sighed and tried to concentrate on work. Sammy wiped his greasy hands on the greasy rag. It was hard to tell which had more grease on it, the rag, Sammy, or his overalls. Time to close up. Molson was tired. The hours at the hospital, the shop, looking after Margot, it was all getting to him. He finished sanding a burr on the compartment that was being readied to install in a car, then put away his tools. 
The other guides were already headed for the exits. You locking up? grunted Sammy. I got it, Molson nodded. He was last, and he knew Sammy had tickets to a game that he planned to take his son to. It would be unfair to make Sammy wait while Molson washed up. Good. Sammy was out the door with a whistle. Molson enjoyed the silence of the building while he washed his hands, arms, and face. He peeled off his coveralls, putting them away in his locker, exchanging his work boots for more comfortable shoes. The door opened, and he could hear shoes sounding across the cement floor. We're closed. Molson finished tying his laces and straightened up. Good. I was hoping to catch you before you left. Holly smiled as she approached. She looked curiously around. What do you do here? Surprised that she was there, Molson took a moment to answer. We custom fit compartments into vehicles. We replace the glass with bulletproof and put extra shielding in panels. When it's done, it looks like a regular car. Who needs a car with secret compartments and to be bulletproof? wondered Holly. The mayor? shrugged Molson. Politicians, some famous people, rich, or people who are big in business. I guess I never really thought about it, mused Holly. Molson looked at her curiously. Why are you here? I changed my mind about that date you offered, Holly informed him. It had been a bit of a surprise to herself when she had decided to come. Yeah? Molson's lips tugged into a smile before it disappeared as realization struck him. I made plans. Oh, Holly tried not to be disappointed. She had hoped that he was serious about her when he asked her out, not just one of his games. I guess we could go out some other time. No. Molson grabbed her hand before she could leave, threading his fingers through hers. Come with me. It won't be like a real date or nothing, but we could spend time together. Okay. Holly was pleased. You got comfortable shoes. Molson looked down at her feet. Always, replied Holly. She was not one for heels. Flats were as fancy as she got. Tonight, she wore sneakers with her jeans. Good, because we're going to do a lot of walking, he told her as he pulled the duffel bag out of his locker. After locking up the shop, he approached a motorcycle, taking out an extra helmet for her. Is that yours? Holly eyed the bike. It's Drew's. I borrowed it. Molson held out the helmet to her. You don't ride? I've never been on one, she admitted. You'll love it. A grin crept along his face. Molson helped her with putting the helmet on before straddling the bike. Hop on. Holly gingerly sat behind him. He showed her where to put her feet. Hug me like your life depends on it, he told her. Excuse me? Holly was surprised that his voice was so clear. Then she realized there was a speaker system in the helmets. Unless you want to fall off, Molson warned her as the bike roared to life. Holly frantically grabbed him, ignoring his laughter in her ear as he pulled away from the parking lot. It was a short drive, leaving her both relieved and disappointed. You first, beautiful, he took off his helmet. Oh, Holly quickly peeled her hands off of him, awkwardly getting off the motorcycle. She pulled off her own helmet, hoping her hair did not look that bad. Did you like it? Molson stowed the helmets away. I am reserving judgment, Holly said breathlessly. Whether it was from the ride or being such close proximity to Molson, she didn't know. Where are we? Come on, he took her hand, pulling her toward the back door of a building. Knocking, Molson waited until a man in an apron opened it. Pedro? Molson? Pedro greeted him. I'll have your stuff in a minute. Who's the lady? Holly, meet Pedro. Molson introduced them. Pedro volunteers here at the soup kitchen. Holly's helping me out tonight. Maybe with an extra set of hands I won't need to make two trips. Smart thinking, nodded Pedro. He propped the door open, then disappeared only to return with a pull cart, stacked with styrofoam containers. I can get the second cart ready in a jiffy. Thanks. Molson carefully maneuvered the cart out the door and down the step. What is this? Holly stepped in to help him. 
Soup. Smells like tomato today, sniffed Molson. He pulled out a container, popping it open. Yup, tomato. Why is he giving you... There must be nearly a hundred containers of soup here, estimated an odd holly. Molson replaced the lid and put the container back in the wire cart. Seventy-five in each cart. I bring around two carts, plus luncheon packs. Holly frowned, confused. She was about to ask another question when Pedro reappeared with a large tote handing it to Molson. Cheese and crackers, chocolate spread and breadsticks, he informed them before helping to haul another cart out the door and down the step. Grabbing a second tote, Pedro put it on top of the cart. You sure this little lady can handle the weight of the cart? We'll find out. Molson stacked both totes on top of his cart. Thanks, Pedro. No problem. He gave them a friendly wave before returning to the kitchen, shutting the door after himself. What are you going to do with all this food? questioned Holly. Hand it out. Molson tugged his cart along. Come on. Unsure, Holly pulled on her cart following him. It was pretty heavy, and she was glad that she was physically fit, because otherwise she would never have been able to pull it along. She was also glad she did not have either of the totes to haul or the duffel bag that Molson had brought along. You gonna be okay? It's not too heavy? Molson asked her partway into the second block. I might be able to put another layer of soup in my cart if I'm real careful about it. No, I'm good. Holly puffed beside him. Where are we going? A few more blocks and then we start near the laundromat, he told her. Start what? Holly tried to regulate her breathing and wished she had done a little more strength training at the gym instead of all that cardio. Giving away the soup? You'll see. Molson gave her a smile. You're stronger than you look. Is that a compliment? She pulled a little harder over a rough spot in the sidewalk. Absolutely. He gave her an appreciative glance. When they got to the laundromat, Holly was ready for a break. She sat down on the back step. Thank goodness. It gets easier as the night goes on, he told her. The load gets lighter as we give more away. Good. Holly was going to need a shower by the time they were done. Molson just grinned at her before walking down the alley. Hey, Holly yelled after him. You're not just leaving me here. Nope, Molson replied. He crouched down in front of a cardboard box and began talking to someone. Holly was so busy watching Molson that she didn't notice someone else approach her. Miss, you helping Molson tonight? A tall, thin man looked down at her. Holly jumped in surprise. I am. Sorry. Yes, I, I am helping Molson. My name is Holly, and you are... Jeff, he rasped as he coughed into his hand. He extended the same hand to her in greeting. Pleased to meet you. Holly hesitated for only a moment before shaking his hand. Are you okay? Been getting a bit of a cough, Jeff told her. Can't seem to shake it. Geo, my man, Molson greeted the older fellow. Have a seat. I think I will, Jeff sat down beside Holly. I will admit to feeling a bit winded. How are you today? I see you got yourself a pretty lady with you. She promised to help for the whole evening without complaining. Molson grinned, setting down his duffel bag, rummaging within it. I'm pretty sure that's not what I agreed to. Holly was amused at his teasing. I agreed to go out on a date, and somehow I've turned into his pack mule. Jeff laughed, then coughed again. That ain't no good, frowned Molson, pulling out a stethoscope. Can I have a listen? Listen away rasped Jeff. Placing the chest piece of the stethoscope on Jeff's back, he instructed the man to breathe in deeply. How's the knee? Right as rain. Jeff pulled in a deep of breath as he could manage. Again. Molson concentrated on listening as he moved the stethoscope over to listen to the other lung. You gonna make me use up all the air? Jeff kidded before taking another deep breath. Here. Molson pulled the stethoscope out of his ears, handing it to Holly. Listen, this is my lung. Curious, Holly inserted the earpieces and listened. That sounds like breathing in stereo. This is Jeff. Molson pressed the chest piece to Jeff's back. 
breathe in one last time. You tell me what it sounds like, Jeff told Holly before he pulled in air. I want to know. Holly frowned. There's a crackling noise. It's faint, but it's there. Molson nodded. Jeff, if you go to a hospital, they'd give you a chest x-ray. Can't afford no hospital. Jeff shook his head. My health plan lapsed years ago. Holly knew there were programs to help individuals who could not afford health care. She also knew these programs did not always cover all hospital bills, many times leaving people with staggering debt they could not repay. What are you going to do? I'm guessing it's pneumonia, responded Molson. Without an x-ray, I can't be certain. It's only in the lower lungs so far. With antibiotics, it should clear up, unless it's not pneumonia. He needs a prescription to get antibiotics, frowned Holly. Jeff would have to visit a doctor anyway. Don't need any doctor. We've got Molson, nodded Jeff. Molson searched through his bag, pulling out a pill bottle. He counted out a few pills, putting them into an envelope that he wrote the instructions on. One in the morning, one at night. Yes, sir. Jeff took the packet, putting it in his shirt pocket. How do you have antibiotics? Holly took the bottle, examining it. I have my sources. Molson took two soup containers and four snack packs, handing them to Jeff. By the way, Candy thinks you're cute. Candy? Holly asked, distracted as Molson took the bottle of pills, putting them away. Who? The lady in the cardboard box, explained Molson. She's super shy, so don't go scaring her. Oh, Holly looked toward the box. I think you're cute too, beautiful. Molson smiled, grabbing some more containers of food and taking them to Candy. How long has Molson been doing this? Holly asked thoughtfully. Years, shrugged Jeff. I don't rightly know. I met him about three years ago. Since then, he's been feeding and doctoring me when I need it. I tell you, if there were more people in this world like him, it would be a better place. Ready for the next stop? Molson asked as he approached them. Ready? Holly got to her feet. It was nice to meet you, Jeff. You two have a good night. He uncapped one of the soups, smelling it. Stay out of the wet weather, Molson advised him. I'll check on you later. They grabbed the carts and trekked along the alley. Holly met Rebecca, who had an ulcer on her leg. She was a cheerful woman, happy to see Molson and exclaim over Holly. She met Ike, who had recently gotten a part-time job at a Chinese restaurant, scrubbing dishes. Ike was slow mentally, but otherwise grateful for Molson's help and proud of his new job. Then there were so many others, all with varying mental health issues, physical health issues, and in need of food. Holly was surprised when Molson also handed out toothpaste, soap, toothbrushes, combs, replaced refillable water bottles, nail clipping kits, and even socks. If their socks are bad, their feet become bad, he explained. It's just preventative. Holly watched as he bandaged scrapes and cuts. She chatted with the people they met, learning about them as Molson applied ointment, handed out medical advice, and generally greeted these people like old friends. Perhaps they were. How often do you do this? Holly dragged her now empty cart behind. Night had fallen, and he had given her a flashlight for when they left the better lit areas of the city. Once or twice a week. I try for twice, but it's not easy with working in the hospital hours, Molson responded. This part of town, I want you to stay close. If I don't talk to a person first, you don't talk to them. Don't ever come here alone. Bad things happen here. Then why are we walking here? Holly moved a little closer to him. Because people need help, Molson said simply. Are you worried something will ever happen to you? She wondered. When I started doing this, helping people out, I got some flack from some of the gangs in the area, shrugged Molson as he explained. After a while, some of them realized I was doing more good than harm. They would bring their injured to me, and I didn't rat anyone out. A side benefit was that a lot of users were healthier, because of the care I gave, so they used longer. Only sometimes could I get some of them into rehab programs. We came to an agreement. I get to help people without being harassed. They get side benefits like free medical care for their members. Molson pointed to his neck tattoos. 
It started with just two of the gangs, and now it's six of them. The tattoos are to let you pass through their territories, surmised Holly. Molson nodded. He approached a group of perhaps six people waiting under the light of a building near a dumpster. One woman was holding a child on her hip. Look what we got. Dog Molson brought a girl, a woman chortled. Ain't got my designation yet. Molson set down his duffel bag, ruffling the little child's hair. Good thing, too. He might start charging. A man limped over to join the group. Then none of us could afford him. You ain't gonna start asking for money, are you? A younger woman, still in her teens, asked. I ain't charging, Molson assured them. Holly handed out food, rationing out the soup and snack packs as Molson heard individual complaints and investigated before giving medical attention. Holly answered questions about herself, learning more about the people they met. Here, use the antifuncal cream twice a day. Molson gave a man a tube before packing away the rest of the medications. Holly tucked her hand in Molson's arm as they continued onward. I think this is one of the best dates I've ever been on. Chapter 5 Really? Molson looked at her in surprise. It ain't been much of a date. No dinner, no fancy flowers or nothing. I like this better, admitted Holly. I feel like I got to know more about you tonight than the entire time we've talked before. Is that a good thing? he asked. Very. Holly reached up, lightly giving him a kiss. She could admit to herself that she could slip into love with Molson after tonight. He had shown how caring he was, how dedicated to helping others he could be. He was an amazing person. You do realize what this means, murmured Molson. What? questioned Holly. You kiss me. That means I'm free to touch and kiss you again, he gave a lazy smile. It does, agreed Holly. However, not tonight. My feet are asking for an Epsom bath soaking. We need to get this done. Only two more stops, Molson promised. Good. Holly started dragging her cart again. They went in at an apartment building. It was dank, and not all the lights were working. Molson knocked on a door. So far, all their stops had been out of doors. Holly did not like the unsafe feeling the apartment hallway gave off as people lounged in their doorways, watching them. At the second knock, a mousy little man opened the door. Ah, Molson. Hey, Chi, Molson greeted him. They entered the apartment, which was little more than a studio apartment without any furniture. There were sleeping bags and blankets all over the floor. Twelve people crowded into the room, some of them playing a game in a corner. Chi bowed to Holly. Hi, Holly gave him a nervous smile, glad to be out of the hallway, but overwhelmed by the smell of something cooking on the stove. No food, Molson told Holly as Chi solemnly watched her. His pride won't let the family take it. They look very thin, softly observed Holly. We respect their custom. Molson was approached by a little boy. He crouched down. Hey, Tud. Hey, Molson, the little boy said back, carefully enunciating. Molson was allowed to check the children. He mimed what they were supposed to do with any ointments or medications. He gave diabetic supplies to one of the teenage girls. Are they legal? Holly asked quietly as they left the apartment building again. Who knows, responded Molson. Two years ago, Chi brought Cola to me. She's the diabetic girl. They hadn't known she had diabetes. His family was kicked out of their community because Chi had chosen outside medical advice rather than let the local shaman deal with it. Shaman? Holly said disbelievingly. You're kidding. Nope. Molson was serious. Chi's family believes in tradition and hokey magic. It's still sometimes a struggle to get them to understand that she's not going to ever be cured. Do all of them live in that apartment together? She wondered. Yep. They handed out the last of the food at a local small park that had seen much better days. Holly saw a group of kids hanging out near the basketball court. Don't look, Molson advised her. They're dealing. The less you see, the better. They're just kids, noted a concerned Holly. Yep. Molson didn't like it either. And they ain't no good. Don't look, don't talk to them. They got a reputation for bad things. What about calling the cops on them, she wondered. 
No way, he told her. If word gets out that you're with me and you ratted on them, I ain't never going to be allowed back in any of the territories. All the help I give, I'd be over with one phone call. Done. How would they know it was me? Holly did not like the thought of just leaving it. Some of those kids were barely teenagers. If they got caught, maybe they would get some help. People talk. Molson turned her to face him. It'll get out somehow. I know you want to help them. I want to help them. They ain't ready to be helped. When they are, they'll come to us. I still think someone should stop them, she said stubbornly. Not you, Molson told her evenly. You know what happens to snitches? No, she frowned. Not good things. Molson chose not to elaborate too much. I don't feel like taking a beat down. Leave them alone. Maybe some day one of them will come over to us, wanting to get out. How likely do you think that is? she questioned. Not too likely, admitted Molson. Gang culture was one where fear was a strong motivator to remain with the group. The only thing I can do is keep helping people here at the park, and hope that if they need something, and want a better life, they'll ask. It's not right, Holly said softly. No, it's not right. It's not fair, agreed Molson. It's a choice. Get a couple kids caught by the cops, have them thrown in juvie where it'll be a minor inconvenience to them, then lose the opportunity I've created to help the nearly hundred other people we met tonight, or ignore them and keep helping these people. Holly hooked her arm through his again as they walked. Then it's really no choice at all. Sure it is. I just choose to help the most people. Molson watched her fondly. How's your feet? Sore, Holly admitted with a smile. You did good tonight, he complimented her. So did you. She leaned on him a little, enjoying walking through the city with him. A yawn escaped her, and Holly looked at her watch, surprised at the time. It's very late. I think it's early. Molson estimated it was near one in the morning. He enjoyed the feeling of Holly on his arm. She reacted much better than he had hoped being his assistant for the night. At the soup kitchen, they locked the carts and totes in a little back shed. When do you find the time to sleep? Holly yawned again. Between this, working, and the hospital, you must be incredibly busy. He had not even mentioned taking care of Margot. Then again, Molson was not too sure he wanted to introduce Holly to his mother. She might think insanity ran in the family. I sleep whenever and wherever I can, replied Molson. Power naps are my superpower. Here I thought being a nice guy was your superpower, Holly smiled. Maybe that too. He gave a lazy grin. A movement caught his eye and his smile slowly faded. Wait here. Stay in the light. Where are you going? Holly quickly asked, uneasy by his sudden change in demeanor. Just stay here. Molson walked quickly to the edge of the parking lot where another man waited. Who's the pretty lady? the man wondered. None of your concern, Juan. Molson frowned. What did you hear? Us says he'll meet. Juan gave Molson an assessing look. Club 40, back booth. When? he asked cautiously. Molson did not want to seem over-enthusiastic. He only hoped he could convince Huss to do as he asked. Tonight, Guan tapped his non-existent watch. Club 40 closes in 50 minutes. That's your window. Okay. Molson did not have to ask what would have happened if Guan had not found him. Probably he would never have had the chance to speak to Huss again. It was not every day that someone like him, a relative nobody, met with one of the kings. Not wasting time, Molson went straight back to Holly, then realized he would not have time to drop her off and make it back to the club before it closed. What was that about? she wanted to know. We got one more stop, Molson said reluctantly. Molson, it's late. I would like to go home, sighed Holly. Is it really important, or can it wait till tomorrow? It has to happen tonight, grimaced Molson. He hated to disappoint her. I got a meeting with one of the top gang members. Molson! Holly was shocked. This is dangerous. A gang leader? 
If I can get the leaders of each gang to testify that it was David that imported the drugs, not Michael, then they'll be both back where they belong. David in prison, Michael out, Molson explained. Will they testify? Holly was intrigued by the idea. She remembered Molson had raised the idea before, talking to gang members to see if they could clear Michael's name. Will they implicate themselves if they testify? They would, reluctantly responded Molson. I've been talking to Drew. We're hoping that in return for testimony, the FBI will give them immunity from prosecution. Only for what they say in this particular case, nothing else. Can the FBI do that? she questioned. They can if the courts agree to it, he told her. Trouble is, we don't know if we can get them to testify or if the FBI will agree to the deal. But why would they testify? Holly's brows drew together as she frowned. What's in it for them? They would want some sort of exchange for their testimony, right? I'm hoping I can appeal to their better nature. Molson shrugged. Some of them I've helped with medical stuff. I don't know if it will be enough to remind them of that. Probably not, but I gotta try. Huss says he'll meet tonight, so I'll just have to do the best I can to convince him. Then we'd better get going. Holly went for the bike. You are going to stay right beside me the whole time, Molson warned her as he handed Holly a helmet. Don't even think of going to the bathroom or nothing. Where we're going, it's not a place for you to be. If I had time to drop you off somewhere, I would. You do have an interesting idea of a first date. Holly pulled the helmet on. Molson decided not to answer that. He hoped the next time they went out, they actually had a normal date. He would like that. Dinner, flowers, maybe a little music. Someplace normal people went, or maybe since he was pretty broke, someplace private. Not that he had someplace he could bring her to since he was couch surfing. Not exactly a cool thing at his age. Pulling up to the club, Molson took a deep breath. He hoped he had not made a colossal error bringing Holly here. It was not like he had any guarantee that Huss would listen to him, or he might decide Molson was stepping out of his place and needed a firm touch to put him back where he belonged. Molson would hate to get a beat down in front of Holly. If they hit me, you stay out of it, Molson grimly told her. What? Holly pulled off her helmet, looking at him in surprise. You're not serious. I hope not. Molson stowed away the headgear. Just stay clear if anything goes down. Are you sure we should do this? Holly asked in consternation. If it's too dangerous, we can just not go in there. Holly, ain't nobody else gonna do it. He put his hands on her shoulders, trying to reassure her. This is the only way I can see to help Michael. If you got any better ideas, I'm all ears. Best case scenario, Huss will think about it. Most likely, he'll just laugh us out of the club. Worst case, I get a thrashing for being nervy enough to ask him to rat out David. Worst case, Huss decided to dust him. Molson decided not to mention that option. He was fairly certain Huss would not do that. Huss did not have a reputation of having a hot temper or doing things lightly. That was why Molson had hoped to approach him first. Come on. Molson took Holly by the hand. The building was jumping with dancers, servers, and people hanging out. The music was loud. Lights flashed in the darkness. Holly was glad she had Molson's hand firmly in hers. Otherwise, she would be afraid of losing him. The crowd was so thick. It had to be against fire code. Someone pushed into her, and she stumbled. Molson was there, wrapping an arm around her, pulling her along. He shouted something into her ear, but Holly could not hear. She wondered how they were going to have a meeting if no one could speak above the music. At the back of the building, they were ushered through a door. It seemed bright after the dance floor, yet it was only dimly lit inside. When the door shut, the music was down to a manageable level. A man looked them up and down. Who is she? She's with me. Molson kept hold of her hand. She can't go to your meeting, the man decided. She comes with me, or there's no meeting. Molson's tone brooked no argument. There's no meeting, the man shrugged. This was at your request, not Huss's. What if I stayed right here, asked Holly. I could wait until Molson's done talking to Huss. 
you can keep an eye on me the entire time. Holly? Molson gritted his teeth. That will work. The man pointed to a chair. You can sit right there. See? Holly sat down with a brave smile. I'll be right here waiting for you. Molson did not like it, but the only other option was to not have the meeting. The man gestured for Molson to keep going down the hall. After a brief hesitation, Molson went where he was guided to. Another man waited. This one frisked him, checking for any wires or weapons. Molson gave up the single jackknife that he carried in his pocket. It wasn't worth much as a weapon. He used it mainly as a simple tool. Molson was led into a dimly lit room. There was a booth where Huss and a couple of his associates were having drinks. They cleared out when he approached, leaving only Molson, Huss, and a couple of men a respectful distance away, providing security. I considered your request to talk very carefully, began Huss. I remember your help when we brought Aaron to you. He was my cousin. You have ten minutes of my time. Ehring had been brought to him with a gunshot wound. Molson had helped without asking questions. He knew that no one had wanted the man to go to the hospital, where questions would be raised, the cops would become involved, and it was possible that someone might get arrested. Molson knew that helping with his medical knowledge on occasion was the price he would pay for having free access to the neighborhoods where people needed him the most. My half-brother has been put in prison for a crime he didn't commit said Molson. His dad is a drug smuggler. The man framed his son. I know that you and the other leaders of the gang community have gotten the drugs for your own operations from David Ramsley or his associates. I need to connect the chain upward until it hits David. I need witnesses to testify that they got the goods from David, not Michael. I'm hoping you can help me. I am hearing a lot about your needs. Huss took a sip of his drink. He did not offer Molson any refreshment. What do I care about your family issues? Do I even know your brother? No. Molson scrambled for something to say to convince him. That's not the point. David is no good to you guys anymore. He's a liability. He needs to be taken out of the picture. Prison would do that. We don't use the courts to settle our disputes. Huss raised an amused eyebrow at him. Yet, yeah, this time you could, Molson jumped in. If I could get you immunity for testifying, you could show up, brag to the world that you're a king, and not suffer a single consequence. Some of us like to keep our lives private. The less publicity for the police to harass us with, the better. He shook his head. You're wasting my time. I saved your cousin's life, Molson pointed out. I kept my mouth shut. I ain't ever asked for nothing in return. I always said you were more asset than a liability, mused Huss. I might have been wrong. I will always help with my medical knowledge. It's not in question, Molson assured him. However, I need this. I need to get this man out of prison the legal way. To do that, I need your help. I don't want to say you owe me for your cousin's life. You don't. But if you did feel obligated, this would be a way to repay. I'll think about it. Huss tossed back the rest of his drink. Molson nodded, not feeling too hopeful about it. The meeting was over. Molson left the booth. Retrieving his jackknife, he slipped it back into his pocket as he went to find Holly. What happened? Holly stood up from the chair as he approached, the security detail man still right beside her. Outside. Molson slipped his hand into hers, relieved that she was safe. She held on to his arm with her other hand as they slipped through the nosy throng of people to exit the club. Once outside, he pulled out the helmets, handing one to her. What did he say? Holly asked again. That he would think about it. Molson pulled on his helmet. Do you think he will agree? Or was he just stalling? Holly questioned as she got on the bike behind him. I think he'll think about it. Molson did not want to try to guess what Huss might do. That way, he would not be disappointed. It was highly unlikely the man would agree to testify out of sentiment for a cousin. The problem was, Molson could not think of another reason to motivate Huss. Why would any of the gang leaders be convinced to testify? What would they get out of the deal? Molson needed to think of something solid and soon. Where am I bringing you? Home. Holly gave him the address, 
falling silent during the ride as she thought about what had transpired. When they got to her building, Molson insisted on walking her in. It's three in the morning, I just want to walk you to your door. It's a secure building. Holly got out her keys. She frowned as she thought, It seems to me you need a convincing argument to get them to agree to testify for Michael, something that is going to benefit these men. I know, sighed Molson. He threaded her fingers through his as they walked along the hall. I've been racking my brain for an idea. Just because it's the right thing to do ain't going to get no traction with these people. What if they did it to get rid of David? Holly wondered. What do you mean? Molson watched her curiously. I already floated that idea, but I'd like to hear your take on it. The FBI were investigating David, Holly thought out loud. The police are probably involved in that investigation. It's likely that they might be still keeping an eye on him. That means that David would not be able to smuggle any more drugs into the country. His usefulness to the gang network might be over. Then he might be a liability to them. He's probably got people working for him, Molson pointed out. Pop's an old man. I don't think he's out on the boat anymore pushing barrels around. He's higher up in the food chain. True, but who is the one coordinating all the drops? Holly raised an eyebrow as she stopped at her door, unlocking it. That has to be David. He didn't strike me as a man who liked to lose control of a situation. David would want to be on top of everything, in charge. If he's not able to communicate with his people, or the people he's coordinating the pickup of the drugs with, then he's useless. That particular drug supply would come to a stop. Molson turned the idea over in his mind. He was cleared of the charges. That means the FBI and the police ain't likely investigating him anymore since they believe Michael did it. Can we make David believe that the police are still investigating? Then he would not be able to make any jobs happen. Holly leaned against the door. What about Drew? Could he tell David that he's still being investigated? Drew's not allowed on the case. Molson shook his head. Being Pop's son, it's conflict of interest. And we both know he wouldn't let it slip to David out of family love, Holly said dryly. Molson thought for a moment. What if it weren't the cops or the FBI investigating, waiting for David to make a wrong move? What if it were the press? What do you mean? questioned Holly. I happen to know how to get a hold of Sterling Denver. Molson had a slow smile. The tabloid reporter? Holly was catching some of his excitement. Would she do it? It's a story. Molson thought it would work. If we can get him to realize that the press is constantly stalking him, listening to his every call, reading his emails, knowing his every move, then David won't be able to do anything. The supply of drugs dries up, hurting the gang's leader's sales. Then they might be willing to cut David out of the deal altogether. Holly grinned. That could potentially work. Thank you. Molson cupped her face, leaning down and kissing her. Holly was glad she was leaning against the door. If she had not been, she surely would have swayed to lean against Molson. The kiss was long and lazy, leaving her wishing for more when Molson lifted his head, his hand still caressing her cheeks. He watched her as she opened her eyes, a little lost in the kiss that had just happened. I think that we were made for each other, beautiful, he said softly. She drew in a shaky breath. I think it was a very good first date kiss, and it's time for you to go home. He gave her another quick brush with his lips on the corner of her mouth. Good night. Holly watched him as he walked away, ignoring the racing of her heart and her weakened knees. Seriously, you need to stop coming here, Drew moaned flinging an arm over his eyes against the bedside lamp that Molson had turned on. Get up, sleeping beauty, Molson told him, flipping back the covers. We got business to do. No. Drew rolled over, trying to ignore him. What time is it? Bethany frowned, looking at her watch. Four in the morning? Don't matter what time it is. Molson poked Drew in the back. Get up. There is no more cake. Drew told him. We ate it all. Go away. I'll get water and pour it over you, threatened Molson, just like Jana used to do if we didn't get up in time for school. You will not, 
growled Drew. Did she do that? Bethany asked in disbelief. She did, Drew commented darkly as he got out of bed, pushing past Molson for the washroom. Molson grabbed some clothes out of Drew's closet, throwing them into the bathroom after him. Get dressed! Where are you taking him? Bethany rubbed her eyes, blinking at Molson. To Max Ramsley's. He's going to get a hold of that reporter, Sterling Denver. Then we're all going to sit down, because I got a plan, Molson told her. Then I'm coming. Bethany pulled herself out from her warm bed, putting on a robe. You ain't got a lot of time to get pretty, Molson warned her. I want to get this going before people start leaving for work, and it has to wait until the end of day. Bethany rolled her eyes as she grabbed some clothes. Brush my hair, brush my teeth, grab a bagel, and I'll be out the door before Drew. Forget the bagel. I'm sure we can mooch breakfast off Max. It looks like he wasn't starving, so I bet he's got a well-stocked kitchen, Molson told her. You and your stomach. Bethany joined Drew in the washroom. A short time later, Molson was knocking on Max's condo door. He was loud enough to wake the dead. We probably should have called. Drew leaned against the wall, suppressing a yawn. You got his number? Molson asked in surprise. Yup. Drew slipped an arm around Bethany, who leaned on him. Molson frowned. You got Sterling Denver's number? Actually, yes. Drew frowned. Why do you want her number? We didn't need to come here at all, then, Molson complained as the door opened. I just needed to talk to Sterling. Then why are you here? A sleepy Max asked. He checked his watch. I had another twenty minutes of bliss before the alarm is set to go off. Cause I wanted Sterling Denver's phone number. Molson sighed, annoyed at the delay. Why do you need to talk to Sterling? asked Bethany, leaning against Drew's side. Come in, drink copious amounts of coffee. Call Sterling, Max invited them. Coffee, Drew murmured, pulling Bethany into the apartment. Molson reluctantly followed, shutting the door after himself. What is going on? Paget held a toddler in her arms as she emerged from a bedroom. Paget, you know Bethany, Max introduced them. This is Drew Colburn and his brother Molson. The police detective, Paget nodded, recognizing the name. Good to see you again. Max got the coffee machine started while everyone took a seat around the table. What is this plan, and why do you need Sterling Denver? Drew questioned his brother. First, call her and get her down here. Molson didn't want to wait. Or get her on speaker, and I'll tell all of you at the same time. Fine. Drew pulled out his phone, going through his contacts. They listened as the phone rang. Hello? A sleepy Sterling answered. Sterling, it's Detective Andrew Colburn calling. Drew identified himself. Do you have a moment so that we can talk? Okay. There was a rustling in the background of the phone. Did you find any more information about the stolen drug from Ramsey Pharma? He gave a copy of the information to Agent Law, Drew said dryly. I highly doubt he's going to get back to me. I know something more about our FBI friend, revealed Sterling. My source was able to confirm large amounts of unaccounted for cash going to his bank account. It's a possible indicator that he's been accepting bribes. My source is trying to crack the coding to find out where the payments are being routed from. If he can trace it back to David, then I'll have something that I can bring to Law's superior, agreed Drew. I have to figure out who he is, but have yet to contact him. I was hoping to have something in hand when we spoke. You need to speak to him. You need to find out if the FBI would give immunity to anyone who testifies against David, Molson reminded him. Why would the FBI need to give immunity to a witness testifying against David? Max wanted to know. Molson has the idea that he might be able to get some of the gang leaders who received the drugs from David to testify against him. However, they would need immunity so they're not implicated in the crime that they're testifying against, explained Drew. Will they do that? Testify? Max asked hopefully. Doubtful, responded Drew. They will, Molson said with false confidence. More like he hoped they would. You've talked to them already? Drew was surprised. I told you, I have a plan, Molson told him. 
We're going to put the squeeze on David. I know you can't investigate him, Drew, but Sterling can. She's tabloid. She and her press buddies can bug his phones, his computers, his house. They can stalk him. That is illegal, Drew interjected dryly. It's still done, admitted Sterling. The point isn't to actually put anything in the papers, although that would be an added bonus. Molson took control of the conversation again. We want Pop to be paranoid. We want him to think we can hear and see everything he does. We want him to believe that he makes a wrong move. He'll be out in the press for everyone to see, for the police to see. Why? Sterling was curious. If he don't think he can sneeze without the whole world knowing, he ain't going to be able to coordinate no drug drops or pickups. His part of the drug trade dries up, or he makes a play that will reveal himself. Either way is good, clarified Molson. Wrong move, we catch him, and his story to the FBI falls apart. He's out of business either way. That's what I want, the old man out of business. Once his source of powder dries up, the gang leaders ain't going to be predisposed to like him so much. He becomes a liability. The papers let it slip that he's not so good upstairs, a little dementia in his old age, some blabbing about his criminal activities, and now the gangs really think he's a liability. I can convince them to roll on David then. Maybe they take a hit out on him first, Drew muttered. More likely he'll get shanked in prison unless they keep him in solidarity. Molson grimaced. It could work. Sterling's voice came over the phone. That would be motivation to testify as long as you can convince them that testifying is a better idea than outright murdering David. It's important that they testify against David and to Michael's innocence. I can convince them. Molson was not sure he could, but he would give it his best shot. We just need to dry up the source of powder. What if David isn't giving the orders? interjected Paget. He has been under FBI and police scrutiny. He might have already delegated the task of coordinating the drops and pickups. It's possible. Not likely. Max handed out coffees. That is a control freak. He needs to have his finger in every pot and the final say on every project. I can't see him giving up control of something so important, even if he is being watched. He's also conceited enough to think that he can get away with virtually anything. Let's hope that will be his downfall. Drew sipped his coffee gratefully. He looked at his brother. Do you really think you can convince these people to testify? I can, Molson stated steadily. He would. He had no choice if he was going to right his wrong and help Michael. Okay, sighed Drew. Then I should talk to Agent Kepler at the FBI, Law's superior, and see if he would be interested in making a deal. I'll get started on creating pressure on David right away, promised Sterling. I can say a few things about Dad's deteriorating mental capabilities, offered Max. As his son, I lend legitimacy to the idea even if he refutes it. That is a good point, Sterling noted. Text me when you have time today, and I'll send over a couple of my competitors to take your statement. Since I'm involved with Jake, I'm not going to directly write about this. I wouldn't want anyone thinking I'm biased or leading. However, I have a lot of contacts in the industry who love a scoop like this. Good, smiled Max. Paget and I will let the family know that at every opportune moment, we are in the press questioning David's mental stability. Wait, Paget had a slow grin. Your mom said something about how David was going to have his annual checkup this week? It would look good getting David on tape coming out of the doctor's office, right? It would, Sterling readily agreed. If you can find out the address, I will get it done. No problem, Paget said confidently. I'll just ask Rachel. Sounds like a plan, stated Drew. He looked at Molson. I hope it works. So did Molson. Chapter 6 David Ramsley was seen leaving his doctor's office this morning, claiming that he is in perfect health after rumors are swirling about his abilities to continue as head of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, a news anchor stated, pictures of David trying to placate a pack of reporters streaming on the television screen behind him. 
Speculation of David's mental health have emerged as family members reluctantly tell reporters that David's memory has been slipping for years. Mood swings, denial, and outright fabrications have been cited as part of the patriarch's personality. Max appeared on the screen, followed by reporters as he walked on a job site. Alzheimer's? No, I don't believe he has formally been diagnosed with anything. What about rumors about David's mental and emotional stability? asked a reporter. Should he be director of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals? Is he mentally fit to fill the role? Mental health was the reason he retired seven years ago, Max told them. He and Mom went on a four-month cruise to try to get him to relax and refocus. I think it may have been ordered by the doctors. Mom was worried that he was headed for a nervous breakdown. The reporters chattered after him. Look, I've said more than I intended already. Max put on his hard hat. I need all of you to vacate the premises. We're about to level this building. Remember, for all your demolition needs, call Blow It Up Demolition Company. Noah Ramsley released a general statement to the press, the anchor told viewers. In the written statement, he says, I have long known my father to be slipping mentally. Over the past years, he has become more rational, demanding, and inconsistent. He belongs in a retirement community, not as head of a multi-billion dollar company. The lack of confidence in David Ramsley continues with other family members and even former employees. The news anchor resumed his monologue. This news station has learned that Rachel Ramsley, wife of David Ramsley, has decided to grant an interview today to former tabloid reporter Sterling Denver. We have obtained rights to air the interview, and we'll have it here on New Business at this afternoon. Molson tried to pull tape off of his fingers. Somehow, it had gotten wrapped around, sticking to itself. Grimacing, he decided scissors were in order. The problem was that he was right-handed and would need to use his left hand to wield the scissors. It was not going to be easy. "'What are you doing?' Holly put down her tray, sitting at the table with him. The busy cafeteria continued to buzz around them. "'Wrapping a present?' Molson motioned to the colorful paper. "'Should be obvious.' It's a lump. Holly raised an eyebrow, examining it. I just used a lot of paper. Molson tried to maneuver the scissors without much success. And lots of tape. I can see that. What's actually under all that paper and tape? Holly turned the package over in her hands. I hope it's for a little girl. It's for my niece. Coloring pencils and books full of pictures. Nice ones, not those cheap, dopey ones that have no imagination. Molson was happy with his purchase at the craft store. The pencils become watercolor paint when wet. I'm sure she'll be very happy with it. Holly gently took away the scissors, snipping the tape that was holding Molson hostage. How are things going with you and Dad? I was surprised to see that he's your supervising doctor. Molson tried not to grimace. He searched for an answer to her question that would not be criticizing. He didn't want to complain to Holly about her father, even if her dad was worth complaining about. He's got a lot to teach me. If he would ever teach instead of just insulting, Molson thought to himself. I'm glad the two of you are getting to know each other, Holly smiled. He loves you a lot. Molson knew that much was true. He does, she agreed. Did you see the news? Rachel Ramsley is going to be interviewed. I wonder why. I'm hoping to watch it. I get off at one, frowned Molson. Since Sterling's doing the interview, I'm hoping it'll be helpful to her plan. I've rearranged a couple of appointments. We could watch it in my office, offered Holly. I'll be there, beautiful. Molson promised, pleased. She leaned over to give him a quick kiss on the cheek before leaving the cafeteria. Fred whistled. Dude, the boss's daughter? Bad idea. Nah, Molson gave a silly grin. Best idea I ever had. She's perfection. She is going to get you kicked out of the program, predicted Fred. Molson chose not to answer. So far, he knew that Fielding did not have a clue. The minute he did, Fielding would come down harder on Molson than he already was. Just after one, Molson shut Holly's office door behind him, slumping gratefully onto the couch. Did I miss anything? 
Shh, Holly warned him. She had her laptop on a chair facing the couch, tuned to the new business network. The anchor was describing what was to come. It's almost ready to start. He wrapped an arm around her shoulders, concentrating on the screen as the view changed to Sterling Denver. Thank you. Sterling did not smile, a serious demeanor emanating from her. Today I was asked to interview Rachel Ramsley, wife of David Ramsley. Rachel has graciously agreed to give an interview about the rumors of David's health, his reinstatement as head of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, and her son Michael's imprisonment. Thank you for coming, Rachel. Rachel nodded regally. Just in her eighties, she was neatly dressed, but frail-looking. Her eyes gazed intelligently at Sterling. "'Please tell me a little about how you met David Ramsley,' Sterling asked gently. "'I was very young,' began Rachel. "'I was also impressionable. My parents wished for a good match for me. When David took an interest, he was encouraged.' He came from a good family, and my parents approved of him. David can be very charming when the occasion needs it. But that's just a facade? questioned Sterling. Yes. Rachel took a deep breath. It didn't take long for me to understand that David is manipulative and selfish. He expects to get his way all the time. He looks for ways to make people feel small, to push them to do what he wants, to get what he wants. While he never physically harmed me, David made it very clear that if I left him, he would maintain custody of our children, and I would never see them again. It was a different time. There weren't the support systems for women back then that there are now. Back then a wife simply ignored bad behavior on the part of her husband as best as she could. "'What sort of behavior?' inquired Sterling. David had multiple affairs. He has illegitimate children. Rachel stated calmly. She smiled a little. I'm supposed to pretend I don't know about it. So many of us wives do that at the club. We pretend we have the perfect husband, perfect children, perfect lives. We wrap up our bodies and homes in fashion and glitter, but we cannot cover what is really happening. It is there for everyone to know. We just will not talk about it. We're too classy. David was disloyal to you in your marriage, reiterated Sterling. Yes. Could you have left him when the children were grown, wondered Sterling. Then custody would not be an issue. Why stay? I had been the perfect housewife for so long, I was not sure how to be anything else. Divorce was still frowned upon, admitted Rachel. It takes a very brave woman to leave a situation that she should. It takes a brave woman to stay in a marriage, working or not. I also foolishly thought I could mitigate the damage that David might do in his son's lives. I did my best to counsel the boys to be better than their father, to have a sense of duty, honor, loyalty, that love and goodness were more important than anything else. If I had left, I would have given up any influence I had in their lives. I firmly believe that David would have done his best to keep them away from me, and David always gets what he wants. You have to understand, Rachel frowned thoughtfully. I believe the clinical term is sociopath. David doesn't feel things like a regular person. He does not have empathy. He cannot feel sorry for someone. It's just not possible for him. That makes all the people around him tools to be used. He's always been power-hungry, and it's gotten worse in his old age. David truly believes that he can get away with anything. He thinks he is invincible, that he'll live forever and basically rule his corner of the world. He is quite mad. Do you fear repercussions for talking out today? gently inquired Sterling. No. Rachel gave a delicate sigh. I'm sure that there will be repercussions. David won't take my betrayal lightly. However, I no longer fear him. I've left him. You've left him? echoed a surprised Sterling. When Michael was put in prison on that trumped-up nonsense, I confronted David about his part. He boasted about pointing the finger at Michael, that he was now free and Michael was paying for forcing David to retire. Anyone who knows Michael 
would realize that he would never be involved in any criminal activities. He's as upright as they come. He's sweet and gentle. He's a good lawyer and would never have risked his career. Michael had more than enough money, inherited from my father. He didn't need to involve himself in drug smuggling. I know my son is innocent. And I know that David was behind Michael's arrest. Sterling leaned forward in her chair. Do you have any proof? No. I wish I did. When I learned what he had done, I packed a bag and I told David I was going to stay with Anne. Anne was pregnant at the time and now she was alone, with Michael being incarcerated. David was livid. He does not like Anne, Rachel told her. I simply left. I plan on enjoying my beautiful grandbabies. What has David's mental health been like lately? Sterling questioned. He has become more vindictive, Rachel responded. David continues to lay on the charm and manipulation when he needs to, but he's moodier. He's very intent on punishing anyone he believes has done him wrong. I'm not certain he can tell the difference between the reality of someone slighting him or his own imagination. He's now a little paranoid. That's new behavior for him. How is he paranoid? Sterling's tilted her head to the side as she shuffled through her notes. He claims someone is listening in on the phone, Rachel scoffed, that people are tracking his every move. Are they? No, he's just being silly. Do you believe that he should be running a business? Is he competent enough to manage a multi-billion dollar company? asked Sterling. No, Rachel promptly replied. He's old. David is not in his right frame of mind. He will prioritize his own agenda over the company's good. Have you taken any legal steps to distance yourself from your husband? She queried gently. Rachel took a deep breath. I still have it in my head that good girls do not divorce their husbands. However, I do believe that a man is supposed to protect his wife, and she is to return the gesture. Any man that abuses his wife physically or mentally should find himself alone. Today I filed for separation from David. Do you have anything else that you'd like to tell our viewers? Sterling wanted to know. I would like to apologize to my children for not being strong enough to simply whisk you away when you were younger. I should have protected you better from your father. I apologize to the shareholders, because no doubt the stocks of Ramsley Pharma will take another dip from what I've just disclosed. I have no confidence in my husband as head of the company. I apologize to any woman who thought I was an example to be looked up to. I suppose I deceived both of us for a while. Mostly, I apologize to dear Michael, who should not be in jail, missing out on his wife and daughter's lives. Rachel took a tissue that Sterling offered, dabbing at her eyes. She sniffed delicately. Are we done? Yes, thank you for your time, Sterling said with sympathy. Holly turned down the sound as the anchor reiterated key points of the interview. He then pulled up a graphic of the company's stock, which was not faring well. Wow, Molson breathed. I didn't expect the missus herself to get involved against Pop. You really are one of David Ramsley's kids, Holly molded over. What, you didn't think I was telling the truth? Molson raised an eyebrow. Not that, I guess it just didn't sink in before now, shrugged Holly. Illegitimate kids, clarified Molson. That means I got no right to the dough the Ramsley family is swimming in. Too bad, teased Holly. Then I could be a fortune hunter. Molson rolled his eyes. He filled her in on what had happened earlier that day at Max Ramsley's condo and the conversation between the Ramsleys and Sterling. Then this is part of the campaign to raise the heat on David, Holly smiled. If we're lucky, it will work, said Molson. It will work, Holly was certain. She kissed Molson, acknowledging that he was addictive. Reluctantly, Molson pulled away. I gotta work at the shop. Plus, I better check in on Ma. What is wrong with your mother? Holly was curious. Is she okay? Molson grimaced. She's got a few issues. I pop in whenever I can to help her out. That's nice of you. Holly was concerned, but not sure she should pry. They were still getting to know each other. Maybe I could meet her sometime. 
It's only fair you've met my dad. Maybe. Molson decided not to commit to anything just yet. Taking Holly on his rounds was one thing. Having her meet Margot? That was another thing entirely. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Holly frowned as she watched Molson head out the door. Hesitating for only a moment, she called Bethany. A short while later, Holly was nervously waiting at a cute little coffee shop. Bethany had agreed to meet her there. "'Can I get you anything?' a short woman with blue hair asked. "'A uh, muffin and tea?' Holly was really not that hungry. It would seem odd, though, if she refused to order. "'What kind?' the girl raised a pierced eyebrow. "'Surprise me!' Holly gave a tight smile. "'Okay, don't blame me if you don't like it,' she left. Holly took off her coat and sat down. She was facing the entrance, so she saw when Bethany entered the cafe. Bethany! Bethany's face lit up as she spotted Holly. Dr. Ershman, I'm so pleased to see you again. Please call me Holly. You're no longer a patient of mine. Holly smiled. Have a seat. The waitress plunked down a muffin and mug. What can I get for you? I'll have the same that she's having, Bethany smiled. Another surprise coming up. The woman left. Holly eyed the muffin. It did not exactly proclaim what sort it was. How have you been? Good, gushed Bethany. I can finally sleep. I am not on any medications. I feel wonderful. No more nightmares? Holly was curious. No. It's like my brain shut them off within a month of understanding what was really happening on that boat. Bethany replied. She thanked the waitress for her muffin and tea. My mind feels clear. I've never been happier. I'm so glad. Holly was. She liked Bethany and only wished her the best. Holly stirred her tea, pulling out the bag. She took a cautious sip and was pleasantly surprised by an orange and pineapple taste. She checked the packet. Orange, kiwi, and pineapple. I can't taste the kiwi. Bethany frowned a little, then shrugged. Then again, kiwi doesn't taste like much anyways. I heard you were engaged, gently inquired Holly. Bethany smiled happily. The detective who was investigating my case, Andrew Colburn? Drew is amazing. I love him very much. Holly remembered when Bethany had described first meeting Drew to Holly. She said that the man was rude and intimidating. Now Bethany was singing his praises. She had obviously changed her mind. Part of Holly wanted to counsel Bethany to be cautious. She hoped it was not a case of hero worship, because Bethany was bound to be disappointed. However, Holly had given her word to Molson that she would not say anything against the relationship, and she would honor that. She sipped some more of the tea. What is his mother like? Bethany frowned, surprised at the change in subject. Why? She had not been very subtle, Holly reflected ruefully. I have a bit of a confession. I've been seeing Drew's brother, Bolson. What? Bethany looked at her in shock. You! And Molson! Yes, Holly replied. She tried a bite of the muffin and almost groaned in pleasure. Chocolate on chocolate on chocolate. She was not sure it should be classified as a muffin. It was too good. Can we get back to their mother? What was she like? Why is Molson reluctant to talk about her? I'm sorry. I'm not sure I heard you correctly. Bethany leaned in a little closer. You and Molson Colburn. Drew's younger brother. Holly tried to look cool about the whole thing. She knew it would seem unconventional, with Molson looking like he belonged to a street gang and her in pencil skirts plus a doctor's coat much of the time. Her fingers plucked another piece of muffin and popped it into her mouth as she tried not to blush. Was that a raspberry? This had just become her new favorite dessert. I like him. You like Molson? Bethany snapped her mouth shut. I admit I cannot imagine it. Where did the two of you even meet? Originally, when you were overdosing from the medication someone forged on my prescription pad, Holly grimaced at the memory. I do apologize for that. I'm not sure how anyone got a hold of that pad. It should never have happened. That's not your fault, 
Bethany assured her. You didn't write those prescriptions, and if I'd had a, more of a backbone back then, I would never have allowed my father into wheedling me into taking those pills. Then, when I was drugged up, I'm sure he or David Ramsley fed me more. None of that was your doing. I still feel guilty for it, Holly sighed. You should not, nor do I hold you responsible, Bethany told her. Now, dish about Molson. Have you two been seeing each other since then? Because he has not said a word. Holly smiled. No, we ran into each other at the hospital. I asked about you, we got to talking, and I've gotten to know him better. We went on a date, and it was fun. I think I am still in shock, Bethany breathed popping in a bite of muffin. These are delicious. I want the recipe. You bake? Holly was a little surprised. During their sessions, Bethany had never mentioned a hobby. Bake, cook. Bethany waved her hand dismissively. What is he like as a boyfriend? Is he your boyfriend? We've not defined anything yet, Holly responded. She liked that they were conversing as friends. She hoped Bethany would like to continue the relationship. However, I think he likes me as much as I like him. We could end up being sisters-in-law, Bethany pointed out. You have to come to the wedding. Be Molson's date. Sisters-in-law, chuckled Holly. I think that's a bit premature. We just started to figure each other out. I bet it was the bad boy image that got you, mused Bethany. I liked that about Drew. I also liked that he was a cop. It was two attractive things rolled into one. I think that it was he could not stop flirting or keep his hands off of me, Holly admitted. Plus, he has a sense of honor. Molson wants to do the right thing. He's committed to it. That really speaks to me. Colburn men, Bethany toasted her with her tea. Colburn men, echoed Holly. About my original question, what is up with their mother? Bethany rolled her eyes. Drew won't let me meet her. Pardon? Why? Holly's brow puckered as she frowned. He calls her Wacko Margot and has outright said that she's crazy. Bethany shrugged. I get the feeling she's heavily medicated for everyone's protection. Drew's told me some interesting stories. What kind of stories? Holly was starting to understand Molson's hesitation to talk about his mother. Let me think. Bethany tapped her finger against her cheek. They were playing cops and robbers with her in the park once, and she tied Jana to a tree. And, prompted Holly, they left her there overnight, Bethany said ruefully. The real cops brought her home. Margot lied and told the cops some of Jana's playmates must have done it. Holly blinked. That is child abuse. I get the feeling she's not exactly mentally competent. I'm surprised they all survived childhood. Molson once mentioned sledding races down the stairs, Bethany told her. Every time Molson comes over, he eats like he's starving. I ran out of milk once, and he ate cereal with water, told me it was just how his mom made it. That is beyond gross. Holly could not imagine the taste of soggy, waterlogged cereal. Considering how Drew was relying on Jana for food, and Molson tends to rely on Drew for a stocked kitchen, I decided to start cooking something decent. Bethany sipped the last of her tea. It really is true. The way to keep a man is to feed him well. How are your cooking skills? I might have to brush up. Holly made a face. Water with cereal? Bethany nodded. There were screams of delight from the kids. Molson smiled with amusement as he knocked on Jana's door. The party must be in full swing already for Jenny's birthday. It sounded like they were having fun. Miguel answered the door, a party hat on his head. Molson, we weren't expecting you. Just wanted to say hi to the birthday girl and drop off her gift. Molson motioned to the brightly wrapped, lumpy package he carried. Now is probably not a good time. Miguel took off the party hat, closing the door behind himself. It's Jenny's birthday. When's a better time? Molson frowned. Jenna's not exactly happy with you right now, Miguel reluctantly informed him. We've talked a lot about you lately. 
So? questioned Molson. She does not want you near the kids, Miguel stated baldly. Say again? Molson was certain he had not heard his brother-in-law correctly. She don't want me near her kids. That's right, Miguel said firmly. We do not believe you are a fit role model to have around our children. A fit role model? What does that even mean? Molson was caught off guard. So you're telling me I can't see my nieces and nephew? I'm their uncle. What is taking so long? The door to the apartment opened, Jana coming to investigate. She paused when she saw her brother. Molson? Is this true? Molson asked disbelievingly. You don't want me around the kids. Miguel and Jana exchanged looks. That's right, Jana briskly responded. You have gang connections. You work at that chop shop. You're always coming and going as you please while you mooch off of people. And you have a bad attitude. I have had enough. I don't want your bad habits to rub off on the kids. I am not having Jenny or Kara think that it's okay to date a gangbanger. I am not having my baby boy follow in his uncle's footsteps. The auto shop is legal. Everything we do there is legal, Molson glowered. I ain't got no full gang connections. If you didn't like me dropping in uninvited, you could have just said something. No gang connections? Jana huffed sarcastically. What is with the tattoos on your neck? They're gang tattoos. There is a connection. Maybe if you'd ask, I'd tell you what they was about, Molson returned angrily, instead of you just assume you know. You think you know everything. I know that you are no good for my kids, Jana heatedly responded. So that's it, Molson ground out. You're just kicking me out. Yes, nodded Jana. She sighed. Molson, you're not a teenager anymore. You need to stop rebelling against society, grow up, and take responsibility for your life. Grow up. Take responsibility. Molson choked out the words. He thought that this was something funny coming out of Jana's mouth, considering he was the one that was responsible for their mother, and no one else wanted to step up. I ain't been doing nothing but being grown up and responsible for years. Who else looks after Ma? Don't see you there. I ain't never missed a day of work. You mooch off of people. You couch surf. Jana listed his flaws. What's with the way you talk? I know you can talk better than this. I know because I half raised you. You just adopted the speech of those friends you used to have, those bums. Speak normally. Get your own place. Stop wearing scrub bottoms and hoodies. Get your tattoos removed. Then we'll talk about your being in the children's lives. You sure you want to lay down ultimatums? Molson questions. Because maybe your attitude stinks and you should get a new one. I have to do what is best for my family, Jana told him. I thought I was part of your family, he challenged. We need to get back to the party, Miguel interrupted them. The kids cannot be left unsupervised. Tell Jenny I said happy birthday, he said bitterly. Molson shoved the package at Miguel before he walked away. Chapter 7 You've been very quiet today, Holly commented as she watched Molson slump on her couch. He had come in about half an hour ago telling her he did not want to interrupt her work, then laid on her couch. For a while, she had thought he was taking a cat nap. Maybe he had. Now he was staring at her ceiling. I just want to be near you, Molson said softly. Concerned, Holly took off her reading glasses, rising from the desk. She squeezed herself to sit beside Molson on the couch and took his hand. What's going on? He shook his head, not wanting to talk about it. Gazing up at her, he played with her hand, gently massaging it. I think you're the most beautiful person I've ever seen in this world. Beauty fades, she gently told him. Not for you, Molson quietly insisted. You'll be beautiful when you're old, gray, and have one of those ugly tight perms. Holly laughed. Tight perms? Yeah, it seems to be a requirement. Molson had a part smile. Though why you would want to cut off your hair, I don't know. It's beautiful like you. Thank you. Holly was pleased with the compliment. Do you ever think of getting old? He suddenly asked. Wonder who you're going to be with? If you'll have kids, who will die first? The die first seems a bit morbid, Holly pointed out. 
If we grew old together, I want to die first, decided Molson. I don't want to live those many years with you than suddenly have to do without. I'd just be more in love with you each year. Until you went first, life would be miserable. Wow, Holly's breath hitched. It was an oddly romantic thing to say. You think it's strange to think that people could fall in love so soon? He studied her. Maybe. I don't know. Holly wasn't certain at what he was driving at. Was he saying that he loved her? It would be very quick. If any of her clients came to her saying they were in love this fast, she would counsel them to be cautious. Now she was on tender hooks, hoping that he did love her. Do you want kids? questioned Molson. Some day. Holly was not too worried yet. She figured she had time since she was barely past her mid-twenties. Two or three. I didn't like being an only child. I think where possible it's good to have siblings. Sometimes it is, frowned Molson. Maybe if they're closer in age. Jan and Drew seem to get on better than I do with them. Tell me about your brother and sister. Holly had a notion this might be where Molson's somber mood was coming from. Jana has three kids. She's married to Miguel. They're both cops, Molson recited easily. She's the oldest and mostly took care of Drew and me. She took care of you? Where were your parents? Holly questioned slowly. Ma's not the greatest. She got a host of mental health issues. Molson heaved a sigh. Pop left before I was born, as I mentioned before, so Jana did the best she could. It's made her bossy. Holly reached out to smooth the hair over his brow. She probably feels like you're one of her kids, and that gives her the right to tell you what to do. She loves you. She has a funny way of showing it, muttered Molson. You've met Drew. He's okay in his own way. Something happened between you and Jana recently, Holly guessed. I don't want to talk about it, Molson repeated. He took her hand, kissing her palm. When you do want to talk, will you talk to me? she asked. Yeah, Molson agreed to her request. How many children do you want? she returned the question to him. I like kids, he told her. As many kids as you'll let us have, so I guess that's two or three. Holly tried not to smile. You're that certain, are you? Certain that if I had the money in my bank account for a proper ring, I'd put one on you, he responded soberly. Molson. Holly did not know what to say. Too fast, huh? Molson had a self-depreciating smile. I got time. All the time that you need. I ain't going nowhere. You don't have any doubts. She could hardly believe it. He nodded. A few. Mostly about how I'm probably not good enough for you. How you might come to regret ever tying yourself to me. I wouldn't do that, Molson, she protested. When you came with me and helped hand out the soup to all those people, I knew. Molson shrugged, still playing with her hand, gently drawing his fingers over her skin. I could see a future with you. Holly smiled. You mean you just want me to be a pack mule for you forever? He had a sloppy smile, even though it did not reach his eyes. You found me out. I'm glad. Holly leaned down to give him a kiss. That day made me think of a possible future with you. It did? Molson looked at her with interest. Yes. Holly traced a finger down his cheek. I'm not quite at a ring moment, yet I'm thinking we need more dates. That we can do. His eye caught her watch. An annoyed look flitted across his face. Is your watch on time? Yes. Why? Holly frowned. Molson sighed. I need to get going. I have to check on Ma before going to work. Before you go, have you had much luck convincing the gang leaders to testify? Holly asked curiously. Did Huss get back to you? Huss has decided he's willing under certain conditions, Molson told her. Conditions which I'm not sure we can ever fulfill. Delat says he'll do it. Only as a payment for my helping his sister. Yolan is on the fence. He's waiting to see what happens. The others won't even talk to me. Is two of them testifying enough? wondered Holly. Agent Kepler said it was all or nothing, Molson grimaced. He also needs proof of Agent Law tampering with Michael's case. Without those two things, 
We got nothing. Molson came into the kitchen, tossing his keys on the table. He investigated the fridge, foraging for something to eat. Normally he knew better than to look for something edible in the house unless he had brought it through the door with him. There was a Tupperware container growing some sort of mold. The lone egg in the door was blue. Grimacing, Molson grabbed the container of mold and carefully handled the egg. The oval was a ticking time bomb, and he was glad it had not gone off in the fridge. Heading out the back door, he dropped the egg in the container over the fence into the neighboring yard. Ma! Molson yelled into the empty house as he came back in. Ma, you home? Just because Margot did not answer did not mean she was not home. Sometimes she did not hear him because she was sleeping. Sometimes she was in her own little world. Molson was still hungry, so he went to check in a cupboard. Maybe he would get lucky, and there would be something better there. Pulling out a box of cereal, he opened the top, crunching on the sugary, dry, stale bites when he paused. His keys were not on the table anymore. There was a single light on in the living room. Molson put down the box of cereal, the hairs on the back of his neck standing up. The house was eerily quiet, and suddenly contained a vibe that was uneasy, even a little threatening. Putting his hand in his pocket, Molson wrapped his fingers around the jackknife he always carried before approaching the living room. "'Welcome home,' said a man as he sat in the beat-up armchair beneath the lamp. He was gently tossing a set of keys in one hand. The decor could use something. Molson knew he was referring to the holes in the walls. Molson casually leaned against the door jamb of the room. My old lady sometimes hears the roaches in the wall. She likes to liberate them. That was not all Margot heard, but Molson did not feel the need to elaborate. He did a quick tally of what he could see of the man's tattoos. This man was a high-standing member of the gang. They told me you were funny, he chuckled as he leaned back comfortably. We should get down to business. By all means, Molson agreed easily. He kept his body purposely relaxed, even though he felt the tension within him build. I hear you've been talking to each of the kings, the man began, his voice soft as a snake and just as deadly, to ask them to rat out a major source of powder. I have, Molson confirmed. He wondered how many other people were in the house, or if it was just him and this man. See, that is a shame. He set the keys down the little end table and picked up a glass, swirling its contents. I don't like rats. Molson recognized the glass from one of the cupboard of the small liquor cabinet his mother kept. This guy had enough time to make himself at home and Molson was not amused. He did not like the idea of a gang member in his mother's house. I don't much like them either, but when part of the tree is diseased, you need to cut it off. The man took a sip from the glass. Explain. David Ramsley is unpredictable. He's old. Molson laid out his argument calmly, as if his very life was not on the line. His role in all this is over. He's never going to be a significant source of powder again. The FBI is going to be watching him. The NYPD are going to be watching him. He's done. He is still powerful and influential, the man reminded Molson. He rolled on his oldest son. He has no loyalty to anyone but himself, Molson stated flatly. If it suits him, he'll roll on each of the kings. You think we should roll on him first. The man had a sardonic smile. Tremblay, Molson thought in sudden comprehension. The mightiest king himself is sitting in my mother's living room. You must think it has merit, otherwise you wouldn't be here, Molson ventured carefully. I think it will create a power vacuum that only one of the kings will fill. One of us will rise. I enjoy getting promotions. Tremblay looked shrewdly at Molson. I want to know why you went to the others, 
and haven't come to me. First, because if I couldn't get their unanimous consent to the plan, then there was no point in coming to you. I wasn't about to waste your time, explained Molson. Second, because I have no leverage with you. Three out of the six are interested. If you can fulfill your end. Tremblay took a sip of liquor before setting the glass down. I have my doubts that you can. I'll get it done, Molson vowed. He hoped Drew could convince Law's superior to give them what they needed to make this happen. I can make it a unanimous six, Tremblay told him. Molson knew that this man had the influence to do so. He also knew that while Tremblay might be greedy for David's position, that was not the only thing he was after. Tremblay was a bargainer. He only did what was best for him. What do you want in return? Tremblay shrugged, pretending to think about it. A simple favor. Favors were never simple, especially unnamed ones, nor did they ever seem to be finished. Molson would be stepping into a world that everyone thought he was already in, but had never actually set foot in. He would be owing the largest king. When Tremblay asked for the favor, which would no doubt be illegal, he would have to fulfill it or face dire consequences heaped on his family and friends. Despite what everyone thought of him, Molson had not done anything illegal since he was a teen and had half-heartedly vandalized some walls with graffiti with a friend. He was not a gangbanger. He was tolerated by the gangs because he was beneficial in his own way, but that was it. If he did this, he would be chained to Tremblay's whim. If he didn't do this, David would remain free, and Michael would remain imprisoned. Molson could not let that happen. I don't have all night. Tremblay stood up. He walked to within a couple feet of Molson, looking him in the eyes. Do we have an understanding? Knowing that he was going to regret it for the rest of his life, Molson nodded. We do. Tremblay smiled. Good. You do your part, and I will do mine. Molson hoped Drew would be able to come through. Either way, he knew Tremblay would collect. Molson used his key on Drew's apartment entering without knocking, and went straight to the kitchen, even though he was not very hungry. Coffee. That was what he needed. A strong, black, bracing cup of coffee that would burn the tongue and the stomach. Molson flicked on the stove light and proceeded to get the percolator running. I am going to change my locks, Drew complained as he joined Molson in the kitchen. It is three in the morning. Yep, Molson agreed. It was early. He pulled out two mugs, setting them on the counter. I have to work at six, hinted Drew. You think you might want to make coffee at Ma's house? Can't, Molson sighed as he leaned against the counter, listening to the steady dripping of the coffee. It smelled good. He had forgotten how tired he was. Coffee would lift him out of his fatigue. I needed to talk to you. Why not wait until I got up for work? Drew rubbed his eyes, trying to wake up. He sat at the kitchen table. I thought you might want to know what was happening, Molson looked down at his brother. They were so alike and so different in so many ways. I can put David in jail and get Michael out. Drew stilled before looking at Molson in surprise. They're going to testify? These guys are really going to do it? Yep. Molson could hardly believe that he had managed it. Tremblay is going to push the other five to testify along with himself. Tremblay, stepping into a courtroom. Drew shook his head at the idea. How am I supposed to get him immunity? I've been talking to Agent Kepler, and while he is interested, he's reluctant. Why won't he do it? Molson poured the coffee, giving Drew a mug as he took a seat at the table with him. What does he want? He wants more proof that law is crooked, Drew responded, grimacing at the taste of the true strong coffee. Apparently, he does not like the guy much either. What about the extra money? questioned Molson. The payments to law's bank account that no one can explain? 
Sterling's source was not able to confirm that the money comes from David. Drew was regretful. It's all run through a bunch of offshore accounts. We can see Law got a payoff, but not from whom. What else do we have on him? Molson wanted to know. Nothing. Drew shrugged. Kepler says if we can find something, he'll reopen the case and give immunity to your gang buddies. They ain't my gang buddies, muttered Molson. What do they want in return? Drew asked as he shrewdly watched Molson. Don't tell me they're doing it out of the kindness of their hearts. I don't know, Molson said truthfully. What do you mean you don't know? scowled Drew. What is the deal? Molson sighed. Three out of four are out of obligations. I don't owe them anything. The others, Tremblay took care of it. He can make them show. What does Tremblay want in return, Molson? Drew repeated his question sharply. I don't know. At Drew's angry look, Molson elaborated. A favor. I owe Tremblay a favor. Drew breathed in with a hiss. I could be anything. Who knows what he'll ask you to do? I know. Molson didn't need the lecture. He knew it was not good. It's going to be illegal, growled Drew. Might even involve me or Jana. Maybe the rest of the Ramsey family. I know. Molson concentrated on the hard, bitter coffee. He hated it when Drew got on his high horse. What a brainless thing for you to do. You could end up in prison or dead. Drew practically shouted at him. His voice was so angry and forceful. I know, Molson yelled back. You don't think I don't know it? You think I just thought he was going to ask me to buy him some lollipops, write his homework, or ask a girl out for him? This ain't fifth grade. I know who Tremblay is and what he's capable of. He could ask you to kill someone, Drew pointed out. Are you ready to do that? I gotta be. Molson was not ready for that. He desperately hoped that he would not be told to hurt anyone. If I don't fill my end of the bargain, he'll come after you, Bethany, Jana, Miguel, the kids. I gotta do whatever he says when the time comes. Who is Tremblay, and why would he want to hurt us? Bethany asked as she put a robe on, padding over to the kitchen table. He's not going to hurt you. Molson did his best to calm down. He did not want to upset Bethany. I'm not going to let that happen. I am beginning to understand why Jana does not want you near her family any more, Drew seriously remarked. Molson snapped his head back, reeling from the verbal punch that Drew had just thrown. He doesn't mean that, Bethany said gently as she grabbed coffee and sat down. She took one sip, made a face, and added more cream and sugar. Doesn't he? Molson asked, staring at Drew. He sounds serious to me. Drew took Bethany's hand in his. Your actions could potentially harm my wife. You're not married yet, Molson automatically corrected Drew. We will be, responded Drew. I am not going to let you endanger her. You're going to kick me out of your life, Molson said flatly. His stomach clenched. He pushed aside his cup of coffee, certain he could not drink another mouthful. No, he is not. Bethany sought to defuse the situation. Your family. You'll always be in each other's lives. Tell that to Jana, Molson said bitterly. She just wants to protect her kids, replied Drew. A valid point. Stop it, Bethany told them both firmly. That is enough. Molson stood up. Just do what you need to do to get Tremblay and his goons immunity when they testify. Tremblay already knew what he wanted from you when he made the deal, Drew said tiredly. Whatever it is, he has the favor you owe him figured out. He's just stringing you along till he reveals it. Molson knew that. He laid a hand on Bethany's shoulder. Be good to him even if he's an imbecile some days. Molson, come back, Bethany pleaded as he walked out the door. He waited a moment in the corridor, leaning against the wall. No one followed him. More importantly, Drew did not follow him. Molson looked at the keys he had palmed as he had entered the apartment. It would probably take a couple of hours before Drew noticed Molson had swiped his motorcycle again. Molson figured he might as well get one last ride before Drew threw him out of his life forever. Ignoring the hollow feeling in his heart, Molson took the stairs. Riding the motorcycle, it did not take long to get back to Margot's house. 
he pulled the bike to the back of the driveway, knowing that it was not a great neighborhood, and Drew would have his hide if the motorcycle got stolen. The back door was open, and there was cereal strewn across the backyard. Sighing, Molson went inside. Ma, you done feeding the ducks by the pond? Sometimes, Margot thought she saw ducks in a pond in the backyard. Sometimes, she thought she was Mrs. Ramsley and insisted that everyone take her shopping. Other times, Margot baked the most disgusting things with whatever she had in the house. When he was a kid, Molson had eaten Frutio's banana loaf with mustard jelly. That particular cooking experiment had not been half bad. Then again, Molson had been starving as a kid, so any food was good. Whatever she was up to now, Molson was too tired to deal with it. He wished she would just take her medications on time. No matter how often he tried to force her to take them, Margot always seemed to get away with not having them. She was an expert at not taking her pills, hiding them, flushing them, throwing them up. Ma! Molson smelled gas. He went to the stove, making sure the dials were off. It was his secret fear that some day she would burn down the house with her in it. Ma, where are you? A noise from the basement caught his attention. His mother hated the basement. She would never go down there, saying it was too full of rats and too dark. It was an old cellar-type basement with a damp dirt floor and crumbling foundations showing the age of the house. There were boxes down there from some bygone era, thickly coated with dust. Molson was not a fan of the basement, either. Another bang emanated from below. Gritting his teeth, Molson opened a window to get some air moving. He gave himself a small pep-talk before descending the stairs. Suck it up, Colburn. A single light bulb shed little light on the situation. In his mind, Molson remembered that there should have been three lights working down here. He stumbled down the last step, eyes watering, pulling the top of his shirt over his mouth. It smelled strongly of gas. Ma? Molson asked as he saw a movement near the back of the cellar. He wove his way through the boxes, some of the stacks leaning precariously. Ma, where are you? Don't worry! Margaret shouted with wild eyes in her dirty face. I will get us out of here. Wait! Molson lunged forward as she swung an axe through the air at the wall, hitting it off the bricks, chipping away at the stone. She had a sizable hole in the wall already started. During her second swing, Molson was able to grab the axe, wrestling with her over it. Ma, let go! We need to escape! She shrieked at him. There was a tornado and we have been buried alive! curse the weather network. She had seen some pictures of some other state being beat up by Mother Nature, and now she thought the house had collapsed on top of her. I know how to get out, Molson tried to bring his words down to a more calming level. Argo did not respond well to pressure. The gas was giving him a splitting headache. The rescue guys are here. I can bring you to them. Really? Margot stopped fighting him over the axe. She panted as they both held on to the wooden handle. Yes. Here, hold on to the axe with me, and I'll lead you to the rescue guys. Molson started to slowly back up around the boxes. He looked up, noticing that one of the light bulbs had been shattered. The lights were on. That meant electricity was still running to that socket. Molson swallowed hard and gave a quick prayer not to die today. Come on, Ma, just a few more steps. I'm Margaret, she introduced herself. Are you one of those firemen come to save me? Sure, Molson gave her a half-hearted smile. Let's go up the steps. I didn't know firemen were so cute. Margot tittered and patted his hand. Don't tell my husband I said that. He'll get jealous. Your secret is safe with me, he promised. Molson knew that when Margot retreated into her younger self, she always referred to David Ramsley as her husband. It was annoying because Molson had never seen one bit of evidence that his parents had ever been married. Just another one of Margot's many delusions. They were almost up the stairs. Molson carefully took Margot's hands off the axe and laid it on the counter before bringing her outside. Let's go look at the stars. The stars, 
Margot sighed in delight. How did you know I like the stars? Just a hunch. Molson remembered her dragging them as kids to the city park many winter nights in search of stars. Jana had gotten frostbite once. He pulled his cell phone out of his pocket and dialed 911, grateful that they had made it out alive. Chapter 8 Hours later, he was filling out paperwork in the hospital, a headache still beating its way around inside his skull. Molson rubbed his eyes as he handed the forms back to a nurse and was buzzed through to the exam room. Margot had been sedated. She'd thrown a fit when they had put her in the ambulance. She wanted to continue to stargaze, and the paramedics had needed to assess how she was after inhaling so much gas. The firefighters had opened everything up so the gas could clear the house while the gas company shut down the flow. Margot had hit a line in the basement with her axe while she was fighting the weather boogeyman. Now in the hospital, she lay small and frail in a bed, looking like she could not possibly lift an axe, let alone swing one. An oxygen mask was on her face, and she was hooked up to machines to monitor her vitals. Molson slumped into the single chair. Do you have a list of your mother's medications? A doctor stepped in, holding a chart. It was in the house, Molson said tiredly. I can tell you most of the meds that I remember, but truthfully, she don't take them anyways. I try to make sure she gets them on time, but she just throws them up. Has she seen a psychiatrist lately? The doctor asked. She won't go unless I drag her there, Molson replied woodenly. Says it's a waste of her time. We saw Dr. Yeltz maybe three months ago. He suggested institutionalizing her. The doctor scribbled something on his chart. It might be wise to revisit the idea. She don't want to be in a psych ward. Molson looked up at the doctor sharply. Even for a small amount of time, institutionalization might do Miss Colburn a world of good, he said gently. We could see that she receives her medications, gets appropriate therapy, and work to regenerate her safely into society if it's a possibility. Your mother would be in a safe place where she could not be in danger to herself or others. Molson guessed the doctor had probably heard about the axe to the gas line from the paramedics. He rubbed a hand over his face. It would also give you a break from caring for her, the doctor probed. You must be exhausted. She cannot have been easy to look after. She asked me to take care of her. Molson swallowed thickly. I promised I would. You would be taking care of her by seeing that she gets the best care possible, the doctor noted with sympathy. I'm going to start the admitting process. In a few hours, we'll have her moved to her new room. What if he had not come home in time, Molson wondered. She could have blown herself up. She could have blown up the whole neighborhood. He set his head in his hands with a shuddering breath. Maybe he was out of his mind thinking he could do it all, thinking he could care for her amongst all the rest of the things on his plate. School, work, doing his rounds, taking care of Margot. Something had to give, and he admitted he probably had not been giving her the supervision that she needed. Okay. You're doing the right thing, the doctor told Molson before he left, drawing the curtains so that Molson could have some time alone with Margot. He did not feel like he was doing the right thing. Molson felt guilty. He felt like he was failing. He didn't know why he had come here. It was not like he was going to magically find something that the FBI had missed. It was more likely that someone would call the cops and have him escorted away for trespassing. It was an upscale sort of place, with huge houses overlooking the beach and a marina accommodating all the boats. He supposed he just needed to get away from the hospital for a while, away from Margot and feeling like he was doing the wrong thing by letting them keep her. She would hate him when she woke up and figured out where she was. Margot had a thing about hospitals. Molson walked along the dock, looking at the area, trying to distract himself. This was how the other half lived. It was nice if you could afford it. There was an empty slip, and Molson paused, wondering if it was the spot where Michael's boat had been. The FBI had seized it for evidence. It had been a dumb idea to come here. There was nothing to learn. 
Molson drained his takeout cup of coffee and looked around for a garbage to dump it in before he made the long journey back into the city. I hope you're not going to litter, a voice piped up nearby. Molson raised an eyebrow at a girl carrying a book under her arm who blinked up at him with a solemn attitude. She was perhaps eight or nine. Wasn't planning on it. You got a garbage around here? It's over by the clubhouse, she pointed. What are you? Litter police, said Molson, only half joking. No, she gave him a dirty look. The other guy threw trash off the boat that was here. I thought you might do the same. The boat that was here? Molson pointed to the empty slot in the water. Yep, Mr. Amsley's boat, she clarified. When did some guy throw trash off the boat? Molson asked, starting to feel a little excited. What sort of trash? It was a baggie with white powder in it, she stated importantly. I know, because I grabbed the net and I took it out of the water. Otherwise, it could have gotten wrapped around a motor, or a fish could have eaten it. What day? Molson barely breathed the words. Here it was, the missing piece. Someone who would be able to prove evidence had been planted on the boat. October 2nd, she held out her book. I wrote it in my journal. It was the morning of my birthday. I came out to watch the sunrise, and there was a man on Mr. Ramsley's boat. He threw the baggie overboard and then left. One day before Michael's arrest, Molson could not believe his luck. He had stumbled on a witness. Do you think you could remember what the man looked like? If you saw him again, would you know who he was? Of course I would. She gave him a look like he was silly. Molson took a deep breath to control his emotions. He was going to get Michael out of jail, all through the testimony of a little girl. Digging into his cargo pants pocket, Molson took out his cell phone, swiping to a picture of David Ramsley he pulled off the internet. Is this him? She shook her head. No, the man was younger. Molson's heart sank. It could have been anyone. Now all they had was a mystery man possibly planting evidence the day before Michael's arrest. It wasn't Mr. Ramsley. No, I know Mr. and Mrs. Ramsley. She pointed up the beach. They're our neighbors. Madison? A woman came walking down the dock at a fast clip. Your mom? guessed Molson. Yep. Madison rolled her eyes. She is overprotective. Madison, what have we said about talking to strangers? The breathless woman grabbed her daughter's shoulders, giving Molson a nervous look. He was asking about Mr. Ramsley's boat. Madison tried to explain, but was cut off by the fearful woman. Madison, hush! She remonstrated before turning her attention to Molson. I do not know who you are, but you should not be talking to little girls alone. I think you should go before I call the security guard over. Ma'am, if it makes you feel safer, please call the security guard, Molson offered. He had surprised her, he could tell. She had judged him by his appearance and thought him a scary bad guy. Tamping down his feelings of disappointment, Molson focused on Madison and what she may have seen. Your daughter saw a man on Mr. Ramsley's boat the day before he was arrested. I'm trying to figure out who the man was. It's my hope that we can prove Michael Ramsley innocent of what he's been charged with. She hesitated. The Ramsleys have always been such good neighbors. They're nice people. I believe he didn't do what they are accusing him of, Molson explained patiently. He searched his wallet for one of the business cards he had swiped from Drew. If your daughter can help prove that, then I'd really appreciate your family's cooperation. My brother is Detective Andrew Colburn. He works with the local police department. He's going to want to talk to Madison about what she saw. Are you a private detective? She frowned as she took the card. Madison's mom was obviously trying to put him in a better category of class, so that she could feel more comfortable talking to him. Is that why you're dressed this way, and have the tattoos? Something like that, Molson prevaricated nicely. He could see her relax as she pocketed the card. We'll be happy to help. Amy, the Ramsley's daughter, sometimes comes over for play dates. She motioned to her own daughter. Madison's really good with her, and I enjoy Anne's company. That's nice. He responded automatically as a thought occurred to him. Molson quickly tried to find a photo on the internet, but did not see one. 
dialing his brother, Molson put the phone to his ear. Holburn, Drew responded distractedly. Do you have a picture of law? asked Molson. What has that got to do with anything? Drew asked, concerned. Where have you been? I've been trying to get a hold of you. Do you got a picture or not? scowled Molson. I got a lead on something. Sending it now. Drew responded grumpily. You can't avoid this. I want to... Molson hung up the phone and checked his messages. Pulling up the picture, he held the cell phone so that Madison could see it. Is this the guy you saw? Yes, that's him, Madison said excitedly. Are you going to arrest him for littering? Molson had a crooked smile. My brother is going to arrest him for that and a whole lot more. Molson paused as he entered the ward. Margot was strapped into a chair by the window, vacantly looking outside. Her hair had been brushed and she looked clean in a pair of hospital pajamas. Ignoring the twist in his heart, Molson set down a bag of items he brought with him for Margot's comfort. Pulling up a chair, Molson took one of her hands in his. Hey, Ma. She spared him a glance before looking out the window. You ignoring me? Molson dredged up a bit of a smile. I brought you some stuff. Your brush, toothpaste, a toothbrush, your pajamas, your slippers, a book if you get bored. I don't want a book, she hissed. I want to go home. You can't go home. Molson's smile slipped. You never let me do what I want, Margot glared at him. You're mean. Ma. Molson pulled his hand away from hers, slumping in his chair. There was no reasoning with her when she got like this. Jana would never do this to me, Margot said snidely. You hate me. You had them lock me up. That's not true. Molson defended himself. It wasn't like she would hear and understand, more than he had to make the attempt for his own peace of mind. I love you very much. I've been looking after you for the last four years. Jana hasn't even been around. She had refused to come after Margot had insisted Kara was inhabited by an alien from Mars and needed to be covered in aluminum foil to protect the rest of them. Janna! Janna! Margot yelled. Molson pinched the bridge of his nose. Ma, if you keep yelling, the nurses will sedate you. I don't know who you are. Why are you calling me Ma? I'm not your mother. Margot sniffed, looking out the window. I'm your son. Molson patiently explained. He knew that Margot's moods shifted like the weather. There was no point in trying to keep up. I don't have any sons. I have a daughter, Jana, Margot insisted. Jana is fun. She lets me dress her up like a princess. We go sledding in the park. I don't know you. Go away. Molson ignored her, looking at the squirrels out the window for a time. Hey, a soft voice said. Molson looked up to see Holly pulling up a chair. He spared a glance at Margot, but saw that she was sleeping. Hey. I saw that she came in yesterday. Holly had Margot's chart. Molson nodded. He had been busy yesterday and concluded that since Margot was so sedated, she would probably just sleep the whole time. Instead, he came to visit her today. Where did she get the axe? Holly asked him gently. She had heard through the grapevine what had happened prior to admitting. I don't know, but she always finds them, Molson said woodenly. He was exhausted by the whole business. There might be a cache of them in the basement that I haven't found. I hope you would take them away, she softly pried, hoping that she was not going to offend him. Every time I find one, Molson sighed. I throw them in the trash. I take them back to the hardware store. I list them for free on Craigslist. People think I have an axe and hatchet fetish. I don't know where she gets them or how she has money to buy them, but she's got to be on a first-name basis with some hardware store owner. I get rid of one, three days later she's got another and is using it to beat the walls, the floor, or a chair. Holly gave him an assessing look. You should go home and sleep. Molson had a bitter laugh. They condemned the house. Holly looked at him in shock. How could they live in a house that was fit to be condemned? Do you have some place to stay? There's a room behind the shop, Molson told her. I've got some stuff there. There's a couch. Holly reached out and took his hand. 
What about your brother or sister? Can you stay with them? They aren't exactly being welcoming right now. Molson did not want to talk about it. Talking about it would just bring up all the pain involved. He wasn't sure he could deal with that today on top of the pain his own mother gave him. I got some good news. Good news? Holly pressed gently. I went to the marina where Michael keeps his boat. I'm not sure why, I guess I was just curious. Molson played with her fingers. I met a kid, Madison. She saw Agent Law on Michael's boat, throwing away a clear baggie that had white powder in it. She can place Law planting evidence on the boat. Her mom took her down to the police station this morning to give a statement. Does this mean that Law's superior will give the immunity for Tremblay and the others to testify? Holly held her breath in hope. Drew's supposed to talk to him today, nodded Molson. If we get the go-ahead, Law will be prosecuted for falsifying evidence, David will be taken back into custody for the original charges against him, and Michael will be exonerated. You did it. Holly squeezed his hand. You actually did it. Molson allowed himself a half-hearted smile. He should be celebrating. Then again, they still only had FBI agent Kepler's word that he would make everything happen. Molson would wait until everything was over before he celebrated. Oh, Molson, Holly hugged him happily. It finally happened. It happens when Michael is released and David is in prison. Molson cautioned her, even as he gathered her closer, breathing in her scent. He closed his eyes, savoring the moment. Until then, we hope for the best. All too soon, she drew away with a blush and stood. I should get back to work. Are you going to be taking care of her? Molson nodded at Margot. Holly consulted on this floor. No, Holly leaned down, brushing her lips across his. I told them it was a conflict of interest. Is it? murmured Molson. That might imply that we are in a relationship. Yes. Holly smiled, trailing a finger down the side of his face before leaving. Molson leaned back in the chair, mulling over what Holly had just said, holding it close to him like the precious gift it was. What is she doing here? Jana plopped a diaper bag on the bed before sitting down in the chair that Holly had just vacated, baby Miguel looking out from a sling with wide eyes. Why is she in the hospital? She looks fine. Molson looked at Jana with a little shock. Why are you here? The hospital called me. Apparently, I'm on Mom's contact list. I called Drew. Jana narrowed her eyes as she studied Margot. He will be here at any time. Have they got her on new meds? They know that her health plan is as basic as it gets. She's not racking up any bills for us to pay, is she? I upgraded her plan a while ago. Molson tamped down his temper. There won't be any unexpected bills. You upgraded her plan? Working in the chop shop? Jana was dubious of his claim. You cannot be making that much money. He barely spent money except on Margot or the people he adopted on his rounds. Molson's biggest expense was his schooling. He also had invested his wages back into the shop, bought in a couple of bars as a silent partner, and otherwise was a saver. His savings were taking a hit, but he had still some and was not worried. Once he graduated, he would be able to make the money back. It's not a chop shop. We modify cars. You put secret compartments in them where people can store weapons and drugs, Jana said in derision. We customize. What the customers choose to do is up to them. Molson tried hard not to get into an argument with Jana over work. What the shop did was legal. Why are you here? I told you. The hospital called me, responded Jana. When does Wacko Margot get out? Don't call her that. Molson agreed Margot was crazy. It still wasn't right to call her names. I mean, why did you bother to come? You haven't seen her for almost five years. Why stop caring now? I care, Jana glared at him. Could have fooled me, Molson muttered, bitterness creeping into his voice. I have a family, Jana defended herself. I've been busy. Protecting your kids from the low people like Ma and myself? Molson knew the words were a mistake to say, but he couldn't seem to help himself. Arguing already? Drew entered the room. He looked at Margot impassively. Are we having an emergency family meeting? We need to decide what is going to happen with Margot, 
Jana declared. She can't stay in the hospital forever, and she's not moving in with me. What happened, anyway? asked Drew. Why is she hospitalized? She took an axe to the gas line in the basement, drawled Molson. What? Drew looked at Molson in surprise. I knew she was crazy, Jana tissed, patting little Miguel as he fussed. Why would she take an axe to a gas line? Drew asked incredulously. She was locked in another one of her delusions, Molson said tiredly. She's supposed to be taking medications for those. Yes, when she bothers to take them, Molson agreed, his ire rising. Aren't you making sure that she takes her pills? Jana had a bit of an edge to her tone. When will I do that? Molson did not bother to hide his disdain. When I'm working? When I'm in school? When I'm sleeping? I do my best, and she hides her pills. She flushes them down the toilet. She outright refuses, and sometimes after she has them, she'll just throw them up when my back is turned. School? Drew frowned. Molson had not mentioned anything about going to school. Molson, she needs better care than that. She can't be an afterthought in your life. Jana ignored the school remark. An afterthought? growled Molson. Every day, I get up, and I wonder what she's been up to during the night. Every break I get at work, I call her. I'm the one who makes sure she's got groceries. I'm the one who reminds her to shower. I'm the one who cleans up after her messes. I'm the one paying her bills. I bring her to center. I arrange for aftercare with the neighbor lady. I ain't seen neither of you helping me out, he continued angrily. I ask you to come by, visit her. You don't want to put up with her. It ain't convenient for you. Well, now she's here because I can't do it all. She nearly blew up the house. Ma hasn't been right in the head for years. She should have been committed to an institution long ago, but she didn't want to go. So, fool I am, I didn't send her. Don't you two go judging me, telling me that I ain't done a good job when neither of you lifted a finger. Molson, Jana began, but Molson stood, interrupting her. No, I'm done with you two always judging me. You think you know so much? You make me feel like junk all the time. I'm doing my best, okay? My best. I'm the one who keeps trying to stay in your lives. Ain't neither of you care about me. You don't visit me. You don't ask me about my life. You kick me out like I'm dirt. Molson shook his head. Both of you can have Ma for the next five years. However, unlike you both, I'll still visit her. Molson moved past them, walking out the door. Jana was bristling. Drew held up a hand to forestall her. We deserve everything he said, Jana. It's the simple truth. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Where have you been? barked Fielding after Molson. He was walking through the hall, getting away from Jana and Drew. It was not like him to lose his temper like that. Molson did not feel any better for having done so. If anything, he felt raw over the experience. Nothing had been resolved. Molson shoved his hands in his pockets and watched Fielding stride toward him. Whatever was on Fielding's mind, it would not be good for Molson. Not for the first time, Molson wondered why he had gotten Fielding for his professor. "'You've missed the last two days without informing me or the school as to your reason of absence,' groused Fielding. "'I'm writing you up. One more infraction and you are done.' "'Well, let me inform you. My mom is in the hospital,' Molson replied. "'That's what I've been dealing with for the past two days.' It was obvious Fielding wasn't sure whether or not to trust if Molson was telling the truth. "'She's in room 232B,' Molson told him dryly. Let him check up on it if he wanted. Fielding looked at his watch. "'We have a full day of patience. Better get started.' Molson hesitated. Is there any way I can get off today? I haven't slept. Do patients take a day off? Fielding asked rhetorically. If you skip today, that's three in a row. Then I could suspend you from the program. Which Fielding would happily do. Molson rubbed his face. Lead on. There's a tapeworm situation in exam two, a kid with a fever in exam three, and a dizzy woman in exam five. Fielding handed Molson the charts as they walked. Which one comes first? Fever kid. Molson knew that was the protocol. The kid was at more risk than the other two unless the woman's symptoms developed into something that was more urgent. Debatable, 
Fielding started in on why the woman with the dizziness could be needed to see Eden first. They stepped into exam room three. You take the lead. Good morning. Molson was not sure if it was still morning at all. It could have been afternoon. He gave a quick, unfelt smile and greeting. He didn't know why Fielding was suddenly letting him take the lead. That had never happened before. I'm Molson Colburn. I'll be your attending today. What seems to be the issue with James? The mother took one look at Molson and her lips pursed in disapproval. You are not touching my son. Excuse me? Molson hesitated, surprised by her. I'm not having some gangbanger looking at my son. She bristled with a hostile voice. Ma'am, I'm part of the residency program at the hospital. I'm not a member of any gang. Molson explained patiently. I know what that tattoo means. She looked at Fielding. Why would you have this man working here? Hospitals are supposed to be safe places. I'm going to report this. Ma'am, I'm just trying to do my job. Molson looked at James, who was miserable and hot. Why don't you let me help your son? You come anywhere near, and I will sue, she exclaimed. Get away from my son. It says on the chart that James has had a fever for the past two days. Is that true? Molson tried to divert her attention to James. Why don't you tell me what you've been doing to try to bring down the fever? I said, get out. I want a real doctor. She grabbed her purse. If you don't leave right now, I'm taking my son somewhere else. Fielding grabbed Molson's arm. Excuse us, ma'am. Molson bit the inside of his cheek as he allowed Fielding to drag him outside the exam room. Do you see? Do you understand why you can't be a doctor? Fielding asked him. This was a special case. None of the other patients have said things like that. Molson fought with a familiar feeling of anger and frustration over the situation. How many of them look at you with fear in their eyes? Doubt that you know what you're talking about. How many of them do not trust you? They stand a little closer to their kids. They hover like a hawk to make sure you're not going to steal their purses. Fielding gestured to the tattoos on Molson's neck. As a doctor, you have to bring immediate authority and trust to the table. You can't do that. Molson struggled with the familiar feeling of despair. I'm not planning at working on a posh hospital. My first pick is general. I would think it would be worse there. Fielding softened his tone. That demographic will know exactly what each of your tattoos mean. Those patients will be even more wary of you. Drop out of the program. Stay away from my daughter. Molson had a sharp look at Fielding. Is this what this is all about? Holly, you got some nerve. I have some nerve? Fielding had a short laugh. She is way out of your league. A man like you will only bring her down in the world. If you have any feelings for her at all, you walk away. Leave Holly out of this, Molson growled. You're angry because you know it's true, Fielding told him. I'm angry because every day I gotta push against people like you, Molson said hotly. You all judge like you're better than me. You're not. I'm not the one running around with gang tattoos on my neck, Fielding responded. I'm not the one with a tear tattoo symbolizing that I killed someone, then expecting people to trust and respect me. That is unrealistic. You're not the right man for this job. You're not the right man for my daughter. You'll never amount to anything. And yes, I'm better than you, some whiny punk from the poor section of town. It's called privilege. I have it. You don't. I can't deal with this right now. Molson shoved the chart against Fielding's chest. You walk, you're out of the program, taunted Fielding. I don't care, snarled Molson. I'm walking away so I don't do anything I'll regret. Light get arrested for assault. Molson turned, marching blindly along the emergency department. Once outside, he drew in huge gulping breaths. He had just ruined his life. It would take years maybe four years of hard work to scrape together enough money with his savings to retake the practicum. Dropping out would leave a black mark on his student records. After an absence of that length, he might not even be accepted back into the program. He might lose his dream. He definitely would lose all the scholarships that he earned to take him this far. He needed those scholarships, and no more would be forthcoming since he had quit. He could report Fielding for harassment. 
Molson would have had a bitter laugh if the idea did not hurt so much. There was no point in reporting anyone. The Human Resources Administrator would take one look at Molson, judge him, and rule in favor of Fielding. Fielding was right. Molson did not garner a feeling of trust. People did not believe him. They second-guessed him. How could he be a doctor when no one trusted him to examine them, to understand the material, to give a diagnosis? Maybe it was all a delusion, thinking that he could do this professionally. The idea tore a hole through his gut. What about Holly? As a doctor, he thought he might be good enough for her. If he was not a doctor, he would just be a guy who worked in a custom auto shop with some business investments. Would he be enough? He knew Fielding would never approve of him. He would be causing a rift between Holly and her father. How could he ask her to choose? What about the favor he owed Tremblay? Were Drew and Jana right to try to protect their loved ones by banning Molson from their lives? If they were right, then who was he to put Holly in danger? It felt like a knife was twisting in his heart. Molson swallowed hard as he took in yet another shuddering breath. Everyone had been telling him he was trash for most of his life. Molson had rejected them, challenged them, wanted to prove that he could be something better, that he could help people and be somebody. A lot of good that did him. They were all right. He was just junk, and he should have stayed in his place in society where he belonged. Chapter 9 "'What is it?' murmured Bethany. It was still dark, the sun barely making its presence known. Drew had turned on the side lamp. "'I thought I heard the door,' Drew told her quietly. He flipped back the covers and went to have a look. The chain was off, the deadbolt undone, but the regular lock was secure. "'Did you lock this properly last night?' "'Yes.' Bethany grabbed her robe, putting it on as she padded toward Drew. "'I double-checked it.' The deadbolt isn't locked. Drew frowned as he flipped it to the locked position. What are these? Bethany pointed to the sideboard. Are those your motorcycle keys? They are. Drew picked up the other two keys sitting there. These are copies of the keys to the deadbolt and the doorknob. Bethany's brow puckered in thought. Who would have copies of your keys? Molson. Drew scowled. Why would he give them back? asked Bethany. He's always been free to come and go here. He's mad at me. Drew fingered the keys. Mad enough to give back the keys. He is your brother. You need to set this right, Bethany softly told him. You should have apologized immediately after that remark about kicking him out of our lives. I'm still not entirely certain that's not the right move. Drew scowled. I don't want you in any danger. I have a big bad cop to protect me. Bethany patted his chest. We talked about this. Molson is staying in our lives. I'll go by the shop on my way to work, sighed Drew. He wrapped an arm around her, pulling Bethany to his side. Molson will be glad to know that the FBI have decided to open up an investigation into agent law, and that the case against Michael will be dismissed today. And David will finally go to prison, hopefully for the rest of his life. Bethany leaned against Drew. Hopefully. Drew kissed the crown of her head. I love you, Bethany whispered. Good, because I love you. Drew checked his watch and decided he could hold his fiance for a few more minutes before getting ready for the day. An hour later, Drew was looking in confusion at Sammy. What do you mean Molson isn't here? He took some time off, Sammy grunted as he wiped grease-stained hands on a greasy rag. He was sleeping in the back room, but his stuff is gone. I'm not sure when he'll be back. Did he say what he was doing, where he was going? Drew frowned. One thing he always counted on with his brother was that Molson was punctual and steady about his work attendance. Nope. Sammy put the rag in his back pocket, then grabbed an air hose. You mind leaving? Some of my customers ain't too comfortable with a cop around. Sure thing. Drew scowled. He conceded the shop was not doing anything illegal. Shady, maybe, but not illegal. Drew had checked many times just to make sure. However, many of the customers did have criminal lives. Thanks for your help. Any time, Sammy attached a buffing tool to the air hose. 
Drew decided to go to the house. With Margaret in the hospital, maybe Molson was hanging out there. It was not too far out of the way, and he judged that he had plenty of time to make it to work. Caution tape and a typed notice on the door that the house was condemned by the city greeted Drew. Glowering, Drew tried the door. It wasn't even locked. Vandals could enter any time they wanted. Ducking under the caution tape, Drew pulled out his flashlight as he surveyed the kitchen. An axe lay abandoned on the counter. A couple of doors were off the cabinetry. The door to the cellar was open. Molson! Moving to the living room, Drew was stunned. There were holes in the walls, the floor, the ceiling. Stuffing from the couch spilled outward. It looked like a war zone, except that someone had laid a blanket on the couch and swept up all the plaster and lathe that must have come off the walls. Several attempts at drywalling had been made, making a patchy design. The carpet from the floor was rolled up, standing in a corner of the room. Pieces of plywood had been screwed down to the floor randomly, causing tripping hazards. What had happened here? Drew looked around in wonder at the familiar yet unfamiliar house of his youth. Molson! He went up the stairs, careful of the sixth step, which was broken. That had been broken since his childhood, as was the picture frame of a rare family photo of all four of them at the top of the stairs. Drew stopped, shining his light down on the broken step. Someone had nailed down a board. Drew carefully tested it, and it held under his weight. He continued to explore the three bedrooms, Margot's, Jana's childhood room, and the room he had shared with Molson for years. They were clean, but Margot's room contained more patched walls. A pane of the window had been replaced with wood. A drawer was open on her dresser, clean clothes neatly folded within. Drew remembered that Margot had not been one for doing laundry, which meant that Molson had probably been the one responsible for the drawer's contents. A vacuum stood, lonely, at the end of the hall. Molson's room was obsessively neat and minimalist. He had only a few clothes hanging in the closet. Drew would not have thought that Molson even lived here if it were not for the books on the shelf and the textbook on the nightstand. It was bookmarked, waiting for Molson to return. Drew picked it up, leafing through it. There was a schedule for a practicum at Mercy Hospital. All the textbooks in the room were medical textbooks. Drew frowned. When Molson had said he was doing some schooling, Drew had thought that he might be getting certified as a mechanic. It made sense since Molson worked at an automotive shop. After all these years, Drew wasn't certain he knew his brother at all. In the top drawer of the tall boy was a portfolio. In it was a sheaf of paperwork, some of it graded, some of it grades from tests. His brother was getting near perfect marks. Chemistry, biology, anatomy. Drew was surprised. Molson had never been one to bring back great grades. Then again, he had not applied himself very well. None of the siblings had good marks as kids. He was making a serious effort now. Drew could hardly believe it. His kid brother was trying to become a doctor. Checking his watch, Drew knew that he was going to be late. He pulled out his phone as he went back to his truck. Voicemail. I got the keys, Molson. I don't want them back. Drew paused. I'm worried about protecting Bethany. Yet I know that you would never hurt her. When the time comes, just let me know what Tremblay wants. I'll help however I can. Come by the apartment to pick up the keys and we can talk. I'll even let you make the coffee, although that gut rot you gave me gave me an ulcer. Law is going to be investigated, and Michael will be let out today. It's all because of you. I know I don't ever say it, but I am proud of you. Drew ended the call. The nationwide search for billionaire David Ramsley continues. The FBI claims the former head of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals was involved in drug smuggling and money laundering. It's believed that he framed his oldest son, Michael Ramsley, for his own crimes. Michael was released from custody yesterday, but there's still no sign of David, who disappeared before FBI could close in on him, making officials wonder if he had been tipped off about his imminent arrest. FBI are satisfied that sons Michael, Maxwell, and Noah Ramsley were not involved in the drug smuggling. However, Ramsley Pharmaceuticals continues to be investigated and is expected to pay a heavy fine. 
making the company's future uncertain. Robert Ramsley continues to await his pre-trial date, which has now been set for next month. The billionaire tycoon of Ramsley Insurance is accused of being a partner in crime with his brother David. The FBI is still investigating Robert and sons Jake, Everett, and Dylan Ramsley, as well as the insurance company. In other news, Molson shut off his phone, ending the news anchor's monologue. He had ignored his messages for the past few days. He took time off work. He found a room to rent for the month since he was not sure about the legalities of a condemned house. Molson was going to have to find out if he was allowed to get workmen in to repair it, or even if he wanted to since the property was in Margot's name. Perhaps he would just let it fall down. Three days without talking to Holly. Going cold turkey on the love of his life sucked. Three days of doing almost nothing was brain-numbing. Molson was starting to feel itching with the need for something to do. He watched the sun rise over the water. Molson wasn't certain how he had ended up here, on the sand, listening to the waves of the ocean. In the middle of the night, unable to sleep, he had gotten into a cab and come here. People would be getting up soon, and he would have to go before someone called the cops. Molson did not want to get cited for vagrancy or trespassing. It was soothing. The sound of the water, the occasional bird. Maybe, if he ever scraped together enough money, he could find some place to live near the water. It would not have to be big or fancy like the houses behind him, just something where he could sit on a beach when the mood struck. Like that was ever going to happen. Those sorts of dreams were for other people. Holly had called five times. Three times yesterday. Molson wondered when she would finally stop. Fielding must be ecstatic. Molson tilted his head so the rays of the sun could catch him a little better. It was starting to warm up a little, yet he didn't bother to put down the hood of his sweater. There was a weird comfort in just keeping it up, warm around his ears. Someone jogged past, slowing and then stopping. Molson didn't look at the person. Perhaps if he just ignored him or her, they would go away. Moments later, the person dropped to sit in the sand beside him. Molson heaved an internal sigh as the man got comfortable. He didn't want the company, so he ignored him. A black and white dog sniffed around Molson. Molson's experience with dogs were to stay away from them. The people he knew kept the animals for security. This one looked like a pet. It snuffled around with its short nose, peeking occasionally at him from large brown eyes. Molson tentatively reached out a hand, letting the animal sniff it. The man beside him did not say a word. Finally, out of curiosity, Molson turned to look at the companion. He was surprised to see Michael sitting beside him, watching the rise in the sun. Molson studied him for a moment before looking out over the water. This was his oldest half-sibling the man he had only ever seen in pictures in the newspaper or on television. He wondered why Michael had chosen to stop his morning jog and sit beside him. Molson hadn't been looking for Michael at all. He knew this stretch of beach was where Michael lived, but Molson had chosen his spot to sit further away from the Ramsley house. I didn't mean to put the idea in Pop's head. Molson was surprised to hear the words come out of him. He hadn't meant to say anything, yet the words just popped out without his violation. There was an awkward silence. He sought to clarify what he had just said. About framing you. It was totally different conversation, but he just took the idea and set you up. I'm sorry about that. He thought back to the conversation that he and David had on the phone prior to Michael's arrest. The whole thing filled him with remorse. The worst part was David thanking Molson for the idea of framing Michael. Molson had never been more shocked or angered. You informed on someone else, Molson gritted his teeth. You threw someone else under the bus. And I thank you for the idea. It was all you, David gloried in the revelation. It took me some doing to lay the groundwork in case I was arrested, but it's turned out quite satisfactory. I'm out of jail because of you. Tell me, is he guilty or innocent? 
the sucker you've put in jail in your place, Molson demanded. Once again, thank you, son. I appreciate your contribution to my freedom. Molson felt a hand on his shoulder, shaking him out of his reverie, the mocking words fading in his ears. You must be glad to be out. Molson was not usually one to try to fill awkward voids of conversation, yet here he was, trying. Michael did not answer, and Molson remembered that he did not speak. Someone had mentioned something about an operation, leaving him unable to voice his thoughts. Molson supposed he should have paid more attention. He looked at Michael to find the man gazing at him with some concern. It's been a tough week, shrugged Molson. It's been a good week. You got released, which is a bit bittersweet. Gazing back out at the water, Molson thought the waves were a bit hypnotic. Did they tell you how Law was planting evidence? A glance at Michael confirmed that he had been told. He nodded and pointed to Molson. I didn't do much. Molson downplayed his part. I was just in the right place at the right time. That little girl, your neighbor Madison, deserves the credit for that. Michael pointed to himself, grabbed one of Molson's hands, giving it a handshake, then pointed to Molson. You don't need to thank me, Molson repeated uncertainly. At least he thought that was what Michael meant. Michael repeated the gesture firmly. Then he pointed to Molson's neck tattoos. Worst idea I ever had, grimaced Molson. Thought it'd be like some Mother Teresa or something. Michael gave him a questioning look. So Molson explained about his weekly rounds through the gang neighborhoods, where he gave free medical attention, hygienic supplies, and food. Michael pointed at the tear on Molson's face. That was me being dumb, explained Molson. I lost someone. A girl was overdosing. I'd helped her a ton of times before, and we'd become sort of friends. This time, nothing was working. Turns out she'd taken some new stuff that wasn't good at all, being cut with bad cleaners. I brought her to the hospital, and she died shortly after. I drank a little too much that night, stumbled into a tattoo parlor, and the rest is history. He ran a hand over his face. Now people think I killed someone and I belong to gangs every time they look at me. They don't ask questions, they just judge. They don't know that the tats on my neck are each of the six main gangs plus an extra special tattoo. All of them combined let me go into each territory to help people. Before, I was harassed by members when I was too deep in some areas. I had to campaign for permission from each gang. I had to explain to them the benefit of keeping their users and poor people in the neighborhoods alive. Now most of the gang members trust me. Sometimes they bring injured people to me. I never did no gang activities, nothing illegal. Yet people think they know all about me. They think I'm some murdering thug with a rap sheet and connections. Absently, he petted the dog before continuing with a bitter tone. I guess I got connections now, not that I wanted him. I owe a favor to a guy named Tremblay. Without him, there would have been no witness to testify that it wasn't you, but David, who did the drops. Tremblay made sure everyone would testify. Now I'm waiting to see what he wants in return. It's exhausting. Everyone dumping on me because they think I'm trash. There ain't much use denying it because no one listens anyhow. Now it's the truth. Once Tremblay calls in his favor, I'll get sucked in. And it don't end with a simple favor, it never does. Now what everyone thinks of me is true. Molson took a deep breath. I don't know why I'm telling you all this stuff. Michael tapped his ear. Yeah, you're a listener, Molson agreed. I suppose you won't tell anyone either. Michael shrugged and nodded with a self-depreciating smile. He rose to his feet, extending a hand down to Molson. After hesitation, Molson took it, letting the older man pull him to his feet. The dog danced around them as Michael led the way up the beach, motioning for Molson to follow. "'You don't want to bring me to your house,' insisted Molson. "'Did you just hear me? I've now got legit connections to a gang I can't throw off.' Michael sighed loudly, took Molson by the shoulders, and steered him along the beach to his house. "'My own brother and sister want nothing to do with me,' Molson tried to explain. "'They know if I mess up, the gang could retaliate on them.' You got kids, Michael. You don't want to be associated with me. 
It was a mistake for me to come out here today. Michael ignored him, pushing him up the stairs and into the house. The dog happily trotted past them to greet a little girl who was coloring at a table. Hi, Daddy. She wiped her blonde hair out of her eyes. Who are you? Nobody. Molson stuck his hands in his pockets, not wanting to touch anything. The house looked too nice. He wished he had taken off his shoes. Somehow his hood had fallen back, and Molson felt a little vulnerable. I was never here. Michael did a series of hand motions. Daddy says you're one of my uncles, she frowned. I've never met you before. No, you haven't. Molson looked at Michael in surprise at being labeled an uncle to this girl. Michael gave her a kiss on top of the head before going into the kitchen to feed the dog. My name's Amy, she piped up, picking up a new crayon. What's yours? It would be rude not to answer, Molson told himself. My name is Molson. Hi, Uncle Molson. Amy smiled at him. I should get going. Molson ignored the twinge in his chest. With Jana banning him from her life, he would never see Jenny, Kara, or Miguel again. He loved his nieces and nephew. Michael shook his head, indicating that he wanted Molson to stay. He came to the living room, pointing at a plaque on the wall. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Michael made a motion with his hand. Daddy says you're his brother, Amy clarified. Are you his interpreter? Molson asked her, trying to ignore the emotions that such a simple gesture wrought. He swallowed thickly. Yes, Amy nodded in all seriousness. It's a very important job. It is, Molson agreed quietly. Do you want to see the babies? Amy asked him. The babies? Molson was confused. My baby sisters, explained Amy. They're sleeping in their crib. If you're really quiet, you can have a look at them. Only if you're quiet, though. I don't think that's a good idea, Molson started to say, but Michael was there steering him along again. This time, Amy joined them. I wasn't <laughs> expecting an invitation. Shall I tell Mommy? asked Amy. At Michael's nod, she ran down the hall ahead of them, the dog following her. Michael, I appreciate the sentiment of what you're doing. Molson tried one last time. You can't want to introduce me to your kids and wife. I gave you a bunch of reasons not to on the beach. It's Uncle Molson, Mommy. Molson could hear Amy's high-pitched little voice as she told her mother who she was. He braced himself for the look of fear on Anne Ramsley's face when she saw him. No matter what her husband thought, Anne was likely to want him out of the house and away from her children as quickly as possible. Mothers tended to guard their young. He was pushed into a room where a lovely but tired-looking woman looked up at him in surprise. She looked at him assessingly. "'You are the one who helped Michael get out of prison,' she said softly. Coming forward, she gave Molson a hug. Not sure what to do, he carefully patted her shoulder. She drew back, tears in her eyes. Anne went to lean on Michael as she talked to Molson. I want to thank you. Without your efforts to get those men to testify, Michael would still be in prison. He would have been there for the rest of his life. We cannot thank you enough for bringing him home. Michael wrapped his arms around her, rubbing her back as she wiped her eyes. It was easy to see the affection between the couple. Molson had never felt so uncomfortable in his life. Uncomfortable in a good way. People usually were not thanking him. He cleared his throat, shoving his hands in his pockets and hunching his shoulders a little. I just wanted to make it right. Any time you need anything, you let us know, Anne insisted. You're invited to all the holidays and birthdays. You and your brother. Did someone say you had a sister? Yeah, I have a sister. Molson acknowledged quietly. Not that he was talking to Jana right now. Not sure that he ever would again. Now you have more brothers and sisters, Anne said firmly. You'll have to meet all of us. You are family. He has nieces, too, interrupted Amy. She was standing by the crib, her little hand reaching through the bar to touch one of the baby's feet. Just how many babies are in there? Molson rubbed the moisture from his eyes quickly as he turned to the crib. 
triplet girls slept peacefully, unconcerned with the noise around them. All girls? Aubrey, Emma, and Isabella, Amy announced. Wow, responded Molson. Those are nice names. Here, Anne scooped up one of the babies, then turned to him. Support her head. You don't have to. Molson swallowed thickly as he carefully held the warm bundle. Which one is this? Emma. Anne supplied the answer. She smiled. You are a natural at this. Molson had not had the opportunity to handle a baby this small yet at the hospital. He felt a pain that part of his life was probably over. A hollow feeling settled on him as he realized without Holly, he probably never would have kids. He didn't want to be in a relationship with anyone else. What's the matter? Anne asked softly. I just think both of you are really blessed, Molson replied thickly. We've had some really tough times, Anne responded as she picked up a baby. However, we are blessed. Never would I have imagined our life would be like this. Michael raised an eyebrow at Molson, knowing that he was not telling him everything. Okay, Molson muttered a confession. He didn't know what it was about Michael, but the man had him blabbing all sorts of things he would never tell anyone else. I was thinking about Holly and how I'm probably not going to have a nice little family like this. Why wouldn't you? Anne softly pried. Who is Holly? She's special. Too special for me. Molson sighed as he gently snuggled the baby against him. You righted an injustice, responded Anne. No one is too special for you. So what is the real problem? First, her dad hates my guts, admitted Molson. Second, to get those men to testify, I now owe a serious gang leader favor. That's not exactly Boy Scout stuff. I don't want to put her in any danger if I mess up whatever Tremblay asked me to do. You're not going to mess it up, she put a hand on his arm, expertly shifting the baby she held. You have all of us to help you. Michael and I mean it when we say that if you need anything, all you have to do is ask. Michael carefully plucked the baby out of Anne's arm, smiling down at her. "'What's the dog's name?' Molson asked to distract them, not wanting to talk about Holly anymore. It hurt too much. "'FedEx,' Amy answered. "'FedEx?' Molson was a little confused. "'Daddy named her FedEx. He carried her through the rain like a package when he found her, because she had a sore paw,' Amy told the story. "'Daddy told me in pictures.' He draws really well. Someday, I'm going to draw like Daddy. That's an original name, Molson commented. He breathed in sweet baby smell. How do you manage three at one time? Anne smiled tiredly. I have some help come in every day. Between my sister-in-laws, mother-in-law, friends, and now Michael, we manage. There was a noise from downstairs. Molson stilled. Is someone else in the house? That's Fen Lee, our housekeeper, Anne told him. You are staying for breakfast. Thank you, but you don't need to have me stay, Molson hastily said. I didn't expect anyone to invite me. I suppose you'll want to spend time together as a family. I'm not really hungry anyways. A growl from his stomach belied his statement. You are staying, repeated Anne. Fen Lee would give us a large amount of grief if you didn't. No one wants to be in trouble with Fen Lee, Amy told him with a serious expression on her little face. Chapter 10 Molson, I love you. Call me back. Holly ended the call, annoyed and worried that it had gone to voicemail yet again. She scrolled through her contacts, calling Molson's brother, Detective Colburn. Pressing the phone to her ear, she listened as it rang. The door to her office opened, and she motioned to her dad that she was on the phone. He nodded and grabbed the morning paper, waiting for her. Colburn. Drew, have you seen Molson around? asked Holly. Not since we all visited Margot in the hospital, admitted Drew. Why, what is going on? I have not seen him since then either. I'm worried that something has happened. She nibbled on the inside of her cheek. It's not like him to ignore my calls. Was anything said that might have upset him? Did he mention he was going somewhere? Drew hesitated. I hoped he was still talking to you. 
There were a few things said that didn't go over well. I've tried to talk to Molson, but he's not in the house or at the shop. I'm not sure where else he would be. He returned my keys, so I know he won't be showing up at my place. He returned your keys? questioned Holly. He had a copy of my apartment keys and was borrowing my motorcycle. He returned both sets of keys. Drew sighed. He was upset. How upset? Holly wanted to know. Pretty upset, responded Drew. Jana doesn't want him around her children anymore. She feels that his connections to Tremblay and the gangs are too dangerous. I may have agreed that I was worried about any backlash that might happen and didn't want to see Bethany getting caught up in any trouble. You both basically kicked him out of your lives. Holly closed her eyes, sympathizing with the pain that Molson must have felt after such conversations. It was a mistake, Drew said firmly, one that I've been trying to apologize for, but I've not been able to find him. Try harder. You're the detective. Do your job and investigate where your brother might be. And when you do find him, tell him I need to talk to him. Holly hung up the phone, frustrated with Drew. Sounds like that gangbanger is finally leaving you alone, Fielding commented as he looked over the business section of the newspaper. It's about time. What is that supposed to mean? Holly's brows came together as she whirled around to face her father. Fielding sighed, folding up the paper. I will admit it, I told him to leave you alone. I don't remotely regret that I did. That man will only bring you heartache and pain. You told him to leave me alone, Holly echoed disbelievingly. Repeatedly, Fielding admitted as he stood, setting the paper to the side. He's a stubborn person. I explained multiple times why a relationship between the two of you would never work. It looks like my words finally got through to him. I'm happy to say I was right. He's quit the residency program, and I think he'll leave you alone now. Molson quit? Holly gasped at her father a moment. He would never quit. It was his dream. Fielding shrugged. He walked out a couple of days ago. What did you say to him? Holly demanded. She knew that Molson would not just walk away from something he valued so much. Fielding had to have done something to push him into that decision. I told him the truth, responded Fielding. He's not cut out to be a doctor. Colburn is some piece of gang trash that needs to go back to shoving drugs on a corner. No decent person trusts him. Doctors need to cultivate an immediate authority and trust with their patients. He can't do that. No one trusts him. You shouldn't either. What gives you the right to interfere in my relationships? She knew her father was only giving her a little of what he had said to Molson. Whatever the full story was, she knew it was likely responsible for Molson's sudden disappearance. I'm your father. I have every responsibility to prevent you from throwing yourself away on some low-life criminal scum. Fielding scowled. I'm here to protect you. That's my job as your father. No, Holly said forcefully. It's your job to give advice, to pick me up when I fail, to applaud me when I succeed, and to love me unconditionally. Being my father does not give you the right to decide who I can and cannot date. You're not dating that man. Fielding narrowed his eyes. Holly was vibrating with rage. She stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with her father. Daddy? Do not make me choose between you and Molson. What if I did? he asked slowly. Then you would lose. Molson never once asked me to choose between my love for you or him. By that virtue alone, you would lose, Holly replied testily. He's a good man. I don't know how he's pulled the wool over your eyes, but he is not a good man, Fielding scorned. Colburn is an insolent, lazy criminal who cheats academically. He's not good enough for you. If he cheats academically, then you would have proof to throw him out of the program, not force him to quit, Holly pointed out. The tattoos he has do not indicate that he belongs to a gang. They allow him to pass through gang territories without any interference. He helps people. He goes through the city's back alleys and forgotten places, bringing food, hygienic supplies, and medical care to people each week. People who cannot afford to go to clinics or to the hospital people who are forgotten by the system. 
Molson has been caring for his mother for years. Maybe, if you would visit her here in the hospital, you would know what he's been dealing with. She has multiple delusions, refuses to take her medications, and we've only just scratched the surface of her mental disabilities. I'm not sure she was ever mentally competent to care for three kids. Yet Molson has cared for her when no one else would. He pays her bills. He makes sure she eats. He tried to get her to take her pills. When his brother was wrongfully in prison, Molson vowed to figure out a way to clear the charges and set him free. He did it. You can read all about it in the papers or see it on the news. Michael Ramsley is a free man because of Molson. Molson is a hero for getting to the bottom of the truth. You're always complaining to me about him. When we share dinner or coffee, you put him down, Holly told him. Not once has Molson put you down. Not once has he complained about you to me. When I asked him what he thought of you, he said you take a lot of pride in your work and that you loved me. When I asked Molson if the two of you were getting along, he told me you didn't like him very much. He said he could understand that because dads should always want the best for their daughters. When you tell me that Molson's not good enough for me, you're wrong, Holly insisted, her voice cracking. I'm not good enough for him. He is amazing. If you would bother to get to really know him, you would know that. You believe him? He's probably taking credit for something he has never done. Fielding fished out his phone. I'm going to call Christian Gaines. We golf together, and he works at Ramsley Pharma. He will know if all of this is true. It is true. I was there helping him, Holly said dampeningly. Gaines, I heard this bizarre rumor. Fielding filled Christian on what Holly had said, putting Gaines on speaker so that Holly could hear. I'm not sure about that. The family has been particularly closed-mouthed about what happened. We have all been just so pleased about Michael's release, I haven't questioned it, Gaines responded. However, Noah Ramsley is with me. I'll put him on speakerphone. Gaines told Noah about what Fielding had said. Is there a reason you would like to know this information? Noah asked coolly. Molson Colburn is a student resident at Mercy Hospital, Fielding replied. I'm his professor, and I would like to know if he's telling the truth or not. Molson was instrumental in getting the proof required for Michael's release, confirmed Noah. Our family owes him a great debt. Thank you. Fielding ended the call, a confused expression on his face. It's true. Get your coat. Holly grabbed hers out of the closet, opening the door to her office. Irma, I'm out for the rest of the day. Yes, Dr. Ershman, Irma replied. Where are we going? questioned Fielding. To do Molson's rounds, Holly said firmly. I am going to show you what he does. We're going to stop by the soup kitchen. We're going to get everything we might need from a pharmacy, and we're going to walk the city helping those in need. Molson has been gone for three days. Normally he goes twice a week to see these people. If he hasn't done it this week, then someone has to step up and fill the void. If he's playing hooky to whatever obligations he has, it's not your problem, Fielding glowered. No, Holly agreed. It's your problem, because you upset him enough that he's not here. Now you can step up and help, or you can never talk to me again. It's your choice. Are you only going to deal with me in ultimatums now? Fielding grabbed his coat, annoyed with Holly. Until you become more sensible, she led the way. Holly, I love you. I am only trying to do what is best for you. Fielding tried to reason with her as he followed. No, you're impressing your beliefs and values on me, Holly impatiently told him. You should have faith to realize that I know what is best for me. Molson Colburn is not what is best for you, he responded. That's not for you to decide, Holly bit out. A few hours later, with sore feet and freezing hands from the constant drizzle the clouds were unleashing, Holly handed out the last of the soups that the soup kitchen had given them. Smells like potato. Jeff sniffed appreciatively. Cream of potato today, confirmed Holly. How's your cold been? It's clearing up nicely. That medication Molson gave me is doing the job. Jeff put away the soup carefully in his tote. I'm headed to the South Street shelter. Molson told me to try to stay out of the weather like this for the next while till I'm fit again. That's a good idea, Holly nodded. What medication did he give you? asked Fielding. 
He was questioning every person that they had been handing out food or medical assistance to. Holly was growing tired of it. Antibiotics, Holly answered shortly. For a simple cold, frowned Fielding. There was crackling in his lungs, Holly informed him. Molson had let her listen to the stethoscope as Jeff took breaths the last time they were out. Pneumonia, confirmed Jeff. Not too serious. It would have become worse without the medications. Where does he get the medications? Fielding was wondering if it was legal. Does it matter? wondered Jeff. Molson is helping all of us. Without him, we would all be worse off. Have you seen a single wrong diagnosis today? Holly challenged her father. No, he grudgingly admitted. He could not fault any of the medical advice that Molson had been handing out to these people. Can you deny that these people need help? continued Holly. No, Fielding sighed. However, it's against the rules and procedures for unlicensed medical professionals to be giving out medications or diagnosing people. Even if he earned his degree, any hospital that hires him would never want him to be doing a street ministry. He would be bound by the hiring agreement, which would not allow him to expose himself to such liabilities of the possibility of being sued in a situation like this. Not only that, but there's a source of the medications to be considered. Over-the-counter meds are one thing, but some of the items he's passing around are prescription only, and I don't think these people are frequenting pharmacies, nor is any doctor writing a script. That is illegal. Helping people is illegal, Jeff weighed in. Just feeding the homeless in this city is illegal. You can get fined for handing me that soup. Only licensed soup kitchens can do that. It don't matter where that soup came from. You're not allowed to give it to me because I'm homeless. You wanted to give it to Holly? That is legal because she has an address. Sometimes lawmakers forget about the simple humanity of a situation. Laws are put into place to prevent future abuse of a situation, Fielding pointed out. Yet sometimes all it takes is one person to match up a situation that is working for so many others, causing it to become illegal to do the right thing. What is the right thing? Helping your fellow man when you're able to, Jeff insisted. You tell me that it's okay to let a man starve on the street just because he's labeled homeless. You tell me that it's okay to turn a person away because they can't afford medical care. People judge us and tell us to get a job. I'm 70 years old. I lost everything. I worked for three companies and had three separate pensions. All those pensions disappeared. One company went bankrupt. Another outsourced their pension plans, which were mismanaged until nothing was left. The last pension disappeared when the company pulled up and went overseas. I worked hard all my life, and I have nothing to show for it. There are programs to help people in your situation, Fielding countered. They do help some people, allowed Jeff. Most programs are underfunded, overcrowded, and try to push you into another program. They can't help everyone who needs it. There's too much demand. I tell you right now, if it weren't for Molson helping me, I would likely be dead from this pneumonia. Rebecca's leg would be killing her. Ike wouldn't have the part-time job that Molson found for him. Molson does urge him to use the available programs, Holly inserted softly. He keeps trying to get them off the street when anyone is disposed to listen to him. It is still illegal, Fielding stated. Maybe, shrugged Holly. I intend to keep helping him. You could lose your credentials, scowled her father. I could. Holly knew that was a risk. It was one she was willing to take. I only showed you part of where he goes. I'll admit I'm too chicken to go by myself to some of the other areas. We will have to wait for him to come back before doing any more of this part of his rounds. Do you think he's coming back? Fielding half-heartedly hoped Molson wouldn't. He had better. Holly tamped down the worry that she felt. Otherwise, I'm going to cry on you for the next three to ten years, and it will be all your fault since you were part of the reason he left. I'm sorry. What? Holly glanced at him in surprise. I'm sorry. Fielding repeated uncomfortably. I may have judged him a little severely. Thank you. She was amazed that her father admitted to his bias against Molson. Normally, her dad was absolute in his opinions. 
Holly was glad that she had been able to make him see that he had judged wrongly. "'Don't get too happy. I still don't like him, and I think he's not worthy of you,' grumbled Fielding. Holly smiled. It was a start. "'Maybe you could apologize to him for pressuring him to stay away from me?' "'Don't push it,' Fielding groused. Molson knocked on the door. He could not remember the last time he had knocked on Drew's door. He always snuck in using the copies he made from Drew's spare keys. Then, usually, he would mooch some food and cable, maybe a shirt or a shower before heading out. Once or twice he even napped on the couch when Drew was at work, when he was closer to Drew's apartment rather than going to Margot's house or the shop. Well, he had a room now. Monthly rent for a tiny room and access to a bathroom, which everyone else on the floor also used. Not ideal, but Molson did not want roommates, and he could not expect to live at the shop. He hated his new place. The walls were paper-thin, and there was too much noise. The paper was peeling, the window didn't open, and it was not clean, even though Molson had spent five hours scrubbing the floor, dresser, and bed. Somehow, it was more depressing than occasionally overnighting with Margot. He had been rotating between the shop, Margot's, and Drew's, telling himself that it was all temporary. Someday, he would be able to get something for himself, something solid that he could call home. Now, that was a distant thought, replaced by the reality of a junky one-room rental that was on the bad side of town. It was all he could afford. It was depressing. Interrupting his thoughts, Bethany opened the door with a smile. She grabbed his arm, drawing him into the apartment. Good, you're here. I was just about to finish setting the table. I'm not staying long, Molson told her. He refused to think of his hollow stomach and the enticing smell of whatever was cooking on the stove. Since when do you turn down food? asked Drew as he cut a loaf of bread. Got stuff to do, Molson replied, shrugging and putting his hands in his pockets. He had lied. Molson was supposed to start work again tomorrow. Other than that, he was wide open for having time on his hands. It was a weird concept. He had been so busy for so long, he wasn't sure what to do with his spare time. Molson had spent part of the day staring at the wallpaper. He was certain the edge of it had peeled down another eighth of an inch. You left a message saying you needed to talk to me about Holly. I figured that was about the only way to get you to come, Drew admitted, glancing at Molson to try to judge his brother's reaction. I didn't exactly lie. I do want to tell you something about Holly. I also want to talk to you, and I had the feeling you were deleting my voicemails. I even called you. Bethany set a pot of stew on the table. There were three place settings. Molson frowned. He had been deleting a lot of messages. He was never so popular before. You want to tell me what this is all about? First, I want to apologize. I made a mistake. Drew set the plate of bread on the table. He turned to face Molson. I am sorry. I should never have made you feel unwelcome here. While I am concerned for Beth's safety, we both agreed that you are always welcome here. All that we ask is you tell us what Tremblay wants, then I can help you. Molson hesitated as Drew held out the keys to the apartment. No, you were right, Drew. It's better if I'm not associated with you or Beth. I don't want either of you getting hurt if I mess up. If we don't know what Tremblay wants, I don't want you to be involved. I am involved, said Drew as he grabbed Molson's hand and put the keys in his palm. You are my brother. And you're going to be a groomsman at our wedding, Bethany said firmly. We've picked a date. That means you cannot welch out on this family. Otherwise, my attendant numbers will be out of order. We can't have that, Drew said in mock seriousness. Molson did not smile. What if Tremblay wants something illegal? You know it's more than likely. Then we figure out a way that you will not get caught, Drew sobered. You and I both know there's not any way for you to get out of the favor you owe. It would be better to have both our heads put together to figure out the solution when the time comes. I told you, sighed Molson. He could feel exhaustion creeping in. I don't want you involved in this. It's too dangerous. 
Stop it. Bethany gave Molson a hug. We talked it over. We're here to help you, and we want you to keep coming around. Now sit down and eat with us. For once you're actually invited to supper instead of mooching off of us? Drew pulled out a chair for Bethany. Reluctantly, Molson sat. It smelled really good, and he rarely got a home-cooked meal. He still had mixed feelings about letting Drew be involved. What did you want to tell me about Holly? Is she okay? You should talk to her and find out for yourself how she's doing, mentioned Bethany as she dished out the stew. No. Molson suddenly was not all that hungry. He fiddled with his spoon. It's better we make a clean break. Did you tell her that? asked Drew. She's worried about you and upset that you're not calling her back. I thought the two of you liked each other, Bethany commented in concern. What happened? I'd rather not talk about it. Molson pushed the stew around. Holly is my friend. I like the idea of the two of you as a couple. Bethany gently persisted. I thought maybe both of you could come to our wedding together. Drew took pity on his brother. Usually Molson would be making some flip remark. The fact that he wasn't told the depth of his feelings. Drew decided to change the subject. Have you seen Margot since the day Jana and I saw you at the hospital? Yeah. She's doing a bit better now, and she's regularly taking her medication. The nurse said they were giving her the liquid kind. Molson answered. He tasted the stew. It was pretty good. Have you been to see her? Yes, replied Drew. She's a lot frailer than I remember. Her memory is not exactly great. She's not doing so well, sighed Molson. Maybe I should have asked the doctors to commit her earlier. I don't know. You thought you were helping her. Bethany stated firmly. We should have been helping you, softly added Drew. What's done is done. Molson did not want to go over it again. It would just make everyone angry. I went by the house, mentioned Drew. Put a new lock on the door so no one would take off with all your textbooks. You never told us that you were going to school. I ain't no more, Molson quietly told him. I dropped out. Why? Drew frowned. I saw your grades. They're amazing. I could not believe that my kid brother is going to become a doctor. Doesn't matter, muttered Molson. I can't get back in any time soon. I lost my scholarships, and I'm not sure when I'll have the money necessary to be able to retake the courses I need to graduate. You intend to go back, then? questioned Bethany. Maybe. Molson didn't know. He had his doubts he would ever be able to return to the program. Of course you're going to go back to school, protested Drew. I want to brag to the guys at the station that you're a doctor. Molson pushed aside his bowl, surprised that it was empty. He decided they had talked enough about him. When is your wedding? There was an opening at the park, smiled Bethany. The last Saturday of May. That's not too far away, Molson remarked. Are you going to be my groomsman? Drew pressed for an answer. Yeah, Molson answered. I'll be there. Good. Drew smiled. Molson crouched down in front of Rebecca to see how her leg was doing. He gently rolled up the dirty pant leg, exposing a bandage. Surprised at how clean it was, he looked at her. Did you go to the clinic? No, answered Rebecca. Got no time for that. Could sit in that place for hours and nothing happens. It gets busy, agreed Molson. Who changed your bandage? Your girlfriend. Rebecca cackled delightedly. She's real pretty and nice. Unwrapping the gauze, Molson looked at the ulcer on her leg while he inwardly cursed. He would have to talk to Holly. She couldn't come out to places like this alone. She was bound to run into trouble that she might not be able to handle. There was a reason he had the tattoos on his neck. They were there to keep him safer in unpredictable places, since each of the gangs had informed their members to leave him alone. I'll just put a little more cream on and wrap it up again. Do you have more of that onion soup? she asked eagerly. Nope. Molson wrapped the bandage up again. It's chicken noodle today. I got peanut butter crackers, though. Those are good. Rebecca nodded, rubbing her hands together in anticipation. How is your mother? 
She's in the hospital. Molson repositioned her pant leg again and put away his supplies. That's too bad, she commented. Is she in a bad way? No, she just needs a little help. Once things get straightened out, I think we'll find her a nice home with other people who have the same sort of condition she has, Molson explained. He pulled two soups and four packages for Rebecca to squirrel away with the rest of her supplies. Is that cartwheel moving better? That oil's a wonder, Rebecca enthused about the two-wheeled cart that held her possessions. I hardly have to push it anymore. Just give it a squirt and I'm ready to roll. Good, Molson had a smile. I'll see you next week, okay? Sure will, she agreed, tucking into her soup. Molson gathered up his bags and began to trek down the alley. Further along, he ran into Jeff. Morning, Jill. How have you been? Is that cough still bothering you? Right as rain, Jeff said merrily as he whittled. The last medication you gave me seems to have done the trick. Good. Mind if I listen to your lungs just to be sure? Molson set down his bags, rifling through them for what he needed. That's doable, Jeff nodded. Saw your girl. She and some fellow were talking to Ike down the way. When? Yesterday? Molson placed his stethoscope chest piece against Jeff's back. Take a deep breath. Today, Jeff sucked in air, pausing his whittling while he concentrated. Maybe ten minutes ago? Really? Molson frowned. Let it out in one more breath. Jeff followed the instructions. I haven't any reason to lie to you. Point taken. My apologies, Geo. Molson disinfected and put away the stethoscope. A guy with her? Yep. You get replaced? Jeff asked curiously. She came around with him the other day. I forget his name, but we had a long discussion about the rights and wrongs of this world. It would be pretty quick if I was. Molson wondered who was with Holly. Was it someone she knew, or was it some guy bothering her? Here's your soup, and I got you some packs of flavored rice since you have one of those burners. Do you have enough fuel? Sure do, responded Jeff. Your lungs sound clear. Molson packed up his stuff. Keep warm and dry. You should be good. Which way did you say Ike was? He's over by the back of the Chinese place, Jeff informed him. His limp is worse. I'll see what I can do. Molson nodded his thanks before heading for the alley behind the Chinese place. He saw Ike talking to Holly as another man grabbed a duffel bag. Molson scowled as he approached them. I thought I made it clear you shouldn't come down here without me. I don't want anyone hassling you. Where have you been? Holly dropped her bag and flung herself into Molson's arms. I have been asking around everywhere after you. I was so worried. You should have called me back. I'm sorry. His arms automatically came around her as he glanced at the other man. Molson was shocked to see Fielding standing there. The man was obviously uncomfortable as he waited with a large bag. What is going on? When I found out you'd not made your rounds a couple days ago, I decided to do them for you, Holly explained as she pulled back a little, still holding on to him. You said not to go alone, so I brought my dad since he's a doctor. I said not to go without me, Molson clarified, worried about the danger she had unintentionally put herself in. That's the reason for the tattoos, so I can go from gang territory to gang territory without anyone bothering me. There are places you shouldn't go, places where things would happen to you if you go without me. She shouldn't be out here in the first place, Fielding said grimly. I wanted to go, Holly frowned at her father. Holly, Molson tamped down his emotions, slowly releasing her. He's right. I was wrong to bring you out here. You're kidding. Holly looked at him in confusion. This is one of the things that I love about you the most. I want to be a part of it. You are the most precious thing on this earth to me. I don't want to see you getting hurt because of me. Molson shoved his hands in his pockets so that he would not reach for her. You should go. Are you breaking up with me? Holly questioned him. I'm no good for you, Holly. The fact that he was repeating Fielding's words was not lost on Molson. 
It was humiliating at its worst to do this in front of her father. Some day you'll see that. You're not any good for me, Holly echoed indignantly. She folded her arms. You help hundreds of people each week who would otherwise not be able to afford health care or decent food. You took care of your mother, who is a challenge. You succeeded in getting your wrongfully incarcerated brother out of prison. You're working on becoming a doctor so you can help even more people. Who is not good enough for whom? Holly, he protested, but she cut him off. You give and give, Molson. Who's giving anything to you? She asked, tears in her eyes. I love you. I want to be right here with you. You can't, Molson told her. Why not? she demanded. Because they're right. Everyone who said stuff about me was right, he said miserably. To get Michael out of jail, I had to promise a favor Tremblay. He'll collect, and it won't be pretty. I might be drawn into the gang for the rest of my life. If anything goes wrong and you're my girl, you'll be the first to suffer for it. I don't want that. I don't want you to take that risk. It should be my choice if I choose to stay with you. Holly wiped away a tear. I should be the one to decide whether the risk is worth it to me. What about kids, Holly? Molson used his most persuasive argument, knowing how much she adored children. What if we had kids at some point? Could you live with yourself if their lives were put in danger because of Tremblay? There was a moment while Holly contemplated his words. She jutted out her chin stubbornly. Life is not safe. Things happen all the time. It's who we choose to make the journey with that makes life worth living. Molson could have torn his hair out. He looked to Fielding in frustration. Can't you reason with her? I know you hate my guts. Make her understand. I don't hate your guts, Fielding admitted grudgingly. I can even respect you for what you're doing here with your street ministry. Are you my first choice for my daughter? Not even close. I don't like you. But you are her choice. As much as I don't like it, I will respect it. Molson stared at him in shock. Just a few days ago, Fielding was doing everything he could to make Molson's life miserable, including warning him away from Holly. He wondered what had changed. Molson, I love you. I'm not going to let you push me away. Holly wrapped her arms around him. So you can stop arguing with me right now. His arms stole around her of their own accord. Molson embraced her tightly, giving in. He didn't want her out of his life. I love you, he whispered in her ear and could feel her smile against him. Fielding cleared his throat. Expect I'll see you Monday morning. Don't be late. Say again? Molson was confused. What about Monday morning? The practicum. I'm not going to have my daughter going around with a bum. Fielding groused gruffly. You'll work hard and graduate the program. You're letting me back in, Molson echoed, disbelieving what he was hearing. You need to be there and put in the work, warned Fielding. I also want to know how you've been getting such good test scores. They're nearly perfect each time. Iodetic memory, Molson answered truthfully. I remember most anything I bother to pay attention to means I don't need to study. I never cheated. Fielding grunted as he thought that out, then slowly accepted Molson's words. He hefted the duffel bag full of supplies. We'd better keep going if we intend to get this done today. There are more people waiting. You're gonna help, Molson asked, wondering who had replaced his irate supervisor with this moderately grumpy man. The more people you have with you, the safer Holly is. Fielding answered. Molson could not fault his reasoning. All right. Holly took his hand, and they moved forward to continue working along the route, helping people along the way. Epilogue Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Anne smiled tremulously. We've been very grateful to everyone for supporting us, for being determined to find proof of the truth for giving us some time after Michael's release. You're all very dear to our hearts, and that's why we've asked you to come to celebrate today with us. There was some applause before she continued. We especially want to thank people that we had not truly considered family until this hardship. That was wrong of us, 
and we fully wish to call you a part of our family. Drew Colburn for his help with convincing the FBI to investigate Agent Law's activities, and Molson Colburn for finding proof of Michael's innocence and bringing it forward so that justice could be served. We have a plaque on our wall where part of the quote says, A brother is born for adversity. Michael and I went through a very difficult, adverse time. Drew and Molson, you're brothers to us. Anne tucked herself against Michael's side. Amy has been helping Michael to practice all week for this, so please be patient. Michael cleared his throat. He opened his mouth to speak, then shook his head ruefully. Anne whispered something to him, and he tried again. Thank you. Everyone clapped, and Fen Li declared dinner ready as she wiped her eyes. People took their places at the long tables that had been set out in the sand of the beach for the outdoor gathering. He can speak, Molson commented quietly, a little surprised. The trouble is not necessarily speaking, Max explained. The trouble is that he can't usually control what he says when he can say something. The words get mixed up or substituted with other words. The good news is that all our secrets are safe with him. Paget had a smile. I don't believe we've been introduced to your friend. Holly, this is Paget and Max. Molson made the introductions. Pleased to meet you, smiled Holly. She had been surprised and pleased when Molson had invited her along to the celebration for Michael's release. He had told Holly that without her, he would never have gotten the final idea of how to convince the gangs to turn on David. Therefore, she simply had to come. Plus, it would be nice if he could basically cower behind her. Holly did not believe that he was cowering for a moment. He was a little overwhelmed at times by all the thanks he was receiving from the Ramsley family, but not once was he cowering. Molson did hold her hand a lot. She felt it was just an excuse. Not that Holly was complaining. She was not going to complain one bit. She also loved how Molson interacted with little Amy, and how Anne let them hold the babies. Holly was a sucker for babies. More than that, Holly was a sucker for Molson holding a baby. It put an urge in her to create a miracle of their own. However, not just yet. Carefully observing Drew and Bethany together, she decided her friend had made the right choice. It was obvious that the pair were in love. Holly had never enjoyed herself more, meeting new people and having dinner on the beach at the ocean side. It was perfect. She smiled at Molson, thinking how lucky she was. Everyone chatted amicably as they ate. Everett Ramsley stood in the doorway of the beach house, arms crossed, looking down on the proceedings. He noted Jake and Sterling, Dylan and Kelly, each enjoying celebrating the moment. Jake and Dylan had always been closer to their cousins than Everett had. "'All's well that ends well,' a female voice said beside him. "'No,' grimaced Everett, "'it has not ended well. It will not be over until David Ramsley's found and admits that he coerced my father into this mess.' "'He's not going to be easy to find,' she told him. "'He has hidden accounts with lots of money in them. He has criminal connections as well as a lot of powerful friends who might be willing to help or hide him. That doesn't matter. Everett looked at her. I'll pay whatever is necessary. Good, she gave him a mercenary smile, because my services do not come cheap. Unlikely Hero Book 7 of the Ramsley Brothers series Written by Josephine Bintema Narrated by Josephine Bintema